गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर नमस्ते मॉर्निंग सर मॉर्निंग मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर मॉर्निंग 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 लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम जीना जॉर्ज थर्ड ईयर रिसर्च स्कॉलर गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन I am Gina George, third-year research scholar in the Department of Physics and Nanotechnology, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. I am privileged to be a part of this inaugural event. Knowledge is power. Knowledge shared is power multiplied. With this note, it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to the first edition. Yes, I wish my words come true of International Conference on Advanced Materials and Mechanical Characterization, ICAM 2021, organized by. Department of Physics and Nanotechnology and the Department of Mechanical Engineering of SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, in association with the India's leading institutions, Indian Institute of Science, IIT Madras, IIT Delhi, IIT Indore, IIT Hyderabad, and reputed professional bodies, ASM International Chennai Chapter, American Ceramic Society India Chapter. the indian institute of metals chennai chapter the indian physics association and the indian ceramic society sponsored by brooker corporation usa industrial nanotechnology private limited usa and ostec art tools russia science and engineering research board serb government of india distinguished and esteemed guests eminent speakers and delegates from several countries deans and directors from various departments and institutions beloved members of the faculty doctoral students and all our dear participants it's a glorious moment to extend my warm wishes on behalf of the organizing committee of icam 2021 we are indeed honored to have you all here with us today we are here today for the inaugural function of the international conference on advanced materials and mechanical characterization 2021 it is the mark of an undying tradition to invoke the almighty at the beginning of an important event before taking the first step an entreaty for aid and guidance from the high power would be in order for a serene beginning i kindly request you all to raise for the invocation be seated as far as we can discern the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of a mere being light a symbol of divinity and enlightenment which guides us from shadows to luminance for a good beginning i request the dignitaries delegates and the participants to join us for lighting the kuttu velaku
Thank you. I now request the convener of ICAM 2021, Dr. Kiran Mangalampalli, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics and Nanotechnology, SRMIST, to deliver the welcome note and to enlighten us about the conference. Thank you. Dear all, a very good morning. On behalf of the organizing committee of the ICAM International Conference on Advanced Materials and Mechanical Characterization, I would like to declare that the ICAM 2021 is now open. As we open this conference, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all from all over the world who joined online to exchange experience and work together for a few days on the exciting field of advanced materials and mechanical characterization. I wish to express my gratitude and warm welcome to our beloved Vice Chancellor, Professor C. Mukhamil Chalwan, Registrar Professor S. Ponuswami, Pro Vice Chancellor S.R.M. Amaravati, Sir Dr. Narendra Rao, and our Chief Guest, Professor Ajay Sud, Sir, and our Special Session Chief Guest, Professor Gautam R. Desiraju, Valedictory Function Chief Guest, Professor Nilesh Kumar Jain, IIT Indore, uh, ARCA Director, Professor Dr. Tata Narsingar Rao, keynote speakers, featured international, national speakers, and participants. I wish to thank the organizing committee members, Professor Praveen Kumar from Indian Institute of Science, Professor Sinvasara Bakshi, Professor P. Jush Ghosh from Indian Institute of Madras, uh, Technology Madras, Professor R. Lakshmi Narayanan from IIT Delhi, Professor Ishwar Prasad from IIT Indore, Professor Rajesh Kurla from IIT Hyderabad for extending their fullest support in organizing this event. I have a special person to thank, and he is our chairperson, Professor John Tiruvadigal, for giving me full freedom to plan and organize this event. I thank the heads of the departments of physics and nanotechnology, mechanical engineering, Dean Mechanical Engineering, Dean College of Engineering and Technology, Professor T.V. Gopal, for their marvelous support. I thank my co-conveners, Dr. Subhabrata Datta, Dr. Payal Bandopadhyay, Dr. Sumit Pramanik, for their constant support throughout this journey. The ICAM 2021 is designed to cover a wide range of emerging multidisciplinary topics in developing advanced materials and their characterization at multiple length scales, manufacturing, and growing applications of innovative materials. It is an international forum for sharing knowledge and results in theory, computation, synthesis, fabrication, and characterization of advanced materials in structural, microstructural, small scale mechanical aspects, structure mechanical property correlations, and technological applications. It is a common platform to present and discuss path breaking research ideas and will be an interface between academia and industry for societal needs. Though we planned, though we started planning this event in the second week of August, we received an overwhelming response from the participants from 17 countries within a short period. We received close to 850 abstracts and close to 1,000 registrations for this event. This conference, the conference is planned with the three parallel sessions on seven uh, essential research areas in advanced materials and mechanical characterization. The number of keynote lectures is 14, invited talks are 52, and contributory talks are 17. The contributory talks are selected after two rounds of critical shortlisting from 100 members. Of our conference is sponsored by three major scientific instrument suppliers, Broker Incorp USA, Industrial Nanotechnology Private Limited USA, Austec Instruments Russia. I thank all of them for their help and support. I'm grateful to my department colleagues who have encouraged me and helped me with reviewing the abstract, shortlisting the best Warren and poster awardees. I wish to thank my PhD students, Ms. Gina George, Hajish Kumar and Megha for taking care of the considerable number of abstracts and handling all the data very carefully. I'm thankful to Director Alumini, Director Communications, Director ITKM, Dean Research, and our students for developing a user-friendly website for virtual poster session in a short period. I thank Mr. Amjad, Rahul, and Dyson for their valuable support in elegantly designing the website. I thank our university GTP people, Mr. Tanika Chalam, for his support in designing beautiful conference poster. With a large number of participants, we are sure that this conference will be a memorable, highly educational, and not to be missed event. We hope that this conference will help you better understand the subject of advanced materials and mechanical characterization and obtain knowledge on state of the art research activities across the world. We truly value your participation and support for this conference. Thank you so much for joining this event and for your kind attention and participation. Thank you. 
professor ajay so good morning thank you sir now let's have a quick glimpse of the icamp 2021 conference information personality whose active participation in administration is notably significant yes it's a honorable vice chancellor who is a skillful administrator dedicated institution builder and highly acclaimed professor of engineering i now kindly invite dr c muthamir selvan vice chancellor srm isd to address the audience kindly sir uh, thank you jina george respected chief guest a well known and reputed scientist professor ajay sud professor christopher shu professor alfonso nan professor ramamurthy professor pravin kumar professor srinivas rao professor ghosh professor lakshmi narayanan professor ishwar prasad professor rajesh korla professor d narayan rao the pro vice chancellor srm university ap professor s ponnasamy registrar srm ist professor john trivedigal dean sciences srm ist dr kiran the convener of this conference other invited speakers researchers delegates and all my other colleagues 
Adha Sara Mayasthi, ladies and gentlemen, my warm greetings to you all. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this inaugural program of International Conference on Advanced Materials and Mechanical Characterization. SRM should have science and technology is committed to pursuit of excellence in research and aiming to lead national agenda across the spectrum of science and technology, humanities and social sciences. The research strategy of SRM IST is especially focused on areas like nanotechnology, bioengineering, energy, water, environment, materials, and embedded systems. Also, the medical researchers are focused in the areas of environmental toxicology, therapeutic intervention of skin diseases, implication of yoga in academic stress and hypertension, biomarkers in malignancy and medical implants. Few of the research highlights are, we have a center for development of materials for fabrication of solar photovoltaics and lithium ion battery through the funding from MNRE, Government of India. And we have developed anode materials for lithium ion battery with a capacity of 250 milliampere hours per gram. We have a high quality scientific program through SRM DBT partnership platform for contemporary research services and skill development in advanced life sciences technologies. Some of our researchers have developed thermocells to convert low grade waste heat into electricity with improved performance efficiency. We have also observed a surprising breakthrough in the stability of platinum-based alloy nanocatalysts to resolve the issues of lower activity and activity losses in polyelectrolyte membrane fuel cells. Our team has developed a graphene oxide based catalyst that gives tenfold synergy of hydrogen production in the diffuse light for the first time. Some of our researchers achieved an enhancement in the optical absorption through surface texturing of quaternary inorganic compounds for thin solar cell applications. A few researchers have devised a method to monitor pollution emitted by human activities in atmospheric boundary layer. We have succeeded in hardening the 22 karat and 24 karat gold for lightweight and high strength jewelry. Established fluorescence activated cell sorting facility through the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. We have a dedicated lab for the software defined communications with the collaboration of Tejas Networks. As you all know, the advancement of humankind can happen only by discovering new materials, understanding their properties, and exploiting them for various applications. The advanced materials exhibit a greater strength, greater hardness, and are superior thermal, electrical, optical, or chemical properties than traditional materials. They can hold novel properties, including the ability to memorize shape or sense changes in their environment and respond to these changes. The development of advanced materials can lead to the design of completely new products, such as medical implants, pocket-sized computers, etc., and which is very much need of the day. As the indigenous production of goods rises, 
it is essential to invest in next generation manufacturing materials like engineered polymers advanced composites and hybrids and metals and alloys with specific properties such as thermal resistance energy efficiency and reduced carbon intensity the use of new materials and composites in production line components can help cut costs increase service life reduce downtime and increase productivity further sensing and characterization technologies to prevent manufacturing defects and the use of smart materials and data analytics to minimize inefficiencies will require significant investment in material science research realizing the global importance of the development of novel advanced engineered materials in various disciplines and investing in material innovation is investing in india's future the department of science and technology csir drdo isro and other funding agencies of the government of india have taken initiatives in terms of exclusively research funding in the areas of new materials development energy agriculture food security environment and health sciences the deliberations and the interactions during this conference will undoubtedly help augment the research activities give a new direction to the young researchers aspiring minds with entrepreneurship ideas and align with the national goals i am extremely happy that the department of physics and nanotechnology and the department of mechanical engineering of srm ist are organizing the first international conference on advanced materials and mechanical characterization in collaboration with leading and prestigious institutions both in india and abroad some of the institutions are indian institute of science iit delhi iit madras iit indore iit hyderabad and reputed professional bodies like american ceramic society india indian ceramic society to name a few i congratulate the organizers and the associated institutions for planning and executing this mega scientific conference my heartfelt thanks to professor ajay sud and all the speakers of this conference for accepting our invitation and making this scientific event a truly outcome based one with these words i wish you a very thoughtful memorable and fruitful conference to take away budding ideas and energy to accomplish great endeavors in the field of materials technology thank you thank you sir now i request our beloved registrar professor s punniswami to release the conference souvenir Professor S. Punnuswami, sir, to say a few words. Respected Professor Padma Shri Ajay Kumar Sud, the Chief Guest of the today's International Conference, Respected Vice Chancellor, 
ப்ரொஃபஸர் நாராயண் ராவ் ப்ரோ வைஸ் சான்சலர் எஸ்ஆர்எம் யூனிவர்சிட்டி ஏபி ரெனோன்ட் இன்வைட்டட் ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் த டீன் ஸ்கூல் ஆஃப் சயின்சஸ் ப்ரொஃபஸர் ஜான் திருவடிகள் மை டியர் கலீக்ஸ் பார்ட்டிசிபெண்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் டெலிகேட்ஸ் ஃப்ரம் தி வேரியஸ் பார்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் த வேர்ல்ட் ஏ குட் மார்னிங் டு ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ இண்டீட் இட் கிவ்ஸ் மீ ஏ கிரேட் ப்ளெஷர் இன் பார்ட்டிசிபேட்டிங் and releasing the proceedings of the international conference on advanced materials and mechanical characterizations i hope the deliberations and the discussions that are go- going to happen for another 3 days would yield fruitful results and are beneficial to the researchers my hearty congratulations to all of you thank you for this opportunity thank you thank you sir it's a great privilege and fortunate to have professor ajay k sood frs with us today in this inaugural function we thank you very much sir for accepting our invitation professor sood is a year of science chair professor department of physics indian institute of science he is a well known scientist for his outstanding contributions in both hard and soft condensed matter that are profound in terms of experimental discovery as well as theoretical understanding most of his research in condensed matter has strong overlap with material science and engineering some of his research interest lie at the interface between physics and biology he has developed some of the finest experimental techn- techniques applied them to discover many fascinating natural phenomena and used them to design sensitive devices for practical applications his publication totally close to 450 cover a wide range of topics several of his innovations have been patented he has guided more than 40 phd theses in 2015 professor sood was elected a fellow of the royal society in london he was a former president of the indian national science academy and the former secretary general of the world academy of sciences professor sood has been honored with a large number of prestigious awards such as the ss batnagar award the world academy of sciences prize gd billa science award mrsi medal and so on at the national level professor sood has served as member of scientific advisory council to the prime minister of india and he is a member and chairman in nation's many prestigious science and technology missions such as scrb dst nano mission and so on in recognition of his scientific contributions and service to sciences in india he has been honored with padma shri by the government of india in 2013 with these few words i humbly request professor sood sir to deliver the inaugural address thank you thank you i will first share my few slides uh, let me see if i can uh, let me hold one second all right perhaps can you see the slides yeah yeah very much okay. i'll put it slide show just one minute all right i hope uh, it is visible all right and i can be heard so uh, let me start by saying that it is indeed a great privilege and a pleasure to be part of this inaugural event and for that i thank profusely my long term very sincere friend prasad d narayan rao we have known each other for many years so it is indeed Uh, so nice to see many of you and participate in this inaugural session when i was asked to inaugurate i was not very sure what my uh, what can i say so i thought it will be a one or two minute operation but uh, later on i realized that uh, they have allotted 15 to 20 minutes so i just thought about what could be interesting to say here which can add value to this conference which has a galaxy of very eminent speakers and participants so it's a, uh, a tall challenge so i'll give you a very subjective view of what i think 
when i look at this topic of advanced materials and mechanical characterization so it is by no means uh, any finality to this it's a very personal take of few examples and it is just to make you think what could be interesting in coming years and as we go along in this very important field of advanced materials and obviously their characterization be it mechanical or others so i think in the last few years and if the trend will continue i suppose the contemporary directions i can see that in operando characterization is going to be a very focal theme in this area which means when the devices are working you characterize them so we have become experts in the last 100 years by uh, to look at this materials offline but the not uh, not a lot more is happening now in the last 10 years on in operando characterization and this is something i think is very exciting because then we can really have time resolved and spatially resolved techniques developed to look at this materials and it has really revealed very fascinating uh, phenomena which were unknown so i'll just give you one or two examples time resolved techniques again are extremely important and in advanced materials of course all materials are advanced if they are used for advanced application so i don't think there is anything like advanced materials even the material like steel which is known for centuries can be advanced by very careful additives which makes it advanced so it is our in, our ingenuity which makes the materials advanced so i uh, singled out this uh, 3d printing or additive manufacturing as a uh, future uh, in the future direction it's already happening a lot and i think that there much much more will happen in coming years and the last example motivated by uh, our involvement in soft matter i will give you one example of experimental simulation so it's not a oxymoron i will tell you what i mean by that i will uh, show you experiments which go beyond simulations of materials so this is something a target i set for myself in 15 minutes so let me see how much uh, i can communicate so the first example which i chose on this uh, 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 you know this contemporary techniques is a new technique which has just appeared a relatively new technique in science advance 2021 from leora dressel house uh, group uh now she is in stanford where they do time resolved dark field x ray microscopy and by doing that they are able to see actually the dislocation boundaries and make a movie of that as the uh, uh, as there is a different processes which are going on so they have made real time movies they reveal the thermally activated motion an interaction of uh, uh, dislocations that comprise boundary and show how uh, we uh, weakened binding forces destabilize the structure at 99% of the melting temperature now this is really fascinating i these are uh, movies from their website and from this uh, paper in science advances a few weeks back you can see the motion of the dislocations and connecting dynamics to the microstructure uh, it connects really to its stability and that gives opportunities to guide and validate multi scale models that are yet untested so in my view much more of that is likely to happen in coming years another example which i took from kunal mukherjee's group in stanford in material science group so here in on his web page he shows the segregation of atoms at dislocations by pipe diffusion and this is revealed by atom probe tomography in indium gallium arsenide 
and uh, you can see really the motion of these uh, 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 internal structures uh, either by atom probe tomography or cathode luminescence spectroscopy. This is another example of in operando uh, techniques and really doing the time resolved uh, experiments. Other experiments which I have taken very recently is from uh, SLAC in Stanford. And here, there they produce, in other places also it is there, but I just took this example. They produce uh, electron pulses, uh, uh, which last for few picosecond. And then you can now look at the time resolved X-ray di uh, electron diffraction. So this is something that is how they produce uh, electron pulses, which last only for a short time. Please contrast it with electron transmission electron microscope, which is not time resolved. It is a steady state uh, uh, image, uh, microscope image of the material. Here, you can really make a movie of how materials are changing if you perturb them. So again, a recent example I took uh, from uh, uh, Stanford, uh, from Aditya Sud and his collaborators. Aaron Lindenberg's group, they take VO2, which has a metal and a metal insulator transition. This appeared very recently in Science 2021. So what is so exciting about VO2, many groups are working. Uh, up to 320 Kelvin, it is an insulator in a monoclinic phase. And above uh, uh, 320, it is a, a rutile phase in a uh, conducting state, it's a metal. So there is a metal insulator transition at 320 Kelvin. And what this group has shown by making the devices and applying electrical pulses, which is perturbing the material, at room temperature, they can make it uh, insulated to metallic. But most fascinating thing is that they also capture the intermediate state which is uh, which is uh, at, uh, which is conducting but not yet become rutile. So you have a new phase of material which is uh, not rutile and conducting, but an intermediate state which has become conducting and it is very close to the monoclinic phase. This is another example at the level of picosecond nanosecond uh, resolution. You can really look at the materials which you could not do in a conventional transmission electron microscope. Now, I cannot uh, discuss anything without saying about Raman spectroscopy. That has been my bread and butter for the last 40, 50 years. So I, my group does Raman spectroscopy in various conditions, as well as ultra-fast spectroscopy, where we perturb the material with femtosecond lasers. So Raman spectroscopy has proved to be a very valuable tool, especially in nanotechnology and material characterization, especially for looking at the alloying, uh, doping, and internal stress measurements uh, in a sample which does not need any preparation and you can do without contact. So this is a very powerful probe, which has really uh, looked at these materials for many years. And the, I must say, with the support of uh, uh, DST and other funding agencies, Raman spectroscopy has become really a very, very routine tool in almost like hundreds of laboratories. So this is an example from our group where we looked at a field effect transistor, and looked at the doping uh, as the doping is happening, how Raman changes. So this has become like a uh, you know, uh, uh, characterization of the doping in the last uh, 10 or 12 years with large number of citations. You can see how the uh, D, uh, G and 2D mode change with gate voltage. And now you can really do in situ devices by Raman spectroscopy. Uh, an example, uh, going to the materials, as I mentioned, 2D, uh, this 3D printing, or uh, what you call additive manufacturing, is really the uh, future 
of manufacturing where you uh, you can really make very complex structures uh, layer by layer either in polymers or in metals and there are many many open questions what is the strength of these materials how do the joints uh, behave under loading many many things what happens to the conventional failure mechanisms and i am sure some of the talks in this conference are dealing with this and this is something which is really opening up a huge number of very interesting challenges and my uh, feeling is that this will remain so for next 10 to 15 years so uh, this 3d printing we have uh, used uh, recently uh, in a, uh, to do some very interesting science and this is done in the group of professor rajesh uh, ganpati in jawarlal nehru center and uh, the student is pragya arora and what is being done is using the 3d printer for polymers the we they make active part active particles which i'll tell you what it means and it has very fascinating property so if you take a, a, a polar material namely a brass rod with some asymmetry put it on a platform and vertically shake it very little shaking 0.5 mm this particle moves as if it is alive that's why it is called active matter active matter is a field which is really very very active in the last 10 to 15 years and it has fascinating emergent behavior when you put many of them together like flocking you put many of them together along with some brass beads and when you shake it you realize immediately that they are following very collective behavior which is what you see in a uh, uh, living world which is in the birds fishes human beings this is called flocking so we have studied flocking uh, right from 2014 and what uh, uh, rajesh ganpati's group has done they can now make polymer particles with friction asymmetry and mass asymmetry uh, of this polymer ellipsoids and now you can play activity uh, on your command you can make various activities some are more active than less active and now uh, being they are being studied for very interesting properties but more recently what is done which is very fascinating now you can also bring a reality in the motion so the whether the particle can move left or right can be decided how you make a hole by 3d printing in this uh, materials and this is something again uh, will give you a huge handle on chirality so you can get various activity uh, chiral activities they can move in larger circles or smaller circles they can move left or right and now you can play about this chirality and selectivity so you can see that when the the two particles have opposite chirality they they form a beautiful pair dimers they can move they can spin and they can do many many things but most interestingly if you put uh, as different chiralities then what is found and that is why most exciting like in biology uh, one chirality only pairs with the same chiral same uh, type of uh, particle but with opposite chirality c2 will pair with c2 minus and so on so this is the uh, Uh, chirality driven selectivity which is very very important in biological uh, functions so this was just a example to show if you put many of them together they move in a very very non trivial way and all that is now uh, discussed in this science advance paper which appeared few weeks back so the last part uh, if i have 2 3 minutes uh, dr kiran is it okay to uh, So I have yes, some fourteen minutes. I yes, still sir. have three four minutes. Yes, I know I'm timing it to not to exceed the time of twenty minutes given by you. So uh, the last part, which I'll which will touch upon our interest in soft condensed matter, is the field where we simulate materials 
so usually you do simulation in a computers right this is a very well known and you have tons of paper in this conference also what i'll show you that you can mimic the atoms by a colloidal particle so atom is one angstrom colloidal particle is one micron so you can see a colloidal particle in a microscope they will do in this is suspended in water and you can see this brownian motion but the beauty is if you put enough of this colloidal particles they will form very very beautiful crystals or glasses now the advantage is they are large enough to see by naked eye but also they are slow enough to follow now this is very different from atomic materials please uh, look for that atomic materials are atoms you cannot look at individual atoms in a dynamic way of course you can look at atoms uh, with this uh, new techniques but you cannot really follow their motion now with colloidal particle colloidal crystals colloidal glasses you can mimic whatever is happening in atomic system and hope to learn some very basic science and see if it is applicable to atomic systems so i'll give you just one example of grain boundary dynamics in polycrystals all the engineers will agree with me that this is the most important problem in material science where you really look at grain boundaries uh, now what we do is we look at grain boundaries at various length scales between the two grains what happens and the grain boundary what happens and individual uh, this uh, 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 big atoms which are colloidal particles they move along the grains so this is up, this we did uh, a few years back and still a lot more is happening so grain boundaries we all know are structurally disordered interface that separates adjacent region with different crystalline orientation this is something which you all know and they are very crucial in deformation mechanisms crack propagation recrystallization kinetics transport properties and you know it and you say that it will be important because you most of the time work with polycrystals and not single crystals so needless to say that uh, material property enhancement has been done by grain boundary architecture over centuries our forefathers when they made different types of uh, 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 weapons they used this grain boundary engineering by alloying editing and thermal and mechanical processing now how do we understand this uh, grain boundary microstructure and dynamics has been always a very challenging task in uh, material science so uh, so one would like to see there are open challenges one would like to see uh, that these crystal, uh, polycrystals consist of smooth which is slow moving and rough boundaries and how do, uh, how can we have an experimental evidence that connects rough uh, grain boundaries and mobility of grain boundaries because grain boundaries move when you do any mechanical uh, um, uh, process so uh, do non faceted boundaries roughen we don't know the answer under external driving how do grain boundaries move is it an isotropic growth or they grow in all directions so these are the questions we asked which are limited in atomic systems because you cannot do these experiments with high spatial resolution and temporal resolution so i will just show you this last 2 uh, 3 minutes what we did uh, so we make uh, this colloidal crystals of uh, the, uh, 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 this polymer uh, nipa particles which can change their size depending on the temperature and you can then form large angle grain boundaries as well as high angle grain boundaries these are all confocal microscope images of colloidal crystals in a confocal microscope atomic confocal microscope where the resolution is roughly like uh, uh, 0.2 micron so now the most fascinating thing is and this is something which uh, very few groups do and professor rajesh ganpati's group in jnc is one of the pioneers 
they put these crystals under uh, in a confocal microscope of course but also you can shear it so this is a very very exciting and difficult experiment you can shear the polycrystals and look at in confocal microscope and look at the grain boundaries how do they move you can see that uh, we can follow the grain boundary which is uh, in this direction uh, where the normal is parallel to shear and this is the normal is perpendicular to shear and exciting thing is that these two types of grain boundaries move very very differently uh, uh, under shear so it is a anisotropic movement which is really interesting so we can follow uh, this grain uh, grains how they are moving by this uh, uh, bragg uh, diffraction this is also done in atomic so in tems and scns a similar thing is done in optical microscope and we are now shearing it and observing it and what we see is that the grain boundaries uh, these ones 1 2 3 4 5 6 which are where the normal is in this direction and shear is here they roughen very much and they move very very much the ones which are parallel they really don't move so uh, they don't grow sorry so you can really now look at the growth and the mobility so similar experiments can be done for fracture growth in this colloidal crystals have been done so this whole field of using colloids as a model system it really combines experimental approach to materials engineering so it uh, in this we investigated the interface dynamics and uh, over five orders in time and three orders in length which is really not possible by other techniques and we have a direct experimental evidence for an isotropic non equilibrium roughening and grain growth so let me close my uh, uh, this inaugural address uh, thanking you once again for this opportunity to share these thoughts thank you prasad narayan rao for uh, having me here and all the organizers and i thought in this uh, 20 minutes i'll just give you my take on um, advanced materials and characterization uh, in this four sub topics so i with this i thank you all i wish all of you a very exciting conference and brainstorming and i'm sure it will go a long way in uh, taking this subject to uh, higher heights thank you once again dr kiran and others thank you prasad narayan rao it's really a pleasure thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir for enlightening us and inspiring us with your excellent talk now i request our first keynote speaker professor christopher shu to say a few words huh few words sir So thank you so much, uh, Professor Sood. I just wanted to congratulate you personally. That was a thank just absolutely perfect, inspirational talk to open these very exciting sessions. Thank I want to you. congratulate you on putting together uh, a really remarkable overview that it goes from really fundamental science all the way to applications. Uh, it's screened across so many different technologies and different areas in material science, and it was very engaging and exciting. And I, I just think it was a perfect introduction to what we're about to go through for the next few days. And I, I really wanted to congratulate you, and I hope that um, we can all do as well as you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. All the best for the conference. Thank you, sir. So I I'll uh, I'll unshare now. So let me see how do I unshare. Already, already unshared, sir. You have unshared. Thank you very much. Again, again, again. Oh, I have shared it again. Oh my God. Yeah. How do I unshare now? Can you unshare again? Yeah, it is unshared. Great. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Professor Jay Sood. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Narendra. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you for sparing your valuable time. Thank you so much. All the best for the conference. I now request Professor Shubhratta Datta, Department of Mechanical Engineering, SRMIST, to deliver the word of thanks. Huh? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Regina. Uh, respected dignitaries, my colleagues, students, and uh, 
and delegates from almost all over the world uh, good morning to all maybe good afternoon good evening to some people uh, from the other parts of the world so first of all i this is the um, we are at the almost at the end of the um, inaugural session and i really feel honored and privileged to get up to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion at the foremost i would like to thank padma shri professor rajay kumar sud for his enlightening inaugural address uh, it has set the mood of the conference for these three days i also express my thanks to our respected vice chancellor professor c muthamir chelvan for uh, being present in this session with his extremely with his extremely busy schedule and delivering his insightful presidential address i thank our respected registrar professor s konu sami for releasing the conference souvenir and also speaking in this occasion my the main purpose of this conference is to exchange views on the mechanical behavior of materials measured or computed in different lens scales in this vast domain of materials research the conference could attract more around 1000 delegates to participate we the organizers are grateful to the delegates and feel honored by your presence we are also honored by the presence of a galaxy of eminent scientists from different parts of the world who will be delivering their keynote and invited lectures we thank you from the bottom of our heart as you all know the organization of such events are generally the results of close cooperation among several institutions and individual it is my great pleasure to ex express on behalf of the organizers a deep appreciation for the support and encouragement provided by such individuals and institutions we are grateful uh, at the foremost to the administration of Kesara Institute of Science and Technology for all the support and encouragement on behalf of Kesara MIST the conference is being organized by the two department department of physics and nanotechnology and department of mechanical engineering i express my gratitude to the heads of these two departments and uh, dean of uh, applied sciences dean of school of mechanical engineering uh, for their support and guidance uh it's a remarkable to have organized the conference in association with institutes like indian institute of science uh, iit madras iit delhi iit hyderabad iit indore asm international chennai chapter indian ceramic society indian institute of metals chennai chapter american ceramic society india chapter indian physics association so we are grateful to all of them for their technical support and guidance the conference you know before that we are grateful to the editorial board of all the journals who have agreed to publish the papers presented in this conference the conference is being sponsored by science and engineering research board that is scrb department of science and technology government of india and uh, um mm, industrial nanotechnology broker private limited austic instruments we acknowledge your support and express our gratitude on behalf of the organizers i express my sincere gratitude to the chief patrons of uh, of the conference all the members of the administrative advisory council all the members of the national and international advisory committees i personally thank all my fellow organizers uh actually dr kiran in his uh, welcome address has thanked us but it is i should specially mention that our convener dr kiran mangalam palli for his tremendous effort i thank you dr kiran thanks to all of you for making this event successful one point i would like to mention here that in such a big event there are many people without whose support it is not possible to make the things happen but their names are 
not displayed. So I thank, thank them heartily, all the technical support team, all the people who have uh, worked from the um, from behind the screen. I thank you. And thanks to all of you for making this event successful. Let us enjoy the conference for the coming these three days. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Now I request Professor Narayan Rao, SRM AP, to say a few words. Our long term and well accomplished scientist of this country, Professor Ajay Kumar Sood, the Vice Chancellor of SRM IST, Professor Muktam Selvan, the Registrar Kondusami, Dr. Kiran, and well accomplished scientists from different parts of the world. It's a great pleasure to associate with this conference. I especially extend a warm welcome to Professor Nilesh Kumar Jain, IIT director for this conference. And I'm sure as Ajay Sudh mentioned, there is a promise in 3D printing or additive manufacturing of bio implants and even 3D printing of skin has become a reality now. Uh, thus, there's a great promise in IT manufacturing for the next two decades. I'm sure, particularly the youngsters who are participating in this conference, take advantage and great, get greatly benefited through this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This brings us to the close of inaugural function and to mark the beginning of ICAM 2021. I'd request one and all to raise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Uttala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Chala Jalati Taranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Ashish Mage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Janagan Mangan Dayaka Jaya He Bharata Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Thank you for joining us, the inaugural ceremony of ICAM 2021. Hope you all will enjoy the brainstorming sessions. Let's expand our knowledge. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Marlena, Judge, how about some tea? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> don't don't give us virtual tea. <laughs> okay, we look forward sometime. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are running late 15 minutes to the schedule. The keynote will start immediately on the same link. Now I request Professor Praveen Kumar, Indian Institute of Science, to introduce Professor Alfonso to chair the session. Thank you, thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the chair for the first uh, keynote uh, talks, uh, Professor Alfonso uh, Nand. Uh, he is a chair professor of material science and engineering at University of Hong Kong. Uh, he previously held administrative positions, including pro vice chancellor research, head of department of material mechanical engineering and associate dean of engineering. His research interest includes novel stimuli responsive materials, material microstructures and their modeling, and nanomechanics, including applications to biological systems. His research-related honors include elected International Fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, Rosenheim Medal of from the Institute of Materials Mine, uh, Mining in the UK, 
uh, among several. Uh, he is uh, he has also got award uh, from Chinese Academy of Engineering. He is currently honorary secretary and council member of the Hong Kong Academy of uh, Engineering Sciences. So, with that short introduction, I request Professor Nagan Nan to to chair the the first two uh, keynote uh, talks today. Uh, over to Professor Nan. Okay, thank you. Um, can I be heard clearly? I suppose so. So it is my pleasure to uh, chair this uh, keynote session. There are two keynote speakers. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would introduce uh, the first uh, speaker, Professor Chris Shou. Uh, he is an endowed professor of metallurgy in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT. He earned his PhD from Northwestern University in 2001 and performed postdoctoral research at Lawrence Livermore National Lab prior to joining MIT in 2002 as faculty. Professor Shou's research is focused on structural metallurgy and seeks to control disorder in metallic microstructures for the purpose of optimizing mechanical properties. Professor Shou has published more than 250 papers and dozens of patents and has co-founded a number of metallurgical companies, including Extalic Corporation, uh, which commercialized nanocrystalline alloy coatings in wide and growing usage around the globe in electronics applications and desktop metal, a metal additive manufacturing company. From 2001 to 2019, Professor Shou served as head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT. He is currently the coordinating editor of the ACTA Materialia family of journals. His various awards include Mac Vicker Fellow of MIT for his contributions to engineering education and election to the National Academy of Inventors and National Academy of Engineering. So um, I will now pass the time to uh, Professor Chris Shou. Uh, he is going to talk about supersonic collisions of microparticles on metals. Uh, Chris, Fantastic. over to you. Yeah, Professor Nan, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. Can you please confirm before you go that you can hear me and see my pointer on the slides? Here? I can hear you very well and see your slide very clearly. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Chris. And thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I really do appreciate that. Um, I also want to extend my, my, my deep and sincere appreciation to the organizers for thinking of me. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for giving me the honor of being able to kick things off here this morning with the, with the keynote. Um, I'm really excited to share this work with you. This is a new project in my group and we've been working on it for only about three or four years. And I'm excited to share it with you and I'm really excited to get your feedback on it. So thank you for the honor. Before I leap in too deep here, I do want to acknowledge some of my co-authors. You'll meet them all eventually, but for the moment, I wanna make sure that the students and postdocs on the first two lines here are highlighted because they are, of course, the heroes of this work. Um, and they're supervised by myself and some of my colleagues at MIT. Professor LeBeau is our microscopist and Professor Keith Nelson is highlighted here because He's my uh, co-PI, co-investigator, uh, because together we make really a great team for this work. His expertise is in lasers and optics, and mine is in materials and mechanics. And together, uh, you put those things together and you can do some interesting things when it comes to collision of microparticles on metal. So when I tell people I'm working on high velocity impacts, usually they instantly assume that I'm interested in damage, right? So when I tell you that it's microparticles, you usually still think it's damage. And so you might think of things like foreign object damage where an aircraft engine is hit by sand or small flying objects and it gets damaged. Or you might even think of like a satellite in space getting hit with a micrometeorite and, and having damage. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today is certainly relevant to these applications. But as a material scientist and as someone who studies processing, I'm actually more interested in sort of terrestrial applications in processing because there's actually a lot of these in the metals uh, processing world. We actually frequently get microparticles accelerated to very high velocities to do work for us. So some things like sandblasting or water jet cutting are old news. There are also newer applications like cold spray where we use supersonic nozzles in order to accelerate 
large volumes of metal particles to very high velocities. And through their kinetic energy alone, we deposit them on a substrate. So we can make coatings and we can even make 3D printed articles by spraying metal at a very high velocity. So all these things are about small particles flying fast and crashing into substrates. And if you think about it, that puts them in a really unique space in terms of mechanics of materials. So all these particle impacts are distinguished by two features, which I wanna highlight here. So first of all, they're small. The particles I'm talking about are typically micron to maybe 10 micron. And the velocities we're talking about are usually a hundred meters per second up to some kilometers per second. And of course it's the ratio of the velocity and the size that gives you the strain rate. And so the strain rate is these contours here on this, on this map. And the strain rates that are achieved in all these particle impact scenarios are tremendous. We're talking 10 to the sixth up to 10 to the ninth per second. This is far, far higher than all of our conventional mechanical tests. So if we take metals like copper or iron, you might do tensile testing or hardness testing to get the quasi-static range. You might do Kolsky bar or plate impact to get into the high strain rate range. But when I talk about these microparticle impacts, I really am over here. I'm, I'm in a space where we don't have a lot of tools, conventional methods are not applicable, and we're frankly lacking quantitative data. So this is an interesting place to play. And what I'm interested in is bringing quantitative tools to that space. So let me tell you how we're going to do it. The experiment that we've developed at MIT and which we're applying to these problems is an entirely optical mechanical test. And we refer to it as the LIPIT, the Laser Induced Particle Impact Tester. So here's how we do it. We take the particles that we're interested in, metals or ceramics or what have you, and we, have, we put them on this tar target substrate, which is basically a piece of glass, which we sputter metal onto, typically gold. And then we put polyurea over the top of it. Now with this architecture, what we can do is we can zap a green laser through the back and by focusing it down and applying a short pulse at you know, high power, we can ablate that metal. We shoot it through the glass. We evaporate all that metal in just a few nanoseconds. And by evaporating all that metal, we essentially inflate this polyurea. We blow it up like a balloon. And that happens in a matter of nanoseconds. And it sends these particles flying at very high speeds. And we can control that speed by just controlling how hard a shot of the laser that we use. Now, because this is on an optics table and it's triggered by a laser, we can trigger the timing to match another laser that we use for imaging. So we've got here an imaging laser that looks at this particle in cross section, if you will, and we have a microscope objective. And we can now catch pictures of this thing as it's traveling. And because the timescales are extremely short for these kind of impacts, we're talking about contact times that are you know, dozens of nanoseconds. So we have a camera that is exceedingly rapid. Uh, we often think of high frame rate photography as being microseconds. In this experiment, we're actually using optical switching so that we can get images down at the three nanosecond time scale. So exceedingly fast imaging. So now this is the basis of quantitative testing because we can do experiments like the one shown here. This is a very simple experiment. And I think of it as a high strain rate hardness test, okay? So here's the experiment. I take a hard particle like sapphire or alumina. It's about a 10 micron and it's spherical. And we launch it at a test material like copper. And now you're looking at the images here that we snap with our camera. And you can see that the total time scale here is something like one microsecond. So we're getting really, really fine time resolution and we can measure the velocity of the inbound particle and we can measure the velocity of the outbound particle. And we can do that with very, very tight precision and very, very high accuracy. In fact, here is the coefficient of restitution. It's the ratio of those guys. So it's the outbound velocity divided by the inbound. And this is a handful of shots that we've done where we've tested iron and copper. And if you look closely, there are error bars on here, both horizontal and vertical. So you can see just how accurate and precise the, these are. We get tight clustering and we get high accuracy. We're very precisely measuring, if you will, how much kinetic energy got lost from this particle, right? So we have a measurement of energy. 
And in the case of a hard particle in a soft substrate, that's a measurement now of the plastic work that we did at a very high strain rate. In fact, now we have the basis for a strength measurement because the definition of hardness is the plastic work divided by the volume of the crater that you produced. So if we take data like these and we combine them with quantitative microscopy and actually measure the volume of the crater, we use confocal scanning microscopy uh, to get very high accuracy on that number as well. We're in a situation now where we can augment classic mechanical data with new measurements. So this is now a dynamic hardness measurement at 10 to the seventh or 10 to the eighth per second. So very, very high and yet quantitative information in a range where it's hard to get quantitative information. So now we can do this. And, and by the way, this kind of testing, it might be one day for each of these sets of data. So it, it's reasonably fast and efficient to get this data. And we can now ask questions like, how do these very high strain rates extrapolate to and compare with other more conventional mechanical tests? And so our hope is that we'll do more work comparing across those scales uh, in the future. But there's something else I wanna talk about here today. And that is that you know, by changing the materials and changing the conditions, there are a lot of things we can do with this tool to bring quantitative understanding to all those application areas that I talked to you about early on. So I'd like to go back to this uh, cold spray. I mentioned the cold spray process, where of course, engineers are using this process all the time. They spray, you know, bucket loads of powder and they make coatings and you can coat lots of different materials with cold spray. Here's a, a sample from the literature of, of the coatings, the kind of coatings that you produce, and they're fairly thick and coherent and very nice. And it's kind of an interesting question. Well, when you get particles flying fast enough, what makes for a good coating? How do you get particles to stick? Why aren't they bouncing? Uh, how can we convince them to stick better? There's a lot of fundamentals here, and we have the opportunity to study that at the single particle level. So we've done a lot of work with this lipid test using what I call a matched material configuration. So that would be, you know, aluminum striking aluminum, because during a cold spray process, that's what happens, right? After the first layer is on, every particle basically hits previous particles of the same material. So it's a, a relevant condition to study. So we do the same kind of experiments I showed you before, where we launch these particles, we measure them as they strike the substrate and they bounce. Now, Here's the videos, here's the frames. Again, we can measure those velocities. We can measure the ratio of them, the coefficient of restitution. We can go in and we can look at the craters that have been produced. All the same things I showed you before, we can do that now for a matched metal on metal strike. But the challenge here is that now we're using a soft particle on a soft substrate they both are going to deform, right? So we don't know which side deformed. We don't know how that energy, we know exactly how much energy got spent, but we don't know where it went. Did it go into the particle? Did it go into the crater? We just don't know how that's partitioned. So what else can we do quantitatively in order to extract properties from a like-on-like -like impact condition? Well, one thing that we've been doing is instead of taking individual data points, we take a whole bunch of data points and we collect bounces of different heights. So you can see here at different velocities, we get a, a more or less of a bounce. As we go to higher velocities, we get less bouncing. And these data as a trend actually turn out to be very useful because you can fit the whole trend now with a model that lets you extract properties. So one of the simplest models that you can fit which it, it's beautiful for its simplicity, in my humble opinion. It's, it, it's the idea that it's an elastic, perfectly plastic impact. So we know lots of things happen like hardening and heating, and there's a bunch of things that happen. If you just subsume all of that into a yield strength, an average or a representative yield strength for the impact, you can actually go a long way in analyzing these data. In 2003, Wu et al. published uh, this beautiful study where they used finite element and they showed that they could collapse all kinds of conditions onto a scaling law, a beautiful scaling law, which holds over orders of magnitude and velocity. And they basically showed that whether the target is deforming or the particle is deforming, that turns out to not matter because everything collapses onto a simple minus one half scaling law. So that's powerful because now I can take data like these and I can fit them to that scaling law. So I'm gonna go ahead and take those data for aluminum and put them on double log scales where they are sort of convincingly 
following the minus one half trend. So we can now fit that law and we extract a quantitative measure of the dynamic yield strength for aluminum at a strain rate of 10 to the seventh per second. So we now have quantitative measurements and we can do that for other metals as well. And we can get, I think, a reasonably accurate measurement of what the prevailing yield strength is under these very extreme conditions. So that's a first step. So we can measure properties under these conditions. That, that's really interesting. Not only can we measure the properties, but now we're in a position to ask questions like, what does it take to get the particle to stick? In the world of cold spray, they have maps like the one I'm showing here. They're very interested in what they call the deposition window. If you spray particles slowly, they bounce and none of them deposit. And when you get to a critical threshold, eventually you start depositing particles. And so we can now go in and sort of use the lipid and start to query, you know, why do particles sometimes stick and sometimes not stick? What does it take to get them to stick? So what we do here, you can already see what's going to happen. As we go to faster velocities, we get less and less of a bounce. At some point, we're going to end up down here where there's no bounce at all. So let's go explore that. I'll show you another video here, and this is a typical video for a particle that sticks. I like this video because you can actually see the balloon. So if you're interested in the mechanics of this thing and how it works, as I play this video, you can see that balloon of polyurea. It's inflating and it's thrusting that particle off in front of it. And clearly this particle is sticking when it hits the substrate, right? So this is um, a sticking condition and we can put that data point on here. We can do a bunch of tests and put a bunch of data on here. It's very, very clear that there is a threshold in velocity for these aluminum particles and below it, we bounce and above it, we stick. So that's interesting. So why is it sticking? Let's dig in a little bit. First of all, I wanna tell you that this phenomenon where we see a power law, plasticity power law, and then sticking at a transition, we see that whenever we do matched metal impacts. So here's some other metals just to show that, you know, this is not a one-off thing for aluminum. We see it in copper and zinc and titanium, although the threshold velocity changes depending on what metal you test. So we gotta go figure this out. What, what is it that gives us this critical velocity? Well, in the movie I showed you so far, it's pretty boring. I mean, we've got a particle flying in and then it sticks and something magic happens here to make it stick, but we don't know what that is. So the first thing that you want to do is go in and really focus. I told you I could go down to, you know, 10 nanoseconds or even finer. Why don't we do that? Why don't we zoom in and actually watch the impact? So here's one of our earliest experiments on this topic. This is now getting a bit dated, but this was a watershed moment for our project because we, we were able to zoom in we make the particle a little bit bigger so we can see it better. And we, we make that time spacing very, very low. So now as the particle lands, we can actually watch it. And I'll play this video. You can actually watch this thing and you can see it deform through several frames before it bounces off. And so here we go. It hits the substrate. You watch it flatten into a pancake and then bounce off again. Okay, so now it's no longer just, you know, velocity in, velocity out. Now we actually have a time series of deformation that we can look at. And if we go to a higher velocity where it sticks, so here we are now at 800 meters per second, this video is really sort of interesting because when the particle sticks, it's, it's really noticeable why it's different. And so here's the movie, splash, right? When we see particles adhere, we also see a pronounced ejection of matter from the periphery of this impact. It looks, it looks like a meteorite, like crashing into the earth, although it's at, you know, a much finer scale, but we see something that looks very splash like. Now, if you go look at these impact sites, uh, we can go, you know, site specifically find them and we know what velocities we shot them at. Um, we're no longer just making craters now, now we're sticking particles to the surface and we see the evidence for the splash, like it, it's written here, right? So there are lips of extruded and shorn material that are sticking up around these particles around the edge. And that's actually encouraging because when you look at cold spray coatings, that's what people see. On the surface of cold spray coatings, if you look closely, people do see particles with little shear lips sort of sticking up off the side. And so that's actually encouraging that we're reproducing that fundamental behavior that is seen in the production environment. Um, and it tells you that these 
jets are really important to the adhesion transition. So what I wanna do here is I'm gonna go back. I already showed you this data. This is the plasticity power law that characterizes the bouncing, right? So as we go to higher velocities, we get less and less bouncing. We follow a power law. But now I told you that when I get to 800 meters per second, everything's gonna stick. So I'm following a power law and suddenly everything is gonna be down here off the bottom of the chart where it hits zero. So there has to be some kind of a divergence when we get to that threshold. And indeed, now that we know it's there, we can go in and pepper this area with new experiments and we can convince ourselves that indeed there is a power law regime and then there is a divergent regime where we walk away from the plasticity power law and something new is setting on that leads to adhesion. So there's an asymptote there, if you will. And now we know what we think it is. We think it's jetting. We think this jetting phenomenon is what's going on. So we had a PhD student who just finished, uh, Yu Chen's son, and he went in and he really wanted to study this idea that the power law divergence is associated with jetting and that is what leads to adhesion. And so he did his work on copper. And so I'm showing you here the same sort of thing that we did for aluminum, it's the same story. We've got the power law here, but now we have this diverging regime. And what Yu Chen did is he went in there and he said, all right, if I'm in the power law regime, this is just good old fashioned plasticity. And if I look at the craters, I just see plastically distorted craters. On the other hand, if I go over here to the right of the critical velocity, I see particles that are stuck and I see all this evidence of jetting. So jetting happens for sure when the particles are stuck. The hypothesis now is that there's a trans transitional regime here, this divergence where the particles are still bouncing. So we produce a crater, but we are beginning to jet. And you can see here in this example, this velocity right here, we're forming jets around this crater. It's no longer a simple plasticity crater. Now we have localization and we have jetting. And so now you can imagine what's going on here. Normal plasticity, suddenly jetting starts and it dissipates extra energy, right? So we get pulled down off the curve extra energy is getting pulled out of the particle to accommodate the jetting that's happening. Yu Chen even managed to, to go in and see it, to actually verify that it does happen. When you're in this regime, not only do the particles come in and bounce off, but they actually do produce little incipient jets when you're in this regime here. So we now have a very interesting set of observations. Particles stick because at some point, plasticity is not the only thing that happens in a conventional sense. We have a divergence from plasticity, that's where jetting sets on, and we can now measure that divergence velocity. Separately, we can measure in a completely independent way, the velocity at which we start to stick particles. So we now can measure two things to understand this transition. By the way, there's no evidence at this point that there's melting happening here. So I use the word splash and I love the word splash because it has the right visual imagery, but it also kind of implies that there's liquid and, and there's no liquid here. I, we have no evidence for melting in a situation like this. If you look at these jetted regions around the particle, there's they don't look at all like they've been melted. This looks like extruded and shorn material. This looks like localized plasticity. It does not look like melting. And in fact, if you do modeling, we've done our very best using, you know, the best constitutive models and combined Lagrangian and Eulerian simulations, we can estimate the temperature rise. In copper, the temperature rise is at most about two thirds of the melting point. So this all hangs together. We, we really don't think there's any melting going on. No, we actually think the splash here is a solid state splash. We actually think that this is a shock related phenomenon. And so let me tell you what we think is going on, where these jets are forming, and then we'll go test it. So here's our, here's our visual picture. We have a particle flying in and it's hitting this substrate and it's happening at high velocity. So when these guys first come into contact, you get a shock wave and it propagates back into the particle and down into the substrate. And the shock wave is propagating, but the particle is still traveling, right? And so there's this V-shaped geometry between the substrate and the particle. And this is a convergent closing geometry. It's like jaws are closing and there's a shock wave adjacent to them. 
Now that geometry is actually very familiar to people who work in shock. Uh, so people may be familiar with a shaped charge or a shaped charge liner. Uh, this is a geometry where you intentionally make a cone. You make this V shape so that when there's a, a, an explosion around this cone, it actually forms a hydrodynamic collapse and you get a jet that shoots out the middle. In the world of welding, people do explosion welding. And explosion welding is kind of the same thing. What you do is if you want to join two sheets together, like these two blue sheets here, you put them at an angle to one another and you create a V geometry. And then when you set off an explosion here, you actually have that convergent geometry and it shoots a jet out. And so this jet propagates out in front of that explosion wave and that jet has a function. It actually like cleans off the surface. You, you rupture the oxides and you flatten the asperities and you sort of really get a lot of deformation at the interface. And that lets you metallurgically bond behind the explosion. So shocks and a convergent V-shaped geometry, that's what it's all about. And that's exactly what we think is going on in these little particles. So here's our mental picture. Particles, shock waves, a V where the shock wave detaches from the edge, you, you have exactly the same thing as a little shaped charge. And where that, where that uh, pressure is released, it flips into tension and you extrude a jet and you do that entirely in the solid state. So that's our mental picture. This is our theory of, of what happens when metal particles strike at high velocities. And now I'd like to go test it. And so once again, what I want to do here is I want to get a model that's simple and sort of somehow captures all the essential physics without being complicated. And so I'm going to build another scaling law. And so here's the way we're going to do it. Our picture is this, that there's a huge amount of pressure in the red zone here. And at some point, that pressure is going to flip into tension. And if that tension exceeds the dynamic yield strength, which by the way, we've measured, you, you might remember. So we know the dynamic yield strength and we just need the pressure to be stronger than that when it flips into tension. So what we can do is we can keep the dynamic strength on this side. We can write down an expression for the dynamic pressure for a, a particle impacting a substrate. So this is a, an approximation for that dynamic pressure based on the velocity, the particles traveling at the critical velocity. It has a density and a speed of sound and so on. There's a proportionality constant that comes into this, but it doesn't really matter because this is all you need to make a viable theory. If I just rearrange it now, do a little algebra, I can convince myself that the critical velocity should scale with the elastic and plastic properties of the material. It scales with the strength. PS here is the dynamic yield strength, or if you will, the spall strength. So very high rate strength of the material goes here. Things that are stronger should have higher critical velocities. That makes sense. And this is elastic stuff. So that's the bulk modulus, and this is the speed of sound in the metal. So this model cares about the speed of sound and elasticity because it cares about these shock waves and how fast they move and how quickly they overtake that edge. So this is our theory. It's a hydrodynamic jet theory. It's very simple. And now we can go do targeted experiments and try to validate it. And so that's what I'm gonna do next. So we've done a couple things to try to validate this model. The first thing we did is we try to isolate variables. So we try to isolate the strength. So the first set of experiments I'm going to show you, we're going to start with aluminum. I already showed you the aluminum data. We measure its critical velocity. That's going to be our baseline. And what I want to do now is strengthen the aluminum without changing its elastic properties. And the way we do that is by lightly alloying it. So if you take aluminum and you lightly alloy it, here's 6061, here's 2024, here's 7075. We're not really changing the elastic properties much at all, but we are changing the strength a lot. And when we do these experiments, you get more scatter in these alloys because there's microstructure effects now, but you definitely can always measure a critical velocity where things start to stick. And if we look at the theory now, we are strengthening aluminum by about 50, 60%. And in exact linear proportion to that, we are increasing the critical velocity. So as expected, this proportionality is holding. So this makes sense. Stronger alloys need more velocity in order for the particles to jet and to stick. The second thing we can do is we can try to isolate the elastic properties. 
Now, this is harder to do, but one thing that we've come up with that kind of looks like a, like a reasonable scheme is if we work on pure metals, pure metals are special, right? Because if we work on high purity, well annealed metals, the spall strength or the dynamic strength is just proportional to the bulk modulus. So as long as I work on pure metals, these things kind of become a constant. And now the only variable is the speed of sound. So I can repeat the same kind of test. Here's my data point for aluminum. And now I can test a bunch of other high purity metals. And sure enough, when I do that, they rank out according to their speed of sound. All these data fall convincingly on a line that goes right through the origin, exactly as this scaling law predicts. Now, I particularly love this data set because when you look at these metals, they're not in order by anything you would normally think of, right? They're not in order by strength. They're not in order by melting point. They're not in order by modulus. They're in order by their speed of sound. And that puts them on the right trend line. So to me, that's pretty convincing that the speed of sound and the elastic properties are important. By the way, this is the critical velocity for bonding. We can actually measure a second critical velocity. I told you about this, that we can measure that divergence, the point where we deviate from the plasticity power law. That's where jetting begins. When we measure that for these metals, that also falls on a line that's proportional and goes through the origin. So this is now very convincing. It's all holding together. The, the, the fundamental physics here is about jetting caused by hydrodynamic shock interacting with the edge. So we have normal plasticity, then we have jetting, and that's how this works. Now, why does jetting lead to bonding? That's an interesting question as well. Um, I mentioned to you a few slides ago, explosion welding, right? So in explosion welding, you might remember they had a jet also, and that jet was there to clean the surface, to break up the oxides, to, to produce metal on metal contact so that you can get good bonding. Well, I think that could be what's going on here too. When the particle has enough localized deformation at the interface, that's an open door for met metallurgical bonding across the interface. So we've been doing work lately uh, in collaboration with the army where we shoot these particles and then we cover them with a protective layer like with platinum so that we can cross section them in a fib. And so here you're looking at a cross section and we can go in and actually study these jets. So this is, one of these jets on an aluminum, they're very, very small. There's something like 100 nanometers or maybe 200 nanometers in thickness. So we're talking about strains that are huge, you know, way more than 100% strain in a 100 nanometer region. So very high strains right at the interface. That's the kind of thing that you're looking for if you're worried about breaking through an oxide layer. So we have a mental picture now that when the jets form and you get huge strains at that interface, that's how you might break up an oxide and get metallurgical contact through there. So we've done some work lately. Uh, I can't show you all the things we've done with oxide. There's uh, a, a couple of works that we've published on this, but I will show you what it looks like in copper, just so you can get a sense. This goes with all the data I've shown you on copper so far, same particles, same shots, but now we do some microscopy. So we look at the particles before we shoot them, and we know that in the as-received condition, there's a native oxide on copper, which is something like 30 nanometers thick. It's thick and it's sort of friable and fragile, uh, but that oxide layer is a huge barrier to bonding. When we shoot those particles, so now here's a particle that we shot and we took a cross section and we've put it in the TEM, and now we can go along that interface and sort of look at the fate of the oxide layer. So I'm gonna start by zooming in here on uh, this region at the South Pole. Down at the South Pole, we're really far away from where the jets are, right? The jets are over at the side, we're down at the bottom, not much deformation in the plane down here. And indeed, down here we see that oxide film is still present. It's still present, it's thick, it doesn't seem to be disrupted very much, and the copper does not appear to be bonded across it. So there's really no bonding down here. On the other hand, if we go up to where the jets are, so here we are in this region, now we see indeed up by where the jets form, there's a huge amount of interfacial strain. And if you look closely here, the oxide layer is highly disrupted in this region. And in fact, the copper signal goes straight across between particle and substrate. So that's where the metallurgical bonding is happening. 
we really think that that high shear strain associated with jetting is really helpful for this kind of action to get metallurgical bonding to take place. So that's the kind of work we've been doing. Uh, the, the lipid gives us quantitative measurements of strength. It gives us quantitative measurements of hydrodynamic phenomena. And it's really taught us a lot about how do you get things to stick when you, when you get them flying. There's other things that we can do with the method too. So this deposition window, I, I pointed to this before, like getting things to stick is great. The community also knows that when they spray things too fast, if you turn on your cold spray gun and you spray it too fast, things don't stick again. Actually, you know, the deposition efficiency drops back down again, and it's referred to as erosion. And it's a bit of a mystery, like why, why are things not sticking at higher velocities? So this is another interesting physics problem that we can take our lipid and go look at. So what I want to do is go beyond sticking. So for the next part here, I want to show you, I'll focus on one material at first here. I'm going to talk about tin, okay? So I'll show you these movies. Uh, you've seen this whole story before, so this will not surprise you that at low velocities, we get a bounce. At higher velocities, we get it to stick. Here are the movies in the lipid. So there's a bounce and here's a stick. The critical velocity to get them to stick is somewhere around 300 in between these two images, okay? So if you're just above 300, things stick. But what if you go way above 300? So let's talk about what happens when I go, you know, twice that high or even three times that high. Interesting things start to happen and this is where erosion should set on. So here's the movie at 678 meters per second. You can see instantly that this is an interesting new regime because there is just an explosion of material that gets ejected back off of the substrate at this velocity. In fact, I affectionately call region three kablamo. So we've got bouncing, sticking and kablamo. Um, here it is at a thousand meters per second. So now the explosion just gets even, even more severe. It even looks almost liquid-like. It just looks like a curtain of matter is shooting back off that substrate. So this is it. This is uh, erosion. This is what erosion looks like at the single particle level. Particles bounce, particles then stick if you go faster. But when you go too fast, you see fragmentation and you see cratering. And if you look at the fragmented and the cratered images here, you can see why this happened. It happened because now at these very high velocities, indeed, we have melted things. So this is a like smoking gun for melting, right? Look at all the resolidified droplets here all over the surface. And if you look closely here, you can see them as well. So these materials are now melting. When they're bonding, they're probably not melting. You know, jetting doesn't require uh, any melting, but if you go fast enough, you can get melting and it's a problem. So our coefficient of restitution plot, you know, we've got the bouncing regime, the sticking regime, and now there's a regime where we're throwing off all kinds of fragments and we can try to measure those and quantify them and so on. I like quantitative science. And so we have been interested in the question of how erosive is this process? So again, we can go look at these craters and we can do uh, confocal scanning microscopy. We can measure their volumes. We can very precisely measure both the crater and the pileup around it. And so we can get a net uh, material loss or deposition. And I'm gonna show you our results here for tin. So I mentioned that the critical velocity for tin is at about 300. So if you're right at 300, this is the size of the particle we deposit, and this is the measured net deposition. So right at the critical velocity, the particle is sticking and its entire volume is represented in the deposited matter that we measure. But as we go to higher velocities, the amount of matter that we deposit drops very, very fast. So we are you know, melting the particle, we're losing more and more of it. And at some point, we're not only losing the entire particle, we're losing part of the substrate as well. So this is what erosion looks like. It's about melting and melting assisted fragmentation. Parts are flying off and you can even lose substrate in addition to the particle. Now, in this case, in the case of tin, I told you that this is all about melting. So again, you can write down scaling laws and convince yourself that that's a reasonable explanation. I don't wanna bore you with a bunch of math, but it is a very simple energy balance to say, hey, look, I can take the kinetic energy of the particle, one half mv squared, and I can just set that equal to the amount of energy 
needed to heat and melt that amount of tin. So the heat of fusion goes in here, the melting point, the heat capacity. The only thing that you need to include to do this right is you've got to have an affected volume. And so for that, you've got to have heat diffusion, right? You've got to have uh, thermal conductivity has to come into the act. So you can put that in there. So thermal conductivity goes in as a diffusion type equation. So you get the square root there. And with just this simple uh, heat, you know, energy balance, you can actually write down a sort of prediction and you can predict what velocity is necessary to get the thing to melt. And it boils down to the properties of the particle, the density and the size, and then the thermal properties. And so actually it boils down to the thermal effusivity. That's a measure of how well the material keeps heat to itself instead of rapidly diffusing it away. And then I melt is basically related to the melting temperature. So let me map this out for you. It makes sense when you map it. It's, it's really actually very simple. If you wanna have melting at low velocities, you're moving to the upper left on this chart. And, and what this chart tells you is that, look, if you're gonna cause melting by impact, heavier particles do a lot, right? A heavy particle carries more energy with it and it will cause melting more easily. So higher density does it. And then lower melting point and lower thermal effusivity also do it. So those things together give you lower, give you the chance for melting to occur. Now, simple model, but if you plug in all the numbers, it actually predicts that melting should happen in tin at starting at about 450 meters per second, which is exactly where we've measured it. So order of magnitude analysis, I really think this works. In fact, once you put this model together, you can predict for lots of materials, when will we melt it? So here's predictions for bismuth and zinc and tin, and then we can go shoot those things. Sure enough, in bismuth, we can melt it. In zinc, we melt it titanium we melt it and we go back and, and sure enough, those things are roughly where they're supposed to be on this map. So simple physics, it's about melting in these materials. Before I conclude though, I wanna make sure it's clear that not every material is gonna fail by melting. There are other physics to be had here. So if I go back to copper, I've told you a lot about copper today. So here are some shots from copper. These are craters. So here's copper bouncing. Then we start to see jetting. Then we start to see the particles sticking as we go faster and faster. And now instead of melting, copper does something completely different. So here's what happens to copper when you're way above the adhesion velocity. You start to get these giant flaps of material that get ejected out. So this crosses from being jetting to being what we call petaling. And actually you form these petals. And we took that from the cold spray, uh, spray literature where they actually see this phenomenon on, on the surface sometimes, large petals of matter. And what we're pretty sure is going on here is that in this case, we're actually crossing over where in jetting, we get little hydrodynamic jets, but at these very high velocities, the entire geometry goes hydrodynamic. So the whole thing is so overdriven and so overstressed that it's flowing almost like a fluid. And in fact, the particle started as a sphere and by the time it's done, it's turned inside out. So this particle has literally turned into a saucer and it's embedded deeply below the surface of the substrate and a ton of matter has shot out the sides here. And again, you can quantitatively go in and measure it and convince yourself that you know, first you're bouncing, then you're depositing copper. But if you go too fast, you're burying copper into the substrate and ejecting more matter than you're depositing. And so this is an, a different mechanism of erosion, which doesn't involve melting. It just involves solid ejection of these petals, which now can chip off and flake off easily and lead to erosion. So we have been studying erosion in a variety of metals. There's a lot of physics here and there's much more to do. So by way of foreshadowing, I think there's uh, some a lot of new things to work on. Copper erodes by forming petals. Tin erodes by melting. Our most recent work, which is unpublished, but we're trying to publish it soon, is on zinc, where we see both of these things. We see signatures of melting and the particles turn inside out. So we have both melting and hydrodynamic penetration. So there's a lot going on here, and there's much more to be done. In aluminum, we've never found a regime of erosion yet. So much more to do. With that, I'm going to conclude. I wanna thank again my co-authors from MIT, my collaborators from the Army, 
and also in particular my funding, which is from the uh, Department of Energy, and they support our fundamental work on extreme phenomena. With that, I'll conclude, and I'll just say that um, our lipid experiment is designed to quantitatively measure materials, mechanics, and mechanical phenomena at extremely high rates. I've talked about a variety of those, including particles that bounce, particles that stick, and particles that cause erosion. And I'll stop there, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the excellent talk. Um, as you can see from the chat page, there are a lot of questions. Um, so in the interest of time, I will just pick one or two. Um, so there is a question on the oxide. You also mentioned about that, right? The need to break the oxide, uh, and, and that is related to the squeezing out the splash. Uh, so have you actually tried gold, gold on gold? Yes, we have. Uh, so. <laughs> That's a great question. That was my first reaction when uh, it was to go to a noble material. So we did gold, uh, we did silver, and we published it. And so I'm going to give you the short story. Um, we see all the same phenomena. So gold bounces, and then it sticks. And when the gold is sticking, we still see jets forming. So all those phenomena are still there. But gold seems to have a lower critical velocity than the other metals when you compare it on the same basis. So if I compare all other pure metals and gold, gold is kind of a standout. It's, a, it's an outlier. And I think that's because it has less of a surface barrier. So great question. Uh, there is another question about this Asadi et al. Uh, paper that talks about uh, adhesion would only occur when the kinetic energy is equal to a quarter of the energy required for melting. So the question is, uh, have you correlated uh, the critical velocity with the melting velocity? The critical velocity and the melting velocity are controlled by different physics, in my opinion. So uh, I think we've established, like all of our data point to two very different mechanisms. So the, the melting transition is caused by kinetic energy, plasticity, heat deposition. And I showed you, you can use equations to predict that. In the same materials, you can use the hydrodynamic theory to predict the jetting and the bonding. And, and those two things have like very little physics in common. So to the extent that they have some kind of ratio, I think it may be sort of a coincidence. Um, they are different physical mechanisms with different physical inputs. Okay, well, in the interest of time, uh, we have to leave the other questions. But Chris, please take a look at the chat uh, page and try to see whether you could go back to the questioners and satisfy them. I mean, there are bunches of questions like whether you know the law would apply to BCC or what is the influence of the angle of attack and all these questions. So uh, they are all very interesting questions, obviously all inspired from your very interesting talk. So great talk. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, let's move on to the second uh, invited, uh, sorry, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Jun Lo. Um, so Professor Lo obtained his PhD from uh, Princeton University and after postdoc research at Brown University, he joined Rice University and he's currently a full professor and associate chair of the Department of Material Science and, Engineer and Nano Engineering. So uh, Professor Lowe has extensive experience in the synthesis and design of 2D materials beyond graphene and other nanomaterials, nanomechanical and multiphysics characterization and fabrication of advanced material systems and devices. He has published more than 300 peer reviewed papers, including those in high impact journals, such as Nature, Science, Nature Materials, so on and so forth. Um, he serves as the site director for the NSF Industry University Collaborative Research Center of um, atom Atomically Thin Multifunctional Coatings, uh, nicknamed Atomic, exploring potential applications of 2D materials in different industries with commercial partners. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, and he's also serving as the uh, co-editor-in-chief of Materials Today. So, um, Passing the time to you now, uh, uh, June. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Afonso. Let me uh, try to share my screen. Okay. 
Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, very clearly. And we can hear you well. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. And I'm also very grateful for the uh, organizing committee uh, for giving me the opportunity and the honor to speak here today. Uh, so uh, what I'm planning to do uh, in the next 40, 45 minutes uh, is to share the journey of my research group in the past uh, decade, uh, trying to understand the fracture behavior of uh, two-dimensional materials. Uh, so this is uh, the kind of outline for my talk today uh, after some brief introduction and background. Uh, I, I want to share several uh, studies or case studies, if you will, uh, of our uh, this journey uh, with you. Uh, first, uh, talking about uh, the fracture toughness of graphene and the potential toughening strategies related to that. And uh, the second example I want to give uh, is a more recent study that we discovered a very exciting, uh, that is a symmetry induced intrinsic toughening mechanism that is very unique uh, in the hexagonal boronitride uh, uh, system, uh, monolayer hexagonal boronitride. Uh, and then uh, in the last part, uh, I will also want to uh, discuss some of our uh, explorations uh, of the 2D material fracture uh, sort of study uh, in other uh, 2D system, uh, including the monolayer transition metal dichargogenide uh, system like uh, molydisulfide, molydiselenide, uh, as well as uh, the recently emerged uh, interesting system, uh, which is the 2D polymer uh, covalent organic frameworks. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the plan. And uh, if uh, uh, before I get started, I think I, I need to really acknowledge uh, all the students and the postdoc worked on those projects. Uh, they are the people who actually did the work and I got the pleasure to present it uh, here uh, to you, uh, but they are the heroes behind all the work uh, I'm talking today. And I'm also being very fortunate uh, to collaborate uh, with uh, a, a very uh, uh, distinguished uh, colleagues uh, around the world uh, on the number of projects here, uh, the name are listed here. And in the end, I uh, want to acknowledge the funding sources uh, for myself and also for the collaborators uh, on those projects. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, I think we have a pretty diverse audience here. So please allow me a few minutes uh, to introduce to you the uh, world of two-dimensional materials. Um, I think uh, for those of you who work on nanomaterial uh, or the carbon nanotube world, uh, this is probably not very foreign to you. Uh, for the uh, uh, carbon material, uh, we have different allotropes and the graphene is being uh, one of them, uh, which basically is a single layer of uh, uh, carbon uh, material, single uh, atomic layer of carbon uh, with the hexagonal lattice, uh, which basically leads to the Nobel Prize in 2010 uh, this uh, graphene field was started by those two gentlemen um, back in the 2004 yeah, for the groundbreaking uh, breaking experiment uh, to essentially start the whole field uh, of the two-dimensional materials. Okay, so uh, the reason that uh, the uh, research community got really excited about those two-dimensional materials are uh, many uh, uh, for many different reasons for different uh, community. Uh, for example, for physics community, uh, people are very excited about uh, the quantum confinement effect and also the extraordinary uh, physical properties such as conductivity uh, of uh, uh, graphene and the quantum Hall effect. And for the uh, community, uh, like uh, uh, the material community, the community I'm in on the nanomechanics community, uh, we're very excited about the extremely high uh, strengths and modulus uh, basically exhibited by those two-dimensional material, which I will touch upon uh, a little bit uh, shortly. Okay. Uh, so uh, without uh, boring you too much uh, on the uh, various of uh, exciting aspect of two-dimensional material, I just want to quickly say that um, in order for this field to succeed, uh, you have to uh, develop uh, important areas of application uh, those material can be uh, used for. So right now in the two-dimensional uh, material community, uh, there are very strong pushes in several directions, uh, including 
using both uh, chemical vapor deposit uh, CVD growing uh, 2D materials, uh, as well as the uh, liquid processing uh, based on two-dimensional nano sheets uh, to make uh, flexible electronics as shown in those uh, left two figures. Uh, people are also uh, leveraging the very strong mechanical property of 2D materials such as graphene uh, for the reinforcing agent uh, in the composite. Okay. So uh, for those kind of application uh, to be successful, especially make it the way into the commercial world, uh, you really have to make sure that we have a pretty thorough understanding about the mechanical properties of those 2D material. Okay? And also to realize their potentials uh, in those uh, uh, application domains uh, for uh, reliability issues uh, to start with. Okay. So that kind of uh, from the technological side motivate uh, the kind of study we want to perform. Why do we care? Uh, the mechanical property of uh, uh, 2D material. And more specifically in this uh, type of work we do, the fractal behavior of 2D materials. Um, so we have uh, seen some very exciting early results uh, from a research group uh, uh, in Columbia University, uh, uh, Professor Jim Hong, and also Professor uh, Jeff Kaiser, uh, who is basically the mechanics counterpart who uh, initiated this early study. Uh, because of the very, very uh, strong S, uh, the carbon, carbon bond uh, due to the sp2 hybridization, uh, we know the carbon-carbon bond is one of the strongest bond in nature. So it was long predicted um, the carbon nanomaterial like carbon nanotube, and in this case graphene, were going to have very, very high uh, breaking strengths as well as modulars in the order of teropasca for the modulars and for the breaking stress, the theoretical uh, breaking stress typically uh, scale with one tenth of your modulus. So it's above 100 GPA. So those numbers were verified uh, by those beautiful experiments performed by the Columbia groups. Uh, they basically demonstrate that experimentally you do achieve those high numbers. Okay. Uh, then the question comes, uh, if you have defect uh, in those sample, what will happen to the strengths, right? Uh, and uh, also when we actually look at the, the application domain that I mentioned earlier, uh, when you are thinking about large area flexible electronics, then the material you use uh, inevitably will have defects like uh, the fabrication defect and the crack-like defect. So we're not actually probing uh, the intrinsic strengths of 2D material. We're going to actually try to answer different question. When you have defect in those two-dimensional material, how much resistance those material have to the crack propagation? So this is actually a very classical um, uh, question in the material science. Uh, While well, people actually define a different uh, uh, a parameter to define the material resistance to cracking, that's the fracture toughness. So the strength and fracture toughness apparently are very uh, two very different concepts here. Yeah, so we are trying to differentiate those uh, in also the two-dimensional mat materials. Uh, that's kind of set the stage uh, for uh, the rest of my talk that I'm going to focus on. Okay. And another issue, uh, not, not really issue, but rather limitation of the indentation experiment as a lot of us know, uh, working on this nano indentation field for a long time, uh, that you have pretty complex stress state underneath your indenter and also very concentrated stress. So that loading geometry is not well fitted to study fracture behavior, even though you can get some fracture puncture strengths, but it's not easy to study how the crack is propagating on the uh, 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 indenter tip uh, for those suspended membrane or thin sheet sample. So we also need to think about a different loading geometry uh, in order to properly understand the fracture behaviors uh, in those uh, two-dimensional uh, material. Okay, so uh, before I get into my uh, talk, uh, since I know Chris uh, is a speaker before me, uh, I also want to share this one slide that uh, in the world of two-dimensional uh, two materials, uh, people also care about this uh, high strain rate uh, effect. So uh, we used a similar technique, a lipid technique uh, as introduced by Chris earlier uh, in collaboration with my former colleague, Professor Ned Thomas, uh, who was also a former colleague of Chris at MIT uh, that uh, studied this uh, uh, 
the the impacts uh, behavior of uh, multilayer graphene, and it was discovered that um, the graphene actually can dissipate a lot more energy compared to uh, the metal as well as polymer with comparable thickness. Okay. Uh, for the interest of the time, I don't really have time to explain the detail, but that has to do with the very high speed of sound uh, in graphene, uh, which was kind of uh, very nicely put forward by uh, Chris in his earlier talk. And uh, you can actually have a, a ability for graphene to dissipate a lot more dynamic energy uh, during this impact process. Okay, so that sort of uh, 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 the end of my introduction on the, the 2D side, uh, but I also want to uh, bring this uh, uh, interesting um, uh, uh, point up that um, when you have a material uh, which basically have high strengths, it's well known in the bulk material, you could have this conflict of um, strengths and uh, toughness. Uh, this point was actually very ad elegantly uh, summarized in a recent review paper by Professor Rob Ritchie at UC Berkeley. Uh, that he actually have this very nice uh, chart showing that um, you know material have very high strengths uh, normally have uh, relatively low uh, toughness okay so in order to overcome that uh, conflict between the strengths and toughness uh, there are different engineering strategy you can uh, basically develop and adapt for different material system uh, that can be divided roughly into so-called intrinsic toughening and the extrinsic toughening strategies, um, essentially for the e e extrinsic toughening strategy, that's based on the composite idea. And the intrinsic uh, toughening strategy is mostly based on the modification of uh, your internal microstructures. Okay, so I'm also going to try to uh, come back, circle back to those ideas and see how this uh, three-dimensional material law applies in the two-dimensional world. All right. So um, this year is a very special year. Uh, I think a lot of, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the fractional mechanics, uh, you know that this is a 100 year anniversary for this uh, uh, important paper published, uh, published by um, uh, Dr. A. Griffiths, uh, essentially started the whole field of fractional mechanics, right? So uh, one of the central uh, prediction from Griffith theory essentially summarizes uh, in this very simple equation. And I'm going to try to convince you that uh, it's possible uh, using the uh, advanced nanomechanical testing uh, uh, system that is now available for researchers, we could actually uh, carry out Griffiths-like experiment uh, for those two-dimensional material, okay? So uh, just looking at this equation, we know that uh, for the, uh, fracture of a brittle material is essentially is a competition uh, between two energy terms, uh, the elastic energy and the surface energy, right? In the case of a two-dimensional material, uh, the fracture surface is really not a surface, it's the fracture edge to, to be precise. So that's the edge energy versus the uh, elastic energy, okay? So uh, the question we are trying to uh, address here, or we ask ourselves when we started this whole project uh, about eight years ago, is with this Griffith simple law, very elegant, very uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, classical uh, uh, theory, can that also work for the two-dimensional materials? Uh, that's the question we set out to, to, to answer uh, when we first started this project. So with that uh, being uh, introduced, uh, let me tell you the tool uh, that we uh, developed uh, trying to understand this behavior. So in my group, uh, we have been working on this nanomechanics uh, testing uh, uh, framework uh, for quite a while. And this is uh, one of the device we developed, we call a push-pull device, which essentially is a, a MEMS type of device. But in this case, it's not exactly a MEMS, uh, more of a mechanical device that the, the device itself is actuated by an instrumented, uh, instrumented uh, nano indenter. Okay, so you could actually use nano indenter to push the top shadow, and the symmetric design of the sample stage will convert that compression force to the pure unilateral tension force. Okay, so if we can actually uh, have a way to attach our sample of interest, can be a carbon nanotube, a metal nanowire, or in our case, in this case, is essentially a sheet of nano uh, 2D uh, material. 
uh, to that sample stage, then we'll be able to perform a uniaxial tensile uh, experiment. So the, the nice thing about this setup is it gave us opportunity to reproduce the classical Griffiths experiment. If you recall, in the Griffiths experiment, uh, he was basically uh, stretching uh, uh, two-dimensional sheets of uh, glass, right, with a center crack of 2A. That's a famous uh, Griffiths crack geometry. So that's, that's what we were trying to do, and that's the, the tool that we use. All right, so in order to use this tool properly, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, the suspended stage is not sticking to the substrate. So the transfer of the uh, graphene material is very important uh, and take the students very long time uh, to develop this uh, dry transfer technique. Um, I'm not going to elaborate too much, but we were able to, uh, without using any solvent uh, and also etchant, uh, to transfer the graphene from the growth substrate, which typically is a uh, copper, onto this uh, suspended stage uh, for the subsequent test. And here is the image of that. And you can see the TEM cross-section. We're actually able to transfer both uh, monolayer and bilayer graphene onto this stage uh, with very good uh, uh, adhesion to the substrate due to this uh, strong van der Waals force uh, because of large area of 2D material uh, in contact with your device uh, layer, okay? And uh, in order to reproduce the Griffiths experiment, we have to make a center crack of uh, center crack uh, of 2A, right? This lens of uh, 2A. And that's what we did uh, using a focus ion beam uh, system, uh, using the ion beam to cut the center crack in the middle. And uh, the force is applied, if you can see my cursor, uh, in this direction, the horizontal direction. So after you apply the force, uh, the crack will essentially grow from those uh, uh, pre-crack uh, region and very quickly run across the sample. So one thing I want to uh, draw your attention to is uh, this, the edge of this uh, fractured uh, graphene is very flat. Uh, it doesn't really show any torturosity of the crack. Uh, so essentially show a very, very brittle behavior. And uh, once the cracks start to grow, it's going very fast, much faster than the uh, frame speed uh, the SEM can capture. So we really don't know uh, the, the process of how this crack is developing in the graphene system. Okay, so this, those are the typical uh, stress strain curve. And uh, if we can get that, uh, we can actually uh, plot this uh, very uh, various of the experimental result in this table. And you can essentially correlate the pre-crack size uh, A naught to your breaking strengths. And remember that equation I showed you earlier, uh, sigma C times the square root of this uh, pre-crack lens uh, should more or less equal to a constant, which is the, uh, related to your uh, Young's modulus, your surface or edge energy. Uh, and that's essentially what we observe uh, in this experiment. So uh, if we uh, make a little bit of calculation uh, based on the linear elastic fraction mechanics, uh, we will be able to uh, essentially get the uh, driving force for the crack, which is defined as the stress intensity factor, uh, Kc here. And you can see that uh, the stress intensity factor for the, um, uh, this uh, 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 graphene is not very high. It's really just four MPa per root meter, right? And for those of you who uh, work on this area, you know this is really very low compared to metal sample. This is really something like a uh, brittle ceramic, like an oxide, okay? And uh, if you compare that uh, experimental result we have, we also converted that to the um, energy release rate, G. Uh, this is very close to what people predicted uh, from the theory, from the MD simulation, okay? So uh, it, it's sort of a, a, uh, very contrasting in a way that graphene demonstrate very, very high intrinsic strengths and also the Young's modulus, but it fracture resistance is not as impressive. So this is one of the important message I want to uh, present here, that uh, graphene uh, is not a very tough material in, ter in terms of fracture resistance, okay? Uh, this was somewhat disappointing for my student who, who actually performed those experiments. Uh, but one thing I uh, always encourage him to say is uh, uh, it's not too bad to have a low starting point. That means we can have a lot of room to improve. So how do we actually uh, figure out ways to improve the toughness or fracture toughness of graphene? 
Um, we, I mentioned about uh, this in, intrinsic and extrinsic toughening um, mechanism or the strategy uh, that works well for the bulk material. So we also try to look into that uh, for the 2D material. Uh, one of the possibility is to manipulate uh, the green size uh, of the, the, uh, the green boundary orientation of the graphene because the graphene we are working with is CVD grown and they are not single crystal. Uh, they essentially have green boundaries in the system. So um, it's actually not easy to control the green boundary orientation in the growth process. So we decided to uh, ask the help from our theoretical collaborator, Professor Ting Zhu, and uh, uh, did some work. Uh, sorry, let me show that. Uh, did some work actually to show that um, the by changing the green boundary orientation, it doesn't really help too much in terms of uh, deterring the, the crack propagation in graphene. So the benefit uh, from the, uh, the uh, microstructure modification to the fracture toughness in, uh, improvement uh, is not very, very promising, uh, at least from the theoretical point of view. So another way to think about to toughen those uh, material uh, is to see if we can actually introduce the plasticity uh, into the system, right? Because uh, uh, one way to increase the fracture toughness is to induce the cracked plasticity. So uh, in the uh, carbon lattices uh, or the graphene or carbon nanotubes, uh, it's well known that uh, we could also uh, induce uh, dislocation-like defect. Those are so-called five, seven pairs uh, in the uh, carbon lattices. This is equivalent to the dislocations uh, in metallic system, right? We know the uh, motion of dislocation is really important uh, for the uh, plastic deformation. Plasticity is mediated by the motion of dislocations. So having those uh, defect, uh, those dislocation defect uh, in the carbon lattices is actually not enough uh, unless you can make them start to move uh, in the system, uh, which mediate the plastic deformation. And uh, from the work uh, from my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Boris Jakobsen, and also Professor Feng Ding, who used to be a research scientist at Rice, uh, they demonstrated that the, the barrier for those uh, five, seven, those uh, uh, stone wells defect to move uh, in the carbon lattices is, is very high. Unless you reach to a very high temperature uh, that using the thermal energy to get over that uh, barrier, uh, it's very hard to see the plasticity uh, in the carbon lattices. So in our case, we actually observed that uh, at the, the, the testing condition in our experiment, uh, you really see very little sign of plasticity. It's essentially uh, all due to the uh, brittle kind of behavior. Okay, so that essentially uh, just trying to say that uh, intrinsic toughening uh, strategy for graphene is going to be very difficult if it's not impossible. So we turned our attention to the extrinsic toughening strategy. Uh, I happen to have a very strong chemistry uh, department at Rice, uh, a lot of very, very wonderful colleagues working on different kinds of carbon nano chemistry. So uh, Professor Jim Tours group is well known to uh, essentially integrate uh, different kinds of carbon nano materials together uh, for, to form various very interesting uh, structure and materials. So his group developed this so-called rebar graphene. Uh, they were able to fuse the carbon nanotubes into the graphene uh, lattices. And it's almost like the rebar reinforcing the concrete. Okay. So that actually provided a way for us to see if this rebar graphene can use the extrinsic toughening strategy I mentioned earlier and uh, see the uh, improvement uh, in the uh, fracture toughness. So we take those sample and uh, made the same type of experiment. And you can immediately see that the fracture edges are very different from graphene. They are not a straight and the flat anymore. They actually are pretty tortuous and very, very rough. And in some cases, we actually see that the crack is not running through the whole sample uh, from the initial site. You could actually uh, uh, nucleate multiple cracks from different locations and you see a crack uh, turning around and also branching uh, in those systems. So uh, when we do the quantitative measurement, it actually confirms those rebar graphene indeed uh, shows very strong tough, uh, uh, toughening effect. We do see the uh, big increase, almost a twofold increase uh, in terms of fracture toughness we can measure. And when we um, 
trying to see what really contribute to those uh, uh, extra toughening effect. Uh, we use a different setup that can actually perform the same test inside the TEM. And if we run those tests, uh, we start to see that you see the carbon nanotube being pulled out from the graphene let, uh, the, the matrix and the, the abridging the cracks. And sometimes you can see also graphene abridging those cracks, uh, which gave you extra uh, uh, ways of dissipate energy during the fracture process. And this being confirmed uh, by our uh, collaborator, Professor Hua Jian Gao's group uh, in their uh, MD simulation. All right. So uh, I think uh, I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, I'm going to very quickly uh, share with you uh, some of the uh, recent result uh, to see if uh, intrinsic toughening is indeed even possible uh, for the two-dimensional material. So this kind of uh, uh, observation was actually uh, uh, basically uh, observed uh, in a different 2D material system, uh, the two-dimensional two hexagonal boronitride system. So for those of you who are not familiar with boronitride, uh, just think about having a, a graphene uh, lattices and then replace all the carbon atoms uh, with boron and nitrogen. Okay, so you're going to have this uh, boron nitrogen uh, system. It's still hexagon lattices. And uh, in fact, the, the lattice constant difference between HBN and graphene are very small. Uh, it's very different, uh, very difficult actually to identify the differences between the uh, HVN and the carbon in the TEM because of those uh, uh, very small lattice uh, uh, constant differences. And in fact, HB and C are next to each other in the uh, elementary ta uh, table. Okay. So um, with that background, uh, let me tell you what we observed. Uh, it's very, very intriguing for us to see that um, during the test of the monolayer HBN, high quality HBN monolayer sample, which is single crystal in this case, uh, we are able to see very stable crack growth, which was never observed uh, in our previous studies of different uh, 2D material system. Uh, one example I want to show you here is that the crack initiate here in the middle, and then in the uh, when we increase the load, we can see the steady growth of the crack to the next location. Uh, in the case of graphene, uh, if we increase the load, um, then we're going to see this crack running really quickly uh, before we can capture the image and sample will be gone. Okay. But in the case of this uh, uh, HBN, we actually can see very stable crack growth uh, process. We also calculate what we call the uh, fracture resilience, uh, which is essentially defined as the energy uh, absorbed during the elastic deformation stage of, the, uh, of our experiment. And this fracture resilience uh, of monolayer uh, HBN is actually uh, two, uh, almost four times larger than the, uh, the same material, uh, but you stack them into the multi-layer. So the monolayer ones is much, much stronger in terms of fracture resilience compared to the multi-layer sample. And those two combined tells us something is going on in the HBN. There must be some uh, different mechanism at work uh, that gave you very stable crack growth in the HBN monolayer. Okay. So uh, we set out uh, then to do the similar experiment we did, uh, trying to see if we can measure the fracture toughness of uh, HBN. Uh, and in this case, uh, we did not use the FIB, the ion beam to cut the pre-crack because those pre-crack are typically uh, very dull at the crack tip. Uh, it's not atomically sharp, well, which will give us trouble in get some very accurate measurement of fracture toughness, which we later realized after publishing the first paper on the graphene fracture toughness. So in this case, we actually are able to introduce very, very sharp uh, a crack by the pre-stress. And uh, if we do that, uh, we can actually measure uh, what we call the resistance curve, the R curve, for the first time in the two-dimensional materials, uh, as shown in this uh, the K figure. And you can see as the uh, cracks extension uh, increases, uh, the resistance to fracture also increases. Okay, So we can actually confirm that you do have very different uh, 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 fracture behavior uh, in the HBM lattices compared to the graphene. And when you measure the, uh, the, uh, 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 this uh, 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 stress intensity factor, uh, they are actually uh, a lot higher uh, than in the graphene case. Okay. Uh, and also converted to the uh, elastic, uh, the, this uh, 
uh, uh, energy release rate, uh, which I shown in the bottom. All right, so why do we see that, right? Um, uh, before I actually tell you some of the mechanistic understanding about the process, I also want to share with you some of the uh, sort of uh, uh, observations of the fracture surfaces uh, of those or fracture edges, um, uh, to be precise, of the HBN sample. We see when you zoom in uh, in the TEM, we see a very rough edges uh, along the fracture edge. And you very frequently will see the crack turning around. Uh, you have the uh, crack turning and also the branching behavior uh, uh, observed uh, in those uh, HPN uh, sample. Okay. So what actually was the uh, root cause of that? Uh, that actually has to do with the uh, very interesting uh, lattice asymmetry uh, in the HPN. Because in the HPN case, remember, uh, you have two different elements boron and nitrogen uh, in your lattices. While in the graphene case, which is showing on the rightmost column, you only have the one type of uh, atom, carbon atom, okay? So when you have uh, this um, uh, lattice asymmetry, uh, there's a few things could happen. So we, uh, our collaborator, uh, Professor Huajian Gao's group performed a multi-skill mechanical analysis, which combining the DFT calculation, as well as the final element model, uh, trying to really understand this process from two stages, the crack initiation, the crack growth initiation process, and the, the actual cr crack growth uh, 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 stage. Okay, so in the initiation stage, uh, what could happen here is that you can see that due to this uh, uh, asymmetry uh, of the lattices, uh, the HBN actually can sustain a lot higher load uh, before the crack will essentially start to initiate. And uh, uh, you also see the possibility of bifurcate the, 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 the crack tip, uh, because obviously the, uh, at the crack tip regime, uh, you actually have two possible choices to break the bond, okay? Uh, well, in the case of uh, uh, graphing, uh, showing on the rightmost column, um, it's actually the initiation uh, level of the stress intensity factor is pretty low. Uh, about 11.4 uh, 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 in that range. But for the HBN, you can go above uh, that level to almost 20 uh, M, uh, joule per meter square okay, for the energy release rate. Another very important thing I want to emphasize is that um, when you see the crack uh, inside the HBN lattices, uh, the two opposing crack surfaces actually have different termination. Uh, you have the nitrogen terminated edge and also the uh, foreign terminated edge, okay? The edge stress amplitude is very different. The nitrogen terminated edge stress is actually two times higher than the foreign terminated edge from the DFT calculation. So because of this uh, 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 stress, uh, or what we call the edge polarization uh, effect, uh, you actually will intrinsically introduce a mode two uh, stress intensity factor at the crack tip which is not related to the bar field stress you apply. Doesn't matter what kind of stress you apply, tensile, shear, or other stress. Locally at the craft tip, you're going to introduce this uh, uh, mode two uh, stress intensity factor, which will enable the crack turning or essentially the, the, uh, uh, the crack zigzagging in, in the system, okay? So when you go to the uh, growth uh, process, uh, then the, Due to this uh, uh, three-fold symmetry of HBM lattices, uh, we actually observe that uh, the edge, this uh, N-terminated edge and the born terminated edge will swap as the crack propagate. Uh, when the crack tip uh, bifurcate, uh, when they bifurcate, it will swap. And then you have an inversion of your uh, mode two uh, stress intensity factor. And that actually help you to uh, turn the crack back and then uh, you will also enable the next bifurcation event. So essentially this uh, uh, very interesting, uh, that is asymmetry arrangement in HBN, intrinsically will introduce those uh, uh, crack branching and the crack turning, uh, which we observed in experimentally, uh, gave rise to the higher fracture toughness we observed. So this is a, a very interesting uh, behavior that essentially for a lot of those uh, uh, 2D material, when you have the lattice asymmetry, 
uh, potentially we can actually induce those intrinsic toughening mechanism uh, to make those 2D material tougher uh, or more resistant to the uh, uh, crack uh, propagation. Okay, so uh, I think with that, I'm going to just very quickly show you that uh, we also explored uh, other uh, 2D system, including the TMD, uh, the transition metal dichrogenized, for example, this uh, uh, tri-layer structure of monolayer. Uh, for the molydisulfide. And uh, uh, we uh, use the molydiselenide system as the example to study this class of material and find out that they are very, very brittle, actually uh, way more brittle than even graphene. Uh, very hard to actually make a pre-crack and then to measure the fracture toughness. So we end up just to uh, collect a bunch of those uh, 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 strength measurement uh, for the non a pre-cracked sample, the pristine sample, what we call. And you can see from a, a, a representative stress strain curve here, it's very, very brittle, very elastic, uh, uh, linear elastic behavior. And one thing I, I, I want to emphasize is that right now there's a, a big push in the two-dimensional material community. People are trying to utilize the very high elastic strain uh, in those 2D materials to tune the functional property like a bend gap uh, of those 2D semiconductors. But typically the, the strain you needed to have uh, the induced those effect is around 10%. Uh, what I want to warn uh, the experimentalist in the, uh, in the audience is that it's actually very hard to achieve that high elastic modulus, even though the theoretical prediction gave you that uh, due to those uh, very tiny uh, uh, defect, gross defect, uh, for example, in the CVD um, MOSE2. So we did a back of envelope uh, estimation to just essentially use the Griffith theory to estimate uh, what type of, uh, uh, how big those uh, gross defect can be. As you can see from this table, uh, they range from a few nanometers to few tens of nanometer. Uh, very hard to see experimentally, uh, but they do exist. So it, those things will limit how much elastic strain you can actually achieve uh, in order to uh, uh, enable those uh, string engineering a strategy that will give you some wonderful uh, possibilities. Okay, uh, so uh, my final story is just to show you that uh, another class of material, which is extremely interesting to be studied, uh, is this 2D uh, covalent organic frameworks. And we now have our ability actually to make very thin layers, very controlled uh, growth uh, of highly crystalline 2D polymer. Okay. And this is one of the approach that uh, uh, we uh, developed in my group uh, using this uh, uh, liquid uh, solid interface, uh, interfacial synthesis. Then you can make very controllable uh, thin layer of a 2D cuff uh, with high crystallinity. And uh, then uh, when you actually try to understand that mechanical property, it turns out to be uh, pretty impressive uh, for polymer. Okay, uh, If you look at the number here, uh, there are fracture strands uh, is almost uh, uh, approaching uh, GPA, one GPA, okay? Uh, very impressive for uh, polymer materials. And if you plot them against uh, other polymer polymeric system uh, in terms of the fracture uh, strengths and the modulus, you can see they are uh, way up there. Uh, so it's a pretty strong uh, 2D polymer. And uh, we are interested in the fracture, as I mentioned. So we also made those uh, pre-crack and turns out uh, this uh, 2D cough has some very, very interesting behavior we haven't really fully understand yet. Uh, some of the sample actually does not propagate from the pre-made uh, defect. Uh, sort of uh, flow insensitive uh, behavior has been observed uh, in those 2D polymer system. Okay. So for the uh, non-flow insensitive uh, samples, we could do the same thing we did uh, earlier uh, to essentially obtain uh, the fracture toughness. Uh, but for the other ones, uh, we could not. So uh, there is a very famous criterion uh, developed by Professor Hua Jian Gao in terms of floral insensitivity, uh, which essentially related in this chart. And we plotted the, our experimental data uh, in that the prediction and it seems to be uh, the same kind of uh, uh, theory still works. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate that, but I will leave that here and we have this paper uh, just published earlier uh, uh, this year uh, in Matter. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, check them out. 
So uh, this is my final slides, uh, just kind of summarizing what we did. And hopefully uh, this has been interesting for, for the audience. And uh, uh, my final slides is trying to put my editor hat uh, here, uh, just to say that the uh, uh, material today is not just a review uh, journal. Uh, we welcome uh, uh, basically uh, articles of um, original research and also comments. Uh, as well as perspectives. So um, uh, please consider uh, submitting to Material Today uh, when you are um, producing your most uh, exciting work. Um, with that, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, June, for the excellent talk. Uh, we do have a few questions on the floor. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask, um, the one in, the, in, in my head first, uh, you talk about this rebar structure, which is quite fascinating. So they are like self-assembled structures, right? So, uh, I mean, how do they interact with the graphene sheet? I mean, do they, do they just adhere on the surface of the graphene sheet or are they kind of like embedded into the graphene sheet? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so uh, the way that those uh, uh, rebar graphene was made uh, actually, a starting material is a carbon nanotube. Uh, they start with this uh, multiple nanotube uh, spread it on the surface. Uh, then with the precursor and the right growth condition, a graphene layer will form essentially uh, around those uh, nanotubes. So the, uh, there is very, uh, it's very difficult actually to get the, the detailed analysis about the bonding between the nanotube and the graphene matrix. But the current understanding is uh, they are actually embedded. They are not adhered uh, to the surface. Uh, in fact, uh, to verify that, uh, we try to uh, essentially perform the similar experiment with a graphene layer. Then we transfer randomly kind of a spreaded uh, carbon nanotube on top of graphene. And in those samples, we don't see those uh, strengthening effect. Uh, graphene just break as normal. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, what we believe right now is uh, nanotubes are in fact embedded in the graphene lattices. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there is a question on the out of plane uh, deformation in, in your kind of test. Uh, so are you able to eliminate any out of plane kind of like a twisting or deformation from the kind of test rig that you have built? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's another very good question. Uh, that's obviously of great concern to us, uh, whether or not, uh, because the alignment of the sample obviously is of paramount in importance in those experiments. Uh, so um, to make sure that we don't really have this out of plane uh, deformation during this uh, uh, testing procedure, uh, we actually uh, went great lengths uh, in, the, in the past to do the calibration. Uh, to make sure that uh, during this uh, um, uh, 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 actuation stage, um, there's no tilting of our sample stage. Uh, so uh, I think from that point of view, uh, we actually performed extensive experimental study on that. And uh, from our uh, early, uh, from our uh, calibration result, uh, that part of the deformation is pretty minimal. Okay, uh, final question uh, about the effect of temperatures. Have you tested kind of like extreme temperatures, high temperatures, low temperatures, and do you think vacancy concentration or adsorb gases would affect the strength of all these uh, 2D materials? That's another great question. Uh, that actually, I think, uh, is something I want to get the message across to the community. This is the open field. Uh, we are not able to perform the high temperature test as of yet. Uh, that's in our plan. Uh, so we have developed uh, the dual heating stage, uh, essentially incorporated in our current testing stage. But there are some complexities on, uh, you know, doing all the thermal uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, calibration uh, in order to uh, get the very accurate measurement of the temperature. But I think that is a very, very important direction to be pursued. Uh, and uh, the gas absorption and also what is the functional a group could do to those two-dimensional materials, especially you have abundant surfaces, surface area in those 2D materials, it's going to be really important. Uh, I think that's a, a very important direction for what I call a, a chemo-mechanical uh, interaction in the 2D materials. 
Yeah, thanks hey, for that thank, great question. Thank you very much for your really uh, um, excellent uh, presentation, June. I'm afraid uh, this is what we have time for. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you. Okay, so uh, this uh, session is now over. So I'll pass the time back to whoever will take care of the next, uh, next session. <clears throat> Dr. Rabha? Professor Rabha Mishra? So now the parallel two uh, that is on mechanical behavior of materials will be, the session is already started. Uh, I request the participants and uh, speakers to join in on session two, whoever is, whoever is interested on mechanical behavior of materials. This parallel session will continue on, on advanced materials. So people who are interested on advanced materials can stay here. Whoever is interested in mechanical behavior of materials session two, they can join there. Thank you. Professor Abhamishra. Professor Abhamishra. Professor Abha? Yes. Hello? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, uh, hi, th thank you, Kiran. I'm sorry, uh, it was not really audible. Um, so, I welcome you all. Uh, good morning for the session. We are having this session on advanced material and characterization. And uh, our first speaker is Professor Arindam Ghosh. So, Professor Arindam Ghosh is a faculty in the Department of Physics at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And uh, his research interest involves fundamental understanding of physics and device concepts in multiple two-dimensional electron systems. And the main emphasis of these studies are on transport, optical, and thermal properties of layered membrane, and which eventually is leading to the ultra-sensitive optical detection, tunable thermoelectric designs, and power efficient memory devices for neuromorphic applications. So Professor Ghosh has served and serving various editorial and advisory board uh, on several international platforms and the journals like Springer, IOP, ACS, and a lot of conferences. So his excellent research has received several international and international recognitions and fellowships, which some of, few of them actually, I'm, I'm just going to read out and so, so he has received the Swarnjanti Fellowship, IBM IUSSTF, which is the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum Fellowship in Nanotechnology. He also, he's recipient of Sandi Sharub Bhatnagar Prize, Oxford Instrument Young Nanoscientist Awards, PK Anger Memorial Award, JC Bose National Fellowship. And recently he has also received the Infosys Prize in 2020, and he is fellow of all national academies. So I won't be taking too much time. I, I, I guess this list is very long. So I would like to invite Professor Ghosh for, for, to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Can you hear me? Yes, and we can see you. OK, excellent. Well, uh, thank you. Let me first share my screen. Um, while doing so, I would like to uh, thank Kiran and other organizers of this very interesting conference um, uh, and thank to the, uh, the opportunity that they gave me to present our work. Um, uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. yes. Wonderful. So let me just, uh, okay. So uh, uh, Abhav, uh, we have a total of half, uh, 30 minutes, right? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. I'll try and finish it within 25. So just see if I can leave out a couple of minutes of questions. Sure. Okay, great. So uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, since this is an international conference, 
Uh, I just let you know I am a colleague of Abhas from this uh, institution in Bangalore, Indian Institute of Science. Um, and my group at the Department of Physics is working on various uh, materials, in particular, the two dimensional materials is, is one of our major uh, direction of research. About 80% of the group is working towards uh, various aspects of this material, particularly uh, what we have done uh, or, or it's, is focus on the device and the fundamental aspects, take our fundamental understanding to application uh, in the various forms and the versatility of the two dimensional material is it allows you to, to look at various uh, physics. It's like emulating various physical properties whether it's magnetism, whether it is optoelectronics, whether it is thermoelectricity, whether it's uh, neuromorphic designs, or even crystal structure engineering. So there are a large number of different uh, properties that you could uh, you know, develop by appropriate uh, combination of these, uh, these materials. However, since this is an invited talk, I'm not going to go very broad, but I'm going to uh, be very focused on a recent results uh, which connects to uh, the magnetism uh, in these kind of, in how you look for magnetism in graphene. So uh, before we get into that, we just wanted to check, that, you know, there's a magnetism in 2D is one of the most interesting and important directions of today's research um, in materials and, and making devices and, uh, you know, understanding how you can change or tune magnetism is something which a lot of people are, uh, are excited by. So if you look at the overall uh, landscape of 2D, there are a large number of materials which are like these, which have got very small binding energy between two layers. They can be in principle uh, easily exfoliable to mechanical means. And in those, there are a large number of possible uh, magnetic materials, which can be both metals or semiconductors. This is, um, a simulation or, or it's a calculational result from uh, you know about two or three years ago, um, of which if you look at this set of compounds, which is as um, you know chromium iodide and uh, trichromium iodide, this is something which has taken off very very uh, big way, and because it gives you um, you know it shows that its magnetism is dependent on layers, and very recently uh, look, looking using. Uh, diamond vacancies, you can even map out the magnetism in such uh, materials. For example, this is a single layer chromium triodide, this is a, bi a twisted bilayers of chromium iodide, triodide. And you can see how you can change magnetic um, response or magnetism in general of these systems by engineering materials in, a, in, in different ways. Uh, however, even if we do not go to such materials, but we want to concentrate on graphene because Graphene is, as you have heard from the morning, that it, it is something that we would like to control because you can do so many things with it. You can make field effect devices to mechanical um, structures. So we would like to look at how we can generate magnetism in graphene or and, and, and probe and tune. Okay. So recently this has come in a big way because of the emergence of twisted bilayers, and you can you can you can create flat bands in graphene, for example, by twisting graphene, uh, two layers of graphene, and that leads to very uh, sharp density of states. And because of this large density of states uh, in the twisted bilayer graphene, which are twisted around 1.06 or so, where the two bands repel to form these very sharp bands, very flat bands, you can create certain ferromagnetic order. And similar things have been done is trilayer graphene and boron nitride heterostructures, where the interaction between boron nitride and trilayer graphene can also lead to these very flat electronic bands and hence high density of states that has led to large uh, hysteretic behavior in resistivity with the Hall resistivity in particular, which is taken as some form of manifestation of a magnetic order. So this has been the case for uh, uh, two dimensional graphene devices. However, there are other ways in which you can generate magnetism, and one of them is uh, edge magnetism. What happens is, uh, if you have a zigzag edge of graphene, you can see the zigzag edge can lead to this additional edge states here on this, only on this edge. This is semi-infinite graphene. The two edges are armchair or the zigzag, and in the armchair, this is the conventional um, 
conventional gap semiconductor, whereas in the case of zigzag, there could be a flat electronic bands. And this zero energy flat electronic bands can lead to strong increase in the density of states and hence magnetism. In fact, what has been observed is that if you look at the uh, interac interaction I mean, between strong Coulomb interaction can lead to uh, a ferromagnetic edge on one side or zigzag and rather the coupling between the two edges can be either ferromagnetic or it can be antiferromagnetic depending on the thickness or the width of or the separation between these two edges. These are essentially Garfield nano ribbons that are looked that were looked at theoretically and experimentally for a very long time. In fact, when it happened in experimentally, people used a scanning tunneling microscopy to look at the edge modes. You can see the bright regions of edge modes, uh, which can be looked at using scanning tunneling microscopy. And by looking at the gap structure, it has been inferred, although indirectly, that these two edges are magnetic and they can interact either ferromagnetically or antiferromagnetically, depending on the width of the nano ribbon. So these are directions which have been primarily looked at um, using uh, spectroscopy that is, or, or using uh, scanning probe microscopy. There were very little available from electrical transport viewpoint. You see, one of the difficulty in probing these is the standard magnetic probing becomes very difficult because of very, very small number of magnetic atoms that are present in such kind of a system. So what we did some few years ago is that we created such a wedge structure in which a zigzag edge and the armchair edge were stabilized about at 30 degree angle. And then we looked at the electrical transport because, because, of the, because when we make electrons go from top to bottom, what happens is that they are forced to go through the zigzag edge and the zigzag edge is uh, the only gapless state available. The rest of the system is gapped. And as a result, um, this leads to a direct transport manifestation of uh, magnetic order, if there's any. Is in fact, uh, this was based on, you know, by simply tearing graphene inside a scanning electron microscope. I'm going to sk skip through this. The electrical conductance through the edge, because it doesn't scatter, is the ballistic conductance E squared by H. But if you apply a magnetic field uh, to this, you look at the hysteresis of the back and forth sweep direction of magnetic field, which told us that the edge states of such nanographene sheets are not only a ballistic electrical conductor, which means that there's no scattering, but there is also a strong magnetic order that is probably present. Right, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I want to go now to the another different direction, which is going to be the main focus of my talk today. And that is magnetism at the grain boundary of, of graphene. Um, so there is a lot of work on this. There have been plenty of theoretical simulations, uh, work on defects, what, what kind of defects can host magnetism. So I'm going to give you a very brief outlook about because we, one of the main important aspect of this work is if you want to make graphene for large scale applications for larger areas, then you cannot avoid grain boundaries. And once you know you have grain boundaries, you certainly ask questions, not only just their mechanical properties, but also there are other physical properties. And we have been looking at the magnetic property of this. Okay. So if you look at the tilt grain boundaries, these are essentially uh, stone wells defects or five, seven uh, rings. And it has been shown that these are not magnetic structure. These do not uh, host any magnetic uh, atom or magnetic moment. However, if you have translational grain boundaries, which is something like this, then you have got this double pentagon octagon structure, which is repeated and making graphene essentially one is to one or two is to two. And that is given by this strong emergence of uh, magnetic moment. And uh, well, I mean, the problem in most realistic, um, uh, sorry. So what happens is if you, if you look at the density of states in such translational structure, you see a very large, very large density of states at, the, at zero energy, uh, which is similar to how we are trying to engineer we are trying to engineer the um, 
twisted bilayers of graphene to get magnetic systems. So most of the making material design aspect for these kinds of systems is to try to create a large density of states at zero energy, around zero energy. So this is how uh, you can see the, um, the, the moments can form and it, has form, it can lead to paramagnetism as was demonstrated theoretically. However, we are experimentalists. So we would first try to see how we can probe these kind of structures. First, we make them using CVD graphene and then CVD growth process, but we interrupt them by not going through the entire CVD group, but we only form these junctions and then stop, uh, stop this you know, uh, growth so that we create these green boundaries between two otherwise single crystalline patches. You can see this is the green boundary between two single crystalline grains. And if you look at their defect density, you can see there are a lot of defects. This is the high resolution EM image of this region and we can see a very strong defect density. I'm going to come back to this later. In fact, from theoretical point of view, there is no control of the growth as such when you create, when you grow, grow such kind of uh, grain boundaries, there is a very different type of uh, uh, structures that can form these large carbon rings. These are, this is a theoretical uh, calculation from Sudhita Datta and Katsunori Wakabayashi some years ago. And you can see there are a large number of different structures that can form when two graphene grains start and merge together. And that leads to, and what is important is that irrespective of these sizes, large carbon rings like this can still form a host strong magnetic order or magnetic moments, which can lead to magnetism. So with this um, background, let me just go into the people who did this work. This was made by uh, Professor Sinivas Raghavan's group. The theoretical calculations came uh, from Manish Jain's group, the crist uh, crystal structure characterization from Chandra Shekhar Tiwari. And this work formed a good chunk of PhD problems of two of our students here, Kimberly and Vidya. Um, right, so let me tell you one of the important thing here is that there is an absence of conventional magnetic measurements. We cannot, we still don't have, there are certain uh, very high sensitive uh, magnetic uh, probes, for example, the scanning squaters, things like that, but they have not been applied to materials which show magnetism, for example, at sub-Kelvin temperature, or at least for such kind of uh, graphene basis, grain boundary magnetism, they have not been applied so far. So there has been a serious lack of uh, probing, so we had to look for a different type of experimental probe, and this is what electrical transport came into play, and I'm going to give you a little bit of fundamental physics background about how we can probe magnetism using simple trans uh, electrical transport. Okay, so as I said that if you form these kind of junctions, you can create, create you know, the TEM image gives you the angle between the two grains, one of the samples that I show here is about 23 degrees. If you do Raman spectroscopy, you can see a strong disorder in the junction region, which is essentially separating two single grain region, which is where the sample is very, very high quality. Now, if I make devices, and this is what my group does primarily at IIC, we make devices from such structures. Um, the structure is something which you can see a grain boundary here, and these are the single grain regions. So on the same device, we are able to measure the single grain region and the grain boundary region. And the grain boundary region is, is uh, more disordered and hence its mobility is lower. So you can see the red one is uh, from, this is the resistivity versus gate voltage. And you can see the grid gate voltage is, um, this is a standard bell shaped electrical transport curve for a graphene based device, which shows that resistance goes down or when you dope it with both electron or hole. Um, so this is a, a tiny difference, but it doesn't say anything about uh, uh, what is the magnetic property. Okay. Um, so this is what I'm going to call the grain boundary GB region. And this region I'm going to call SG region for, uh, from now on. Now, if we look at quantum transport, which is essentially apply a magnetic field, you can see, you can get what the phase breaking. If you've got magnetic order, then the phase breaking becomes a frequent process and the phase breaking length, the electronic phase 
is lost fairly quickly if you have got additional magnetic moments where this electron can scatter from. So we have done strong, uh, uh, you know, detailed quantum transport, and we extracted the phase breaking. Link. So let me show you what happens there. You can see the phase breaking length of the SG region or within the single grain region is consistently higher, except near the Dirac point, than the than the grain boundary region. So that shows that as you increase the density, the electrons are losing the phase coherence somehow in the system. And this is what I'm going to show is because of the incipient magnetic order. Okay, so this is essentially a phase breaking length uh, as a function of gate voltage. If you see at these uh, high density over here and look at the temperature dependence of phase breaking rate, that means how often, how, how quickly you are losing your phase, you can see the grain boundary region here is actually saturating at very low temperature. Again, the, uh, uh, an effect which is expected for strong, um, you know, if you've got disorder, uh, which is magnetic in origin. So what we ask the question is that, okay, it looks like that in the case of grain boundary region, there is an additional scattering mechanism that might be causing phase decoherence and hence could be connected to the local moment. However, we still don't know if it's magnetic or not. So question is, how do you probe that? And we use that, what we call an universal conductance fluctuations as a, as a um, probe. And in, because universal conductance fluctuations are sensitive to the time reversal symmetry and time reversal symmetry is broken by magnetism uh, in any system. So it's a very robust probe the universal conductance uh, fluctuations is extremely robust probe to magnetism because of its sensitivity to time reversal symmetry. Let me give you a very quick uh, understanding of what, because this is not a conventional probe, uh, but I'll uh, you know try to tell you what how where it comes from. So if you take uh, an a system like this and make electrons go from one side of the sample to the other, they there's a large number of different paths. And you can see that these paths interfere because of low temperature quantum mechanical interference, uh, these paths interfere. And as a result, you have got two different paths. In some paths, the two paths go in the same direction. And in some cases, they go in opposite direction. And it turns out that they are exactly equal in size, in number. So that means one, when you apply a magnetic field, this path, which is moving in opposite direction where they interfere and move in opposite direction, the phase accumulated becomes random and they get eliminated by the, from, the, from contributing. So this leads to exactly a factor of two reduction in magnetic field by the, uh, if, if you're measuring the universal conductance fluctuations. So this reduction, UCF reduces exactly by a factor of two, is a symmetry protected, highly robust experimental probe to see if your system has got time reversal symmetry or not. Okay, so this has been done by many people. I'm going to skip this to this. There are random matrix theory, which, which told, tells you how this happens. And as a result, we are, we are pretty confident that using the reduction by a factor of two is a good probe to magnetic order. In, in a system like this. So uh, if you increase the magnetic field by phase breaking path, phase breaking field, you should see a factor of two reduction. Okay, this has been used by other people, like in the case of broken, uh, in, in the case of, you know, uh, standard metal and uh, magnetic metal has been shown that there is no, there is, if you look at gold palladium, there's a reduction in magnetic field by half because this is a non-magnetic system, but if you take a pyro, uh, a pol um, uh, this uh, magnetic wire, you can see if you apply a magnetic field, there is no change in, in noise. That means the time reversal symmetry has already been broken. We have used it ourselves in a different context, but that I'm not going to talk about. In the case of graphene, you can see that noise is measured by as a function of time uh, at different densities. You can see this is, um, delta R by R is a function of, function of time. Uh, and we calculate what you call a variance, which is essentially an integrated function. And this is uh, just over the experimental length of time, we calculate the, what is relative variance. And that is our experimental probe. 
Um, I'm going to skip this. What is important here is that the, uh, the graphene here is very sensitive to the existence of uh, grain boundary. The noise is really high in the case of grain boundary region. And in fact, if you normalize the noise by the magnitude of the length scale of the grain boundary, it is more than 10,000 times than the equivalent region in a single grain. So we had looked at it for a while now. Okay, uh, we have some understanding, but for the time being, I'm going to uh, not go too much into this detail. It's probably because at the grain boundary region, the screening becomes weak and hence the system becomes very noisy. Anyway, so let me now go to the main result and essentially look at the, look at the um, uh, resistance versus gate voltage as in, in grain boundary as a single grain region, as I showed you earlier. If I look at only the single grain region, which is here, you can see that if I apply a magnetic field, the noise is reducing exactly by a factor of two. That shows that in this grain boundary, in single grain region, the time reversal symmetry is intact. There is no problem. It is not a magnetic system at all. And irrespective of gate voltage. So the two points that I show, that is here, is this one. And this one, uh, other way around. So this one is given here, and this one is coming from here. So you can see, at, if you go to very high electron or hole densities, the apply a magnetic field, the noise is coming down exactly by a factor of two. This is a normal disordered diffusive system. Okay, good. And you can actually also get the phase coherence length from the fitting of the noise as a function of B, and it apply agrees within a factor of two. With the, with the phase breaking length that is extracted from the magnetotransport measurements or the you know, uh, magneto resistance measurement. Okay, but what happens at the grain boundary region is something very interesting. So if you look at the grain boundary region, now I'm measuring the electrical noise in this region, you can see that when you have close to the Dirac, when you are close to the Dirac point, you can see the resistance comes down, the noise comes down by a factor of two, which is expected for a, for a system which is non-magnetic. However, the moment you go to high density somewhere here, you can see this is the data at 4.5 here. You can see the noise comes down, not by a factor of two, but only by a factor of 1.5 or so. This is at 4.5 Kelvin. I'll show you what happens to this reduction factor as a function of gate voltage. You can see the this is the single grain region. No matter what the density is, the reduction factor is always two. But when the reduction factor, when the when you are in the grain boundary region, the reduction factor is two near the Dirac point. But as you keep on doping graphene, it comes down to less, reasonably less than uh, point uh, one, uh, reasonably less than two. It's about one point five here at four point five Kelvin. But if I do the same experiment at point three Kelvin, you can see a much more dramatic effect in which as you increase the density, you see the reduction factor is essentially gone to one. That means there is the magnetic field is not doing anything to the removal of the cuperons or remove the time reversal symmetry. And this is what we uh, interpret as a, you know, um, uh, already spontaneously removed time reversal symmetry due to the emergence of magnetic order. Um, can the magnetism occur with defects? Uh, well, I mean, there have been a large number of work on this. Uh, what is the origin of this? So if you look at the, if you look at the um, TEM image very carefully, you can see there are a large number of different possible defects. These are large rings. You can see this uh, here. And these are, well, I mean, uh, we are still, still trying to understand the, the type of defects that are present. As I said, there is no, there's no direct, um, you know, control when we try to make such main boundaries, uh, but we probably see some uh, pentagon octagon uh, pairs and in localized regions. There, there could be other regions where the different type of defects, the large carbon rings, can come up. Um, for example, these are these are these line defects, um, which is which is also present. And in addition, there are these uh, large number of terminations of single isolated defects that, that we see. And what we have done is that we have looked at the, looked at the separation and made some calculations. Uh, first of all, uh, calculations from Professor Manish Jain's group is, does say that it is possible to host 
magnetic moments in such kind of structures where you've got planted pentagon octagons and um, which is flanked by the stone well defects so that you can maintain uh, a flatness of the graphene. Otherwise, the graphene will no longer remain flat. But our experimental, our, in our experimental density range, which is here, a finite magnetic moment is possible, at least as far as theoretical uh, calculations are concerned. Uh, we, a back of the envelope calculation shows that, um, that we have uh, the typical RKQI interaction between different defects is in the order of few uh, fraction of a milli electron volt, which is roughly the temperature range at which we start looking at this. So this is about two nanometer or so is 0.05 to 0.1 milli electron volt region where, where we start seeing the seeing the um, magnetic order to develop. So there's, there's a possibility. It's not completely uh, completely outlandish to expect graphene grain boundaries to become magnetic at very low temperatures. Um, my final point here, Abha, can I have a, a minute? Are yes, you sure. No, no, okay. please. Okay, so is it an emergent uh, frozen magnetism? This is, uh, in order to understand that, we have looked at noise as a function of gate voltage. So basically, to give you an understanding, if you take a look at the, if you look at, take a look at the, maximum noise or universal conductance fluctuation that you get, it comes from two different sources, from the valley and from the spin. The spins can be singlet and three triplets, and the valleys, because of the valley degenerates, can also be uh, singlet and three triplets. So totally, there are two sets of channels of 16 each that gives you the total noise. So there are totally about 32 different channels, which gives you a total universal conductance fluctuations in between. Now, if you apply gate voltage, and this is something which we had done several years ago, you can, because of the short range scattering, the triplets are no longer there because they hybridize. And hence you're left only with uh, the singlet channels in both diffusion, because but there is no spin degeneracy removal, but the value degeneracy is removed. So this is something which we did several years ago, uh, showed that if you apply gate voltage, then beyond the, beyond the linear regime where the electrical, where, where the uh, short range scattering becomes important, which is here and here, the noise essentially comes down exactly by a factor of four. That's because the triplets have got, got removed through hybridization only the singlet channels are providing in UCF. However, uh, so this is about a factor of four or five. So this is what we have seen earlier. Okay, but what happens now is very different because now in addition to the value when you apply the gate voltage, you also have a magnetism. Now you are essentially gapping out all channels except a spin singlet of diffusion channel because the cuperons are done because the magnet effective magnetic field has killed all the cuperons, but only the diffusion channel singlet state remains. So as a result, you now have a reduction factor of nearly 32. So the noise as a function of gate voltage can come down by a nearly a factor of 32. And this is exactly what we see in, in, our exam, in our experiment, in which this is within the grain, this is the UCF within the grain, we can see it's coming down only by a factor of four or five, which essentially is connected to the value degeneracy removal. Whereas if you look at the noise in the case of grain boundary region, it comes down by a factor of 30. So final slide, uh, what we are seeing here, it is the grain boundary of graphene, she seems to be becoming a frozen magnetically ordered system. Of course, there is no, there is no direct um, ferromagnetic order or because the moments are defect oriented. And as a result, they are probably randomly positioning or positioned. Uh, and this could lead to a spin glass. We strongly believe that this is a spin glass that is happening. And that comes from our observation that below about two Kelvin, the electrical noise starts increasing very, very fast. And that's usually the case when a spin glass order starts setting in. Um, that's that's a lot, all about it. I wanted to conclude. We have seen edge magnetic edges uh, as one source of magnetism in graphene. And now we are looking at the possibility of grain boundary and grain boundary engineering. What it does is that it allows us to now create grain boundaries as a possible resource for uh, 
but for basic circuitry, you can create green boundaries by appropriate growth of graphene. And maybe this is something which can uh, form the you know, uh, source of other effects in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rangam. So, um, and uh, yes, certainly, I, I really enjoyed uh, this talk and uh, concepts about the conductance fluctuation and uh, kind of a probing mechanism and uh, even probing these quantum phenomena. So, uh, if from audience, any questions? Yeah, if I may ask a question. Hi, Rangam. Hi, Manga. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, I had a quick question. Uh, in this, uh, how do you take into account the intervalley scattering time? Because in graphene, the phase coherence times are ratios of intervalley relaxation times. So at the grain boundary, that uh, time is also going to have some issues because intervalley will break uh, translation yeah. symmetry. So Absolutely. Uh, what's happening to those time scales uh, at the grain boundary? Right. So uh, according to our uh, calculations, the, the at least the quantum transport, the intervalley scattering was still found to be significantly longer. So we could not the fitting did not differentiate much between the, we have done the fittings exactly the same way as the uh, single layer graphene region, uh, single grain region. And we found, as far as I remember, we did not find the intervalley scattering time to be significantly different. You know, I personally feel that the intervalley time doesn't make any sense at the graphene because there is complete removal of any form of, uh, um, you know, valley coherence or, you know, valley degeneracy. So it's probably, uh, it's just a simple Hikami uh, formula that could be fitted with the, with the you know, with the magnetic transport data. So, yeah, so yeah. we the did not find is, uh, The reason I ask is, I, I thought always you get ratios of the times, not uh, direct times uh, in, in the graphene system because of right. other degree of freedom. Correct, correct. Um, well, I mean, uh, we can talk later. It's fine. We can probably talk Somebody later has... on this. As far as I remember, this one was uh, the intervalley. But tau phi does come out. Um, you know, if, if you look, if you take graphene as um, as a simple two-dimensional system without getting into the the, in, if you remove that graphene part and just fit the Hikami uh, Nagaoka formula, we probably do not need to have worry about the ratio anymore. So I have to check, but uh, yeah. Sure. So in the interest of time, we, uh, we will close the talk here. And certainly it was very Thank excellent you. talk. And if any questions, so we can we can actually take from the chat box later. So we'll move. So Professor Ghosh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move to the next speaker. Uh, so for this session, our next speaker is Professor Mandar Deshmukh. And uh, Professor Mandar Deshmukh has joined the Department of Condensed Metaphysics and Material Science at the at TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai in 2006. And uh, before joining TIFR, he was postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. And uh, he got his PhD from the Cornell University and he was uh, actually, I'm going, uh, so he was undergraduate uh, at IIT Bombay in the engineering physics program. So his research area mainly lies in nanoscale physics and uh, looking at the properties, electron transport, topological properties, electromechanics in nanostructures and several other areas. So his research is, uh, uh, is be, uh, has been recognized Ms. I am just going to point out a few awards which he has received recently is in 2011 BM Birla Physics Prize, 2012 IBM Faculty Award, 2012 Sorgen Fellowship, 2014 12th, he became to us affiliate, 2015 Santi Suru Bhatnagar Prize, 2018 Young Career Award in Nanoscience and Technology by DST. 
And 2019, again, he became the fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences. And again, in 2019, Oxford Instrument Young Nanoscientist India. So list is long and uh, here I'll stop and invite Professor Deshmukh to deliver his lecture for this session. Okay, so, uh, thank you, uh, Abha, for the kind introduction. Um, let me get uh, started on the talk. So I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, and actually a, pro a problem which we have been working on for the last couple of uh, years, which is trying to look at adhesion between Van der Waals uh, heterostructures. And we came across a, a peculiar uh, problem that I was that when you try to put, uh, and anybody who works with 2D materials will uh, know of this problem that uh, when you try to put uh, 2D materials together, then uh, you form bubbles, which I, I will uh, kind of give you, show you images. And what this is a story about, uh, what I'm going to tell you today is a story about the mechanics of heterostructures and what's the consequence of the bubbles on the mechanical properties. Uh, the take home message is that unless the bubbles are of a critical, critical size, uh, they don't affect the degrade the mechanical properties, but beyond a critical size, they will actually uh, degrade the mechanical properties. So that's sort of the take home message for um, all of you. So I, uh, I acknowledge the funding that we get from uh, Department of Atomic Energy and Department of uh, Science and Technology of uh, India. Uh, I don't do uh, well any work. My uh, group uh, stu members and uh, students at postdoc do the work. Uh, the person who has led the work that I'll talk about is Dr. Verma. Um, and uh, these are some of, uh, I guess, uh, the current students uh, working with me. And uh, for some of the experiments that we I will talk about, we use hexagonal uh, boron nitride, which is provided by these uh, to uh, uh, people at uh, NIMS. Um, um, okay, so what do we do? Uh, we look at different aspects of physics uh, in our group, um, uh, you know, starting from quantum transport, uh, uh, looking at properties of uh, Josephson junctions. Uh, and recently in the last five years, we've been focusing a fair bit of energy on looking at properties of uh, high temperature superconductors down to one unit cell limit. We have been also looking at magnetism uh, in uh, uh, fuel air uh, systems. Uh, what I uh, will focus today is mechanics, how mechanics can give us interesting information of 2D materials and uh, the interfaces. And uh, uh, mainstay of our group is uh, kind of looking at quantum transport uh, and looking at devices uh, made using twisted graphene like systems. But um, I will focus today on nanomechanics, uh, which is uh, a very interesting way to probe um, properties of 2D systems. Okay. So, uh, Arindam uh, gave a nice introduction uh, to electronic properties. You know, these systems are uh, 2D materials in general and uh, graphene in particular has uh, exciting electronic properties. But uh, besides their uh, exciting electronic properties, they also have some unusual uh, mechanical and related uh, properties. So one property that I really, really like uh, with, and which will feature in today's talk is that, uh, you know, one atom thick graphene uh, is impermeable uh, in, in the sense that uh, if you make a balloon, uh, you know, just like this uh, experiment that was done um, in Paul McEwen's group, if you make a cavity, uh, a small hole, and you cover it up with uh, graphene, the gas that is trapped inside uh, doesn't escape uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, it takes um, several hours for the gas to escape. And the escape mechanism is actually not through the whole, you know, pristine graphene uh, uh, crystal structure, but it's actually from the in interface uh, between the graphene layer and the substrate. So this is really a very unique one atom thick membrane uh, does not allow uh, helium gas to escape uh, actually um, uh, quite remarkable property. So this property has been uh, kind of leverage for a lot of exciting uh, chemistry and biology experiments. Uh, you know, people have, uh, you know, close to 10 years back, 
uh, image a chemical reaction in real time uh, by uh, wrapping up the reactants in essentially um, a kind of uh, uh, a bag of graphene, which is leak tight, and you can put it inside the TM and image uh, the crystal, uh, the reaction actually taking place, a colloidal chemistry reaction taking inside the DEM, which is uh, very nice. The other property, which is really unusual and interesting, and it was talked about a little bit in the earlier talks today, uh, which is the mechanical properties of graphene, which is that it's mechanically very strong and the Young's modulus, effectively Young's modulus can be very large and its fracture toughness is also pretty good. Um, so altogether, uh, you know, graphene offers something more than uh, just electronic properties. So some of the properties uh, also carry forward to other 2D materials. Um, uh, you know, this impermeability, as long as you have defect free uh, 2D material like HBN or MOS2, they're also fairly impermeable, uh, though not as much as um, graphene. So, uh, uh, so my, our experiments will sort of uh, talk a little bit about uh, these ideas. So uh, what is the motivation for our work? Uh, so we have been uh, studying mechanical properties of uh, one atom thick graphene or a few atom thick uh, graphene, which is looking at vibrational uh, motion of drum, drums. So imagine uh, you make a tabla out of uh, uh, graphene, which is uh, only uh, an atom thick, uh, and the diameter of the tabla is about three to four microns. And you look at the vibrational uh, frequencies uh, of the resonant mode. Uh, so just like in uh, musical instruments, you hear the musical notes. The musical notes are the resonant frequencies. We also look at uh, we rather study the uh, resonant frequencies, but they are actually not in uh, audible range, but they are at high frequencies of uh, something close to 100 megahertz. Uh, what I will show you in a quick first example, which is an older experiment, just to help you get to the uh, experiment uh, or set you up for the experiment that I'll uh, focus on, is that Nanomechanical devices made out of 2D materials are extremely sensitive uh, to external perturbation, so they, they can detect forces, but they can also uh, be a probes of internal state of the system. Okay, so what's happening inside the system uh, can actually be very exquisitely detected uh, by measuring uh, the vibrational frequencies of these uh, uh, nanomechanical devices. What I will focus on, or rather the central message of my talk today is the, you know, what's happening to the adhesion in between uh, two layers, two Van der Waal layers, sitting on top of each other, what's happening to the adhesion property? That's the probing that we're going to do using these kind of nanomechanical um, devices. So the, the way we kind of make these devices in general, uh, we make uh, different kinds of devices. I will show you uh, two kinds of devices. Uh, we basically make a hole which has an electrostatic gate underneath it. So it's a blind hole. Uh, and a gate electrode, and then we put uh, graphene on top, and uh, you can um, uh, have electrical connections to the graphene. And these electrical connections are just made by putting graphene on top of the electrodes. For graphene, this strategy works very well. And now this part of graphene is free hanging, and you can look at the vibrations. Um, okay. So what the way we uh, look at the vibrational modes is that. Uh, you know, in a tabla, uh, there are two things that are happening is your finger sort of plucks or hits the drum and it starts vibrating and your ear detects it. So a typical nanomechanical system also have two components, which is actuation, which is plucking and detection, which is, uh, you know, analogous to listening. So what in this particular schematic, we actuated by applying small voltages to the uh, uh, bottom electrode. And the way it works is that graphene form and this bottom electrode form a kind of a parallel plate capacitor, not an ideal parallel plate capacitor, but a parallel plate ca capacitor nevertheless. So if I now apply a relative voltage between graphene and the bottom gate, uh, the graphene actually gets attracted. There's always an attractive force between two plates of a pa uh, capacitor. So uh, by doing that, I can pull the graphene down. And if I apply an AC and a DC signal, then I can make it vibrate. Uh, so now this AC voltage that we have applied matches the uh, frequency, resonant frequency of the membrane. 
uh, you will see a large response and the detection is effectively measuring the current through the system. Uh, and uh, here I show you example of current later on, I'll show you uh, example of using light, um, but it can detect the motion. Uh, they have different advantages and I'll point it out when I talk about that uh, stuff. So you can actually measure the current as a function of gate voltage and frequency and you see these peaks. So these are basically a large number data set which is visualized using color. So these large peaks are basically uh, indicating vibrational modes um, and the vibrational modes have frequencies of about 50 megahertz, 100 and it continues up. And the main point is that it's actually tunable with gate voltage. So if I add a DC gate voltage, it actually pulls the membrane down and it uh, makes uh, uh, increases the tension and the frequency goes up. Just like a tabla drum, if you tighten it at the edges of the tabla drum, the frequency goes up. It's exactly the same physics happens. Um, and uh, so it's kind of consistent with what our expectation. Uh, there are some unusual and interesting things that happen uh, for example, here where two modes become degenerate and uh, when two modes become degenerate, like at this point, uh, you see a, a kind of a mode crossing uh, and you can think of it in terms of classical physics as well. Uh, and there is a quantum analog of it is that these modes are getting coupled. So this system uh, behaves like two uh, modes which are uh, have some uh, coupling. And now you can actually look at the dynamics of this couple system, but they all reflect the fact that all of these uh, uh, excitations are happening inside the drum. So you can excite it at the sum of the two frequencies of the two modes or difference because they're coupled, uh, they will respond to this uh, sort of um, excitation. So uh, what I show you is a kind of a, a mode one, which is a uh, lower energy mode. And then as I pump it, which is essentially perturb it uh, parametrically, uh, I see that this mode gets modified. And at this point, what's happening is that the mode one and mode two are coupled uh, uh, strongly. And some of the energy at this point is getting transferred into the second vibration mode F2. Um, and uh, without actuating mode two directly, but just by uh, pushing mode one, you can see the response in mode two. Okay, this just reflects the fact that these are uh, extremely uh, low tension um, uh, membranes which can um, uh, allow the modes to couple to each other. So this is a, a, a bit older work, but nevertheless sets up uh, the main idea that these uh, vibrational modes are extremely sensitive and they can be used to detect uh, what I didn't talk about today. They can actually also be used to amplify uh, mechanical uh, signals. So now I'm going to use this idea that uh, graphene NEMS uh, can be used to uh, sense uh, internal state and take it to understand uh, the properties of uh, Van der Waals material. So I show you some uh, photographs to convince you that you know these uh, uh, bubbles are ubiquitous. You see them very routinely if you work with 2D materials. So this is an example of uh, two layers of two. Uh, 2D material put on top of each other. And here you see these splotches sort of red uh, dots uh, and some discolorations. So you might say, oh, you know, it's, uh, what is this? Turns out these are actually bubbles. Uh, and the origin of the formation of the bubbles has many uh, contributions, uh, including uh, the mechanism that if you have any residue or gas at the interface, when you put one material on top, it just basically squeezes all the impurities and puts them inside a bubble. Uh, okay, uh, so between the two uh, interfaces, actually there is very little or no impurity. This is kind of a self-cleaning action. You can see the same image uh, more clearly in a dark field image. Uh, you know, you can see that these are the edges, but you can see these uh, blobs. Uh, I'll show you. Um, uh, other kind of images later. So these are somewhat stochastic. You don't have very good control. Uh, if you have some defects uh, or something, they will uh, accumulate the uh, all the gases and the residues at these bubbles. So people have been studying this for uh, quite some time. Um, people have made uh, uh, detailed studies of these bubbles. So randomly formed. So again, 
these are randomly formed uh, bubbles uh, and people find that the bubble sizes have some scaling relationship the uh, the height of the bubble uh, is has some uh, ratio fixed ratio uh, depending on the material combination whether you're using monolayer graphene and monolayer hbn and this is related to uh, the elastic properties uh, and the adhesion properties of graphene that determine the scaling ratio, the H max. So it's they basically, this is not our work, but this is this paper. They basically look at you know something like order of 100 bubbles. So it, this scaling has been well established. You can also image these bubbles using AFM, and uh, you know, there are also proposals to use these as some uh lenses uh, for uh, some optics kind of experiments so they are a little bit of an annoyance for people who do uh, electrical measurements like uh, arindam uh, and uh, for experiments that we uh, do also we don't like bubbles because for electronic properties they are uh, a bit of a hit, uh, annoyance a nuisance that they will degrade the electronic properties uh, to some extent so, uh, but they also uh, are there uh, quite often. So one needs to understand what's happening to the mechanical properties because of the presence of these um, bubbles. And that's sort of what I will talk about. So as I said, the geometry of the bubbles, the shape and the scaling relation, the maximum height at the middle of the bubble and the radius of the bubble determines, uh, you can extract out some very really useful information. So our experiments that I will talk about will go something like this. This is a schematic. We will make drums, not just of monolayer graphene. So purple is graphene. Uh, so we will make whole uh, put graphene and then cover it up with boron nitride uh, on top. Okay. So we make these kind of devices are basically the basic uh, ingredient of uh, heterostructure, which is heterostructure is essentially multiple layers of uh, graphene, uh, HBN, or any other 2D material that you st stack. Uh, and uh, we will study the mechanical vibrations of this uh, kind of composite object, which I will call bimorph, uh, you know, two layers. And the first variety is where there are no bubbles that we can image using SEM, then, uh, uh, another variety that I will show you experimental results, there are small bubbles which are, uh, um, you know, uh, there. Uh, and then a, a, a kind of an extreme example is there is a large bubble uh, of about something like 700 nanometers. And uh, we will look at how this mechanical uh, property of the system uh, evolves because of bubble configuration. And that will allow us to extract some useful um, information or a useful message for um, um, mechanical properties of structures like laminates and what consequence bubbles have on them. So the experimental geometry that we will use now is somewhat analogous to this, uh, is that we will have a drum made, we have a bottom gate, but we will actually use an optical technique to detect the uh, motion, which is basically interferometric, the laser goes down and comes up and when the membrane is vibrating with a large amplitude, it will uh, modulate the intensity of the reflected light at the same frequency as uh, the vibration and you can actually detect it uh, to get information about the vibration. So uh, listening to the tabla is happening here, not really by electrical signal, by, but by optical signal. The advantage of this is that you can actually move the laser beam around and map the vibrational mode. Uh, how the drum is moving, what is the mode shape uh, can be uh, actually imaged. And this will be important for our experiment. Electrical experiments have the, uh, the technique that I showed you earlier, have the advantage that you don't need optics, which reduces one complication. Uh, so you can do it in uh, kind of uh, unusual uh, triostats. Uh, here you need an optical axis. Okay, so there are advantages. Uh, optical axis allows you to image the modes and actually measure the vibration quantitatively, whereas uh, electrical signal uh, to extract the exact amp amplitude is a little bit more tricky. So when we do these experiments, what we find is that you have, uh, you know, for this kind of device, we have vibrational modes, multiple vibrational modes, and they all, bo both of these modes in this window uh, will increase it as a function of gate voltage, which is again indicating that as you increase the gate voltage, which is uh, essentially pulls on the graphene. So remember graphene is below, which is critical. Uh, HBN is an insulator, so it actually doesn't respond to electrical uh, uh, 
uh, attraction, uh, but graphene, but graphene is adhering to HBN. So when you pull graphene, the HBN uh, will go with it uh, as long as the adhesion energy uh, is good. Okay. Now, if I start looking at uh, kind of these structures which have few uh, bubbles, uh, you see, you start seeing some indication of a new kind of uh, physics that uh, the variation in the frequency as a function of uh, pulling the graphene membrane down, you see this kind of uh, sort of plateau like response in one of the modes. This is suggesting that uh, uh, you know there could be some uh, interlayer movement between the uh, two um, layers. Yeah, the response in the third case is extremely dramatic. If you have a large drum, uh, what you see is uh, that uh, that the frequency doesn't behave uh, like this. Uh, in fact, uh, it has an asymmetric response in gate voltage, and we, I'll talk more about that. So if this is how, if I change the gate voltage, plus gate voltage and minus gate voltage are same up to some regime. After that, they're actually uh, not. So there's something interesting happening. Uh, but primarily, one main feature is that the frequency, instead of increasing, drops very rapidly. Uh, this is unusual and in interesting, and it will uh, allow us to understand what's going on. So I... I told you that the drum with no bubbles and some bubbles, small bubbles, actually something close to seven, uh, 70 nanometers or so is the size of the bubbles on the second drum. They are uh, similar. Whereas uh, the third uh, kind of devices with large uh, bubbles have uh, a kind of uh, unusual response, which is uh, jumpy. And it's actually hysteretic. So you can sweep the frequency back and forth many, many times for days, months even. Uh, you will see this hysteretic uh, response uh, of uh, the system which has a large bubble. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we know that uh, this kind of uh, stochastic switching events uh, are, you know, uh, they also re uh, reflect some dissipation uh, within the interface. And you can see that there is a histogram that you can, uh, they don't precisely occur at the same value, but many, many attempts, it's spread, it has a finite spread at a given temperature. So this is uh, indicate, indicating some uh, layer-wise uh, adhesion uh, physics coming in, uh, that there is some stochasticity. So to one a powerful way to understand what's going to the interlayer is to actually image this using the laser by moving it around uh, to map the modes. And that's exactly what we do. So we image the modes in these drums, which are no bubbles, and we see bubble uh, kind of mode shape. Uh, this is vibrational mode shape it doesn't change much with gate voltage. Uh, okay, there is small variation, but not, not, nothing substantial uh, for both of these uh, kinds of, but uh, something dramatic happens for the um, drums which have large bubble uh, is that uh, around the bub bubble at large gate voltages, which is around this region, we see that the mode shape amplitude is suddenly very large. So this color indicates actually amplitude. So what we know is that now, because of these experiments put together, something is happening with the interfacial layer and the fact that the, uh, there are more um, um, sort of uh, amplitude near the bubble, we know uh, that uh, some interlayer motion is starting to happen. That's sort of the picture from the experiment. So the summar summary of the experimental observation thus far is this, that uh, we see hysteretic response uh, and the frequency response is unusual. And uh, because of uh, graphene being pulled down, uh, HBN also gets uh, pulled down, but to some extent, uh, if the adhesion between graphene and uh, HBN is not very good, then uh, you know that pulling action will not happen. And that's uh, very important for understanding our experiment. So when we try to understand mechanics, uh, uh, you know, uh, we often, uh, these are some things you can solve uh, using finite element uh, calculations. Um, so what we do is we try to understand the mechanics using uh, such a geometry where you have layers, some adhesion, which is kind of a, a distributed spring constant, which holds these two uh, layers together. And uh, we, when you try to, understand the consequence of a bubble there, uh, what we see is that the, if the bubble is frozen, it doesn't move in geometry, then the frequency response should be actually identical to uh, uh, what with no bubble. 
and that's sort of consistent with uh, uh, with the two other kind of co bubble configurations that we studied. So something is missing in our understanding, uh, and the ingredient uh, that is missing is that uh, if the physics of fracture uh, happening at the interface of uh, van der Waals, so you have some van der Waals energy between them, and you are pulling on, uh, on graphene with a gate voltage then at the interface at the bubble what happens is there's a amplification of the uh, uh, sort of the stress um, and uh, that you know uh, if you know fracture mechanics uh, well which I, I kind of uh, read up and learned because it's not an area that I work in uh, at these points uh, there is a, a excess stress which actually can um, Sort of, sort of cause a movement at the interface, cause a fracture. So what's happening is that the bubbles, when they exceed a critical dimension, uh, they actually cannot continue holding the HBN uh, above, but you basically get a, a, a unzipping action that's happening, uh, okay? So if you allow for the bubbles uh, to grow in dimension, uh, the frequency uh, of the nanomechanical resonator can actually decrease rapidly, just like in our experimental data by something like 10 to uh, 15 megahertz. Uh, this is if you don't allow the bubble to grow, uh, this is with bubbles allowed to uh, grow. So uh, this is now capturing the physics that we experimentally see. So if, when you have a large bubble, there's great stress at the bubble boundary and you can uh, start uh, pulling the two layers apart. And that reflects uh, the frequency response. Uh, and if there is any interlayer uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, uh, slipping or sticking, it, you will see these abrupt jumps that we also experimentally see. So now the complete picture that we can uh, say is that when I apply, so if bubbles, if are very, very small, they will not uh, allow the, um, the growth because the stress at the boundary uh, is not large enough for uh, the bubbles to grow, but beyond a certain length scale, the bubbles will grow. When they grow, they will change the frequency response in a peculiar way. And eventually the two layers, graphene and HBN will completely peel off uh, and you'll basically get two membranes, okay? Uh, and uh, this is can be thought of or understood within sort of the uh, fracture picture uh, uh, of Griffith's theory, uh, uh, which uh, allows us to understand this in terms of uh, critical stress or a critical length scale. Once the bubble is larger than that, uh, the, uh, the fracture will take place. So uh, how do we see that this is happening? If I look at the experimental data, I showed you an experimental data till this region. So after we saw, did this uh, finite element simulation, we went back and did experiments to larger frequency ranges. And what we find is that uh, that at this region where we expect the, the two layers to be completely separated, uh, once the frequency drops, they will, the two layers will completely separate. We see a, vibra a vibrational mode uh, emerge, which doesn't exist here. Uh, okay, so this is the region, and this is the region where the two layers are uh, separated, and this is where we see the uh, additional modes. So that's basically like you have two membranes both are independent and they can have their vibrational uh, existence independent of each other. They're maybe coupled weakly a little bit, but they have independent modes. Whereas earlier uh, in this window, they were uh, all exist, both the layers were existing as a composite object. Okay, so, this, so these experiments uh, kind of uh, attest to the finite element simulation based picture that we have developed that, um, uh, that indeed uh, after some, uh, point, there is a delamination, peeling off of the layers, um, okay? So what's the main summary of my implication of my talk? Uh, it's that uh, uh, one, I kind of showed you uh, examples that the 2D nanomechanical devices made using can tell us something about the uh, 2D material itself. Uh, going specifically to the uh, interlayer uh, sort of, uh, additive properties um, of uh, uh, 2D materials, bubbles, uh, you know, as long as they are uh, smaller than a critical length scale, um, uh, 
uh, they uh, don't degrade the uh, interfacial adhesions um, adhesion but beyond that they will lead to fracture and eventually delamination so our work has implication for you know kind of making laminates using 2d materials which is a very active area of uh, interest as well uh, going further uh, these kind of studies uh, can also allow um, studies of friction which is poorly understood uh, at nanoscale uh, and in a dynamic way uh, because we are actuating it and the membrane is vibrating so we are not looking at static frictional properties but dynamics um, so dynamics has consequence of friction and ideas of friction fracture and delamination they're all uh, kind of connected so uh, these kind of experiments uh, using nanomechanical devices can shed some light uh, that's all I wanted to talk. Uh, I'll stop here and take any questions. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Interesting talk on uh, music of graphene. So, yeah. so uh, some questions I can see here on chat box. Um, so, should I start reading or uh, let's see? I think one question is about the what kind of interaction between the boron nitrate and graphene. So. Uh, the interaction is van der Waals. So it's chemical uh, specific. Uh, you know, this whole field is that uh, works on this idea, even the peeling and making, you know, putting a superconductor next to a ferromagnet or, uh, you know, a uh, graphene next to a uh, semiconductor. Um, all this works that these uh, layers have some adhesive interaction. And that is not a blanket same number. It's a function of the material two materials that you use, uh, but uh, it's, it is related to ideas of screening, um, uh, but it's there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not one number which for every possible uh, Van der Waals, uh, you know, kind of interface. Okay. Uh, Next question is bubbles were created intentionally. Yep. So good question. So what we do is in this, uh, we can make lots and lots of heterostructures. Then we found the bubble configuration and then we actually made that device based on the bubble configuration. Okay, so uh, just like in the image that I showed you, I saw bubbles, then I take it and I place it on the drum uh, where the bubbles are. That's what we did. There is uh, no, um, at least we are not aware of any uh, very deterministic method of uh, creating bubbles, or rather we made lots of heterostructures, found the bubbles configuration that we would like to study and made a nanomechanical device out of it. So uh, you will get bubbles, uh, lots of bubbles in CVD grown heterostructures as well. Um, so it, it, you can't escape them, you can minimize them to some extent. I think that answers at least one of the questions. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was wondering that if the cavity you're making and, and if there is any correlation with the size of the cavity and the, and the, the size of the bubble in the frequencies you are, you are talking about. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the resonant frequencies are a function of, uh, are a bit, a bit more complex, but uh, just to uh, sort of use our intuitive sense that, you know, a big tabla or a big drum that we know macroscopic, it has frequency in you know order of kilohertz. Uh, uh, whereas a small thing, which is three micron uh, diameter has a frequency in hundred megahertz uh, kind of range. So uh, the resonant frequency is a function of geometry and also the tension that is inside, but largely uh, geometry dictates um, the rough band in which the resonant frequency will be. Um, uh, so certainly, uh, you know, same kind of things could be done in, uh, if you can make drums, which are, you know, let's say, my, uh, you know, tens of milli, uh, micrometer or hundreds of micrometer, you'll still see uh, resonant modes, uh, but they will be, uh, uh, they will be, um, yeah. uh, you know, the, all the other physics will be there, same physics, but the resonant frequencies will be smaller. Does that answer your question? Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess in the interest of time again, uh, I'll, we'll, we just, we, questions are coming up. So uh, okay. maybe you may want to answer uh, separately and uh, we'll uh, just take a halt here for the next speaker. Yeah, of course. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting talk. So um, our 
Next speaker of the session is uh, Dr. Andreas Castellanos Gomez. Uh, so, uh, Professor Castellanos Gomez is a tenured scientist in the Spanish National Research Council. And uh, his research is mainly focused on novel 2D materials and studies their mechanical, electrical, and optical properties. And, uh, and uh, with a special interest of, he's looking at the application sites of nanomechanical and optoelectronic devices. And he has authored one 40 articles in international journals. And he has also written six book chapters. And he was awarded an, an ERC starting grant in 2017 and appointed as a, a fellow of the International Association of Advanced Material, IAAM, in 2020. It's a very recent. And has been included in the Emerging Leaders 2020 special issue of the Journal of Physics Materials and uh, included in the high cited researchers 2018, 2019, and 2020. So uh, yeah, so in the list of uh, evaluate WS and selected as one of the 2018 emerging investigators by chemical society reviews and selected as one of the top 10 Spanish talents of 2017 by the MIT technology reviews. And he also been recognized with the young Researchers Award Experimental Physics of the Royal Physics Society of Spain in 2016. So excellent. So I, 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 I would like to invite uh, Professor Gomez for, for his talk in the session. Okay. Thank you for the for the kind introduction and, and also thank you for the invitation. So it's a pleasure to be to be here sharing my, my research with you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So here is quite early in the morning. So I'm going to talk about uh, using the backlink metrology method. It's a method I will explain later on along the talk in order to characterize the mechanical properties of two dimensional materials. Sorry, one second, I will put my pointer. So I, I work in the Material Science Institute of Madrid that is part of the Spanish National Research Council. There is a network of research institutes uh, focus on different topics. So we are located in Madrid and we are focused on material science. And within, within this institute, I part, I'm part of the 2D Foundry Research Group. That we are a cluster of yeah, principal investigators that we have common interest in two-dimensional materials, but we are interested in alternative and complementary approaches. For example, we have the lab of Mar García Hernández, this is uh, the head of the magnetism mag magnetotransport part of the of the group. We also have our colleague uh, Carmen Munuera. This is the head of the local probe microscopy lab, and I am in charge of this uh, two dimensional materials and devices part of the lab. Uh, our group has recently uh, grown a lot, actually. So we have uh, plenty of students, and we recently uh, have one one postdoc and a project manager. And and thank to these people, actually. So we managed to build up all our labs in in like the last three years that we have been like working to set up our labs in the in the research council so so these are the heroes of, the, of all the stories okay so let, let's go to the topic so regarding the mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials so one of the things that we uh, don't don't usually motivate a lot is that these materials they are very interesting from the mechanical point of view because they are very different than three-dimensional materials in terms of like this structure, okay? So these two-dimensional materials or Van der Waals materials, they don't have dangling bonds on the surface. So they are dangling bond free, all these surfaces here. So they are fully passivated, okay? So that means that they, whenever you start applying a mechanical deformation, right? So to the lattice, you don't have the typical problem that you will have in a three-dimensional material of let's say nucleation of defects on the surface, creation of a crack and propagation of the crack. So basically these materials are very, very sturdy, very resilient against mechanical deformations. So that makes these materials being a future candidate for flexible electronics applications where you want to combine all the good properties from the, let's say electrical good properties of two-dimensional materials with this resilience of uh, mechanical properties, okay? Now the problem is, that the, um, while one can characterize the electrical properties and optical properties of two-dimensional materials using 
kind of a standard thin film characterization techniques that you have in every lab. When you go to the mechanical properties, as we have seen in, in Mandar Desmook's talks uh, previously, everything is more difficult because you cannot just simply use these mechanical tools that you use, these, these experimental setups that you use to measure mechanical properties of materials and just use these machines in order to test the mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials. So you need to develop exquisite and dedicated techniques and tools in order to measure the mechanical properties and to determine mechanical properties like young modulus, for example, that is one of the most uh, um, extended fears of merit for, for mechanical materials. So, so far, there are many approaches in order to characterize these mechanical properties and extract, for example, your modulus, tension, and other mechanical parameters like uh, indenting with, an, with a tip of an AFM. Um, you can use a, kind of like a microscopic version of this Brillouin scattering. You can in, put these materials into an SEM and doing a micro tensile test. Uh, using these kind of uh, pressurized blisters, uh, for example, from McEwen's and, and Scotch Band's groups. Um, and you can use these mechanical resonators similar to, to previous talk from, from Mandar uh, in order to measure this young modulus by modeling how these drums, they move as a function of, of excitation, right? So you can model uh, the dynamics of these drums and extract the fears of merit like, like tension and young modulus. The common, the common issue or challenge of all these techniques is that you're required to fabricate freely suspended membranes with these two-dimensional materials. So uh, you need some kind of like a, um, develop and, and, and find microfabrication techniques and tools in order to fabricate these freely suspended layers that you, you don't have everywhere, right? So some, some groups, they're really good on synthesizing two-dimensional materials, but they don't have the facilities in order to fabricate these freely suspended drums, okay? And also you typically use some kind of like complex measurement setup in order to measure or indentation or mechanical deformation or the real run scattering, et cetera. So measuring mechanical properties is surprisingly more challenging than measuring electrical and optical properties. And that's why we were wondering if we could find an easy way to measure the mechanical properties of these freely suspended layers, sorry, these, these two-dimensional material layers without the need of making freely suspended, without the need of using an AFM, et cetera, et cetera. And we came up with the idea of using the backlink method. The backlink metrology method has been used already in the literature for quite a while, for example, with metallic thin films, and also has been very popular in, in thin films of polymer. And basically the technique is, uh, depicted, is depicted here. So you start with, um, with an elastomer substrate, typically polydimethylsiloxane, that is pre-strained, okay? So has been pre-strained. And then you deposit your thin film you want to study on top of this pre-stretched substrate. Then when you release the strain, there is a competition between the addition forces between the thin film and this elastomeric substrate and the buckling, um, so basically, when you compress this uh, elastic, this elastic drum, this elastic uh, film, so it will, it will, it will try to delaminate and buckle, and then the competition between this buckle delamination and these adhesion forces creates this wavy pattern here, with a certain wavelength. Okay, this is an, an optical image of a polymer, sub, uh, polymer thin film that has been subjected to this process, and you see this wavy pattern. Now, one interesting part is this, this wavelength of this wavy pattern is proportional, is linearly proportional to the thickness of this thin film that you have developed, that, that you have deposit on top. And actually, so you can see it better here, and you can, you can correlate this, uh, this uh, wavelength and thickness with a coefficient that has information about the young modulus of the film. Okay, so basically it's linearly proportional with this coefficient that has information about the Poisson ratio of the substrate and, and the film and the young modulus of the substrate and the film. So you can extract the young modulus information of your film by making several of these samples with different thicknesses and getting this linear relationship here. So 
we were really excited. So we said, okay, so why not to use it for two-dimensional materials? And we were checking the literature. So we were aware of some other previous papers in where they were using this for graphene oxide, for some kind of clays, you know, so, so has been used for two-dimensional materials, but has been heavily overlooked by the community. Like a lot of people in the community, they don't, they don't even know about this method to, to characterize mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials. So we thought like maybe one of the reasons why is because when you introduce one of one method that is not common for the community, you, you have to um, you have to benchmark it with other techniques that they they really work. So that's what we wanted to do. So we wanted to um, revisit this method in order to make, measure the mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials and actually compare it with other methods that are better established or well-established by the community. You know? So I'm going to explain how we do this, uh, this uh, uh, buckling metrology method for two-dimensional materials. So we start with a, with a PDMS substrate. Uh, we bend it in order to apply a tension on, the, on this surface. Okay, then we transfer our two-dimensional material by mechanical exfoliation. And then when we release the, the strain, get this wavy pattern I was talking about. So basically here you can see a sequence of optical images in where you see how when we release little by little the strain, this wavy pattern starts to develop. So this is a multi-layer of molybdenum disulfide. So it's like around like seven layers thick. And you can see how this wavy pattern starts developing. Okay, so this is an optical image of a, of a, a typical mechanical exfoliated flake with different number of layers. And you see this wavy pattern. And the first thing that you, you realize is that the, the, the period of this pattern indeed depends on the thickness. You know? So for the single layer, the period is so, so small that you cannot even see with an optical microscope. For the five layers, you can already see this pattern here, seven layers, eight layers, and you can see how the thicker it is, the, the longer this wavelength becomes. So you can analyze this quantitatively by, for example, doing a Fourier transform. And then you can start with 10 layers, then seven layers, then three layers, and you see how the frequency of this uh, Fourier transfer becomes larger and larger. So you can extract, you can use this Fourier transform to quantitatively extract the wavelength as a function of the thickness. Okay, so we have done this for many flakes for molybdenum disulfide. With an optical microscope, we can measure up to three layers of molybdenum disulfide. If we want to measure like thinner layers, then we need to use an atomic force microscope in order to resolve this, uh, this wavelength. Okay, but it's something that we can do. And we see that indeed, we get a rather linear trend between the wavelength and the thickness as we expected from the formula. Remember that this formula correlates this wavelength with thickness with this parameter here that takes into account the young modulus of the film. So we have previously, we have previously to measure quantitatively, very characterized very well, the young modulus of the substrate as well. So, but the substrate is a microscopic material. One can easily measure the young modulus of something that is microscopic. Okay, so basically we got this slope and from this slope, we can extract already the young modulus. And in our work, we got this value around 250 gigapascals for the for this uh, young modulus of molybdenum disulfide with this uh, uncertainty around okay this is what we get from our experimental uh, approach with this buckley metrology method and the first thing that we did is as as i said so we had to benchmark the results that we get with this kind of like new technique that the community is not used to with some other techniques that they are more established by the community, like nano-indentation, the use of nano-resonators, the blister test, uh, this brillant scattering, or even bimodal AFM. And we get a, a quite good agreement between all the experimental data set, actually. So it was, it was quite refreshing. So the only big difference here is the brillant scattering, but these measurements have been done on polycrystalline material. So not single crystalline, not CVD, not exfoliated, but something with a very small grain size. Okay, so that might explain this such a low values for the young modulus. For the other techniques, we get a quite, quite good uh, agreement, actually, like, um, I mean, surprisingly good, I would say, taking into account that the technique for, for in order to extract these young modulus only requires 
this elastomeric substrate, not freely suspended, and an optical microscope in order to measure from the optical images the wavelength. We don't require anything else. So this method is, is uh, universal. So we have tried uh, for different dichalcogonides in order to, to actually prove that indeed you get a good uh, relationship between the wavelength and the thickness. Of course, this, this in order to extract a good value of the young modulus, the, the larger data set that you get, the best, because it's kind of like a statistical measurement. So you need as many flakes studied as possible. Okay, but, uh, but this already gives you an idea that indeed this is universal, so can be uh, used for other materials. And after that, uh, we decided actually to use this technique to characterize mechanical properties of materials that nobody studied so far. Okay, so because this, uh, you know, once the, you know that the technique works, then it's compatible with the other techniques. So why not to use it to extract information from new materials that nobody has studied? And then we we, we have a, a, a we had this student in Huazhou that is now uh, becoming a professor in China. And, and he had some excellent indium selenide crystals. So we, we decided to try to measure the young moduli of uh, indium selenide. And we did the same approach. And you can see here how for seven layers of indium selenide, the optical microscope is already not good enough in order to uh, extract the quantitative wavelength. So we need to use AFM, as you can see here, all this wavy pattern. Okay, and we repeat the same process. So we measure for different materials with different thicknesses. We measure the wave, uh, the wavelength, and then we plot it all together. Wavelength versus flake height. And you can see how indeed you get a good linear trend between, between these. So, so we can in, indeed use this backlink metrology in order to extract the young modulus. So for this indium selenide, one of the things that, that we found is that the, this young modulus is very low if you compare with many other Van der Waals materials in the in the literature. So it's, it's basically like very, I mean, very low. The only materials that they are similar are, are gallium telluride and, and the bismuth based uh, uh, telluride and selenide, right? So the other materials, they are much, much higher. So one of the advantages of having a low young modulus material is that if you're interested in strain engineering, Okay, so if you want to modify the, the optical and electrical properties of the material by applying a mechanical deformation, okay, so you want actually a material with the young modulus as low as possible because the strain transfer is going to be larger for that material. In, in this uh, picture here, in this, in this plot here, we see the strain transfer as a function of the substrate young modulus for different materials, graphene, indium selenide, and molybdenum disulfide. And you can see how for graphene, graphene is so stiff that you need to use substrates with very large young modulus in order to get a decent strain transfer. While for indium selenide, substrate with much smaller, much, much lower young modulus can efficiently transfer the strain. So this is very interesting, okay? Now, we were wondering, so if this technique could have another advantage when compared with other techniques uh, used to measure mechanical properties. And then basically we just took a, a look to the literature on, on these thin polymeric films. Okay, so and then what we found out is that the people working with organic semiconductors have been used this backlink metrology to measure the mechanical properties of anisotropic materials. In this case here, Reyes Martinez, they were using this backlink metrology to measure the anisotropy in the young modulus of rubberine single crystals. Okay, so we said, okay, so we can we can use this uh, this approach then to study another uh, two dimensional material that is anisotropic, and we we started using black phosphorus. So we applied this same technique. So we stretch the material, the the, the polymer substrate. We place our our black phosphorus flake, and then we release the strain, and then we get these ripples. The first thing that we notice is that, okay, so we can measure uh, the orientation of the crystal by using transmittance. And in this case here, the zigzag direction of the black phosphorus is along this axis, and the armature is along this axis. And then we find out that in most of the flakes, the ripple direction is almost parallel to the zigzag. 
Okay, so you can see a polar histogram here, and there is a cluster of points here, right? So there is no basically no data of uh, wrinkles along along the armchair direction. Okay, so this was already quite surprising to start with, and then we we had to find out a way to actually measure these wrinkles along the armchair. So we basically instead of relying on this you know bending transfer releasing, so then what we did it was using two probes in order to actually force this compression. And then we could rotate the sample and then do the, this compression along a different direction. So these are what you see here, these pictures of uh, the ripples on black phosphorus when we apply the compression along the armchair or when we apply the compression along the zigzag direction. And you can see how the period of the wavelength of, of, this, of this, um, this wavy pattern strongly depends on the direction. So here for the armchair, we get four periods. And for the zigzag, we get only three periods. Okay, so we get indeed a huge anisotropy in the, in the wavelength. So we have done this for five different flakes and we see that there is indeed a, a quite large anisotropy. So this is interesting. We can extract uh, from, from, from these measurements, the young modulus of the black phosphorus along different directions. And, and these are the results. So these uh, horizontal lines are our, our results. Then we have these, uh, these dots here are the, the theory and the, the squares here are the experimental data sets that we found in the literature. And interestingly, so for the, for the armchair, everything pretty much agrees, okay? And then um, especially for the experimental data sets. So we find out that there, is a, there are these two points here that they basically claim that it's almost not anisotropic, if you take a look. So basically the anisotropy of these two experimental data sets is very small. So we were actually puzzled. So how? So one thing is that you have a mismatch in the young modulus, depending on the technique, but why one technique or one experimental you know, experiment will provide a lower anisotropy? Then we were thinking that maybe this is related to the fact that black phosphorus is degrading on time. So if your characterization technique takes too long or you require to use some kind of like fabrication steps that they take some time. So maybe the black phosphorus has been degrading a little bit along the fabrication or along the measurement. And, and we were wondering if that could affect actually this anisotropy. So we, we basically fabricated some black phosphorus samples and we did this uh, characterization as a function of time. So, and then we find out that the same flake, when you apply this, uh, this strain along different directions, you know, to make this wavy pattern. So when the flake is pristine, you see this anisotropy, armchair, more cycles than zigzag. Okay, so zigzag has lower period. But then when you keep the sample in air, like for five days and you measure again. So you see that basically there is no anisotropy at all. Okay, so here you see the statistics of, of uh, six different samples and, and we basically plot here the ratio between the zigzag and armchair wavelengths. And you see that for the pristine samples, this anisotropy is, is decisively larger than one. So it's an isotropic material, but for samples that has been stored in air like for one to five days, so then the anisotropy tends to go to one. Okay, so, so basically the, the anisotropy is being reduced and that will explain why these data sets here, they have a lower anisotropy than expected because most likely these, these data sets here, they require uh, the fabrication of these freely suspended RAMs and, and AFM indentation, which it's more time consuming, let's say, until you find the right spot, you put the place, you put the tip in place, you do the the the, the force versus set uh, the formation traces and so on. So it's more time consuming than this Buckley metrology that is exfoliating and measuring with an optical microscope. So it's a matter of literally five minutes to characterize the sample. So I, I will jump to the conclusions already. So I hope that I, uh, motivate you to, to use this Buckley metrology method because it's, it's very fast. And in the, from the technique point of view, it's so simple that everybody can implement it in their labs. I mean, so even if you're not, uh, you know, if you don't have the facilities around 
to fabricate fully suspended materials, or if you don't have an AFM, or if you don't have an, an interferometer, you know, to measure mechanical resonators, doesn't matter. So you can measure mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials. So we tested, we benchmark this technique with molybdenum disulfide, and we found good agreement with all the well-established techniques in the community. And um, because of this, uh, you know, like, uh, like uh, because of this simplicity, so I, I well, I, I already stress this. I mean, because of the simplicity of the method, I, I encourage all of you that you don't have, let's say, the facilities to measure mechanical properties of two-dimensional materials to implement this kind of technique in, in your own labs. Okay, so we, in, in our paper, uh, in the Nestor Iginis paper, we provided all the technical details to reproduce the technique. And anyway, so if, if you have any doubt how to implement it, so you can contact us. And finally, I have to acknowledge the, the funding sources, the, the Spanish Agency of Science and the Ministry of Science, the, my, my, uh, my uh, employee, my employer, sorry, the SIC, the European Research Council for the grant, and also the Distinguished Scientist Fellowship Program from, from King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Andres. Um, we have uh, we have a few questions on uh, on the chat. Okay, I'm opening so the chat. Is, yeah, this is about how to control the force to stretch the the substrate. If so. Oh yeah. So yeah. I'm going to jump to to this GIF file here. So one second. This one here. So actually, that is one of the of the coolest things about this technique. It it doesn't depend on how much you strain the the initial substrate in a very wide range. Okay, so as long as you apply enough pre-strain, you will see these ripples. Okay, and if you apply more pre-strain, then these ripples they will they will become higher. But the wavelength, it doesn't depend on the amount of pre-strain that you apply. Now, this is not completely true. If you apply way too much pre-strain, what will happen is that these ripples, these periodic ripples will evolve towards some kind of like delaminated, big wrinkle, then flat, then delaminated, flat, delaminated, flat. So basically, as long as you don't delaminate the flake from the substrate, the, the, you will get these uh, periodic ripples and the period doesn't depend on the initial pre-strain. The height depends on the initial pre-strain. So maybe you can see in this GIF file here how basically we are releasing the tension, right? And the period doesn't change. What it changes is the contrast because it's changing the height of the ripples. But the period of the ripples doesn't change all along this, you know, all this process. Okay, so it's, it's a quite robust process. Yeah, and the second question is on the effect of crack. So is it helping or? So, so I, I, don't, I don't know if I understand the question. So wait a second. Um... It, says, it says if possible crack will affect the film while doing the technique. If it's possible crack will affect I guess the question. Okay. Should yeah. Be, uh, yeah. 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 So, so usually, so if if the film cracks during the release of the strain, then you're not going to measure the the right young modulus value. So you need to apply uh, initial pre strains that they are compatible with your material. So, like in the case of two dimensional materials, they can easily survive to zero point five percent compression or something like that. Okay. Or one percent compression, no problem. But if, if the material cracks during the, the process, then you will measure um, um, uh, a lower young modulus value than what you will expect. But that happens with any characterization technique. If you have some, some I mean, if you're measuring with a macroscopic, you know, like a tensile test and your sample has some kind of cracks, then, then you will measure a lower young modulus than what you will expect. Yeah. So uh, one question is, uh, 
Ms. what about the interfaces from the substrate to these 2D materials since interfaces are play a significant role? So is it a like generalized procedure or means how do you optimize the interfaces So the substrate? Well, so the substrate, this elastomeric substrate has to have a large addition forces with the flake that you put on top. Okay, so that's why we typically use this polydimethyl siloxane because it's viscoelastic. So it means that the long time scales, it kind of flows and then it gets an intimate contact with the flakes. Okay, but in principle, any elastomeric substrate will work. Okay, but the thing is, if the, this addition force is not large enough, then you might have this delamination problem uh, very soon, right? So then you don't have a wide range of initial pre-strains in where you get these ripples, okay? So, but, but the, so that, I mean, PDMS has been used already like for this thin film community for the organic thin films and, and it works really well. So that's why we started using it. So we use also PDMS for these deterministic transfer methods and, and it works nicely for these two dimensional materials. Okay, great. So, uh... I, I, I must thank you so much for this interesting talk. And, uh, and it's really wonderful to know about this technique. And, and I, I think I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, applications are possible if we can really control at a smaller scale. Hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andres. Thank you. Have a nice one. Yeah. So we move to the next talk. Uh, this is a contributory talk by Ms. Soumya Ranjan Shah from IIT Kanpur. Hello, ma'am. Hi. I, uh, I don't see you. Uh, ma'am, actually, we have a bandwidth issue at our end, uh, but okay. I will stay. Sure, sure. Uh, can I share my screen, ma'am? Yes, please. Thank you. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Uh, not your PowerPoint, but your screen is visible. Yes. It's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Please put on the uh, this presentation mode. Is yes. it visible now? Yes. Yes. Perfectly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Please start. Okay. Thank you, Professor. So, um, myself, Soumya Ranjan Chha, uh, working under the joint supervision of Dr. Krishanu Biswas and Dr. Nilesh P. Gurao from Department of Material Science and Engineering, IIT Kanpur. Today, I will be delivering a talk on the topic, an alternative modeling approach to predict hall pit strengthening in complex concentrated alloys. Now, complex concentrated alloys, in short, referred to as CCAs are somewhat different from conventional alloys in terms of principle. Conventional alloys mostly have one or sometimes two major alloying elements. While uh, in case of high entropy alloys, five or more principal elements are present, making it different from traditional alloys with single base element, such as uh, steels, aluminum alloys, inconel, etc. The broad canopy of uh, complex concentrated alloys uh, it includes not just high entropy alloys with five or more major elements, but also includes medium entropy alloys with three or more major elements. And these alloys are deemed as futuristic materials the with applications. Is, uh, Hello? Uh, yeah. Hello? I would request I... Every, everyone to be on mute. Yeah, please go on, Somya. Okay, so these alloys are basically deemed as futuristic materials uh, in and the applications of uh, these materials ranges uh, from the aerospace and aviation industry and as nuclear vessel materials, as bearing materials, and the list goes on and on. So this investigation, which I'm presenting here, was carried out subsequent to a former study by our research group, wherein we established from the evolutionary studies on binary, ternary, quaternary, and quinary alloys, that the ternary alloy of iron, manganese, and nickel showed the best combination of mechanical properties and profuse twinning with just a simple single phase microstructure. So having briefed with the introduction, uh, I have organized my presentation under the following uh, subheadings. 
starting with uh, the thermodynamic calculations, the preliminary and mechanical characterization, moving towards uh, green size distributions, and finally the constitutive model and its validation. So moving on, as it is evident from the ternary phase diagram of iron, manganese, and nickel, the equiatomic composition exhibits single phase FCC behavior. Also, using thermodynamic calculations by CalFAD, property diagram was generated, which also confirms occurrence of single phase in this alloy from the temperature range of 773 Kelvin to 1273 Kelvin. And this temperature range is identified for the recrystallization depending on its melting temperature. And uh, it also should be noted here that the melting temperature was also estimated using CalFAD technique. So a preliminary micro hardness characterization also confirmed that recovery and recrystallization in this alloy indeed occurs in the mentioned range of uh, temperature, therefore uh, confirming the thermodynamic analysis which was presented earlier. So uh, hereafter, several isothermal and isochronal recrystallization annealing treatments were performed on the 90% cold road specimens of this alloy. And the occurrence of single phase FCC was confirmed experimentally using X-ray diffraction studies for all of these chosen samples. And uh, next, uh, a set of tensile tests were performed for each of the heat treated conditions and the corresponding strain hardening plots uh, for the isochronal treatments were also derived. And as we can see, the fully recovered grains, uh, they demonstrate a very high yield strength with very low ductility, while the fully recrystallized microstructure shows a high elongation at UTS, around 50%, with a tensile strength of uh, about 500 megapascals. It is also evident from the uh, strain hardening uh, plots that the stage two hardening is prolonged in case of recrystallized microstructure at 1073 Kelvin, uh, or rather 800 Celsius, more generally speaking, uh, thereby uh, increasing the ductility. So uh, after this, multiple electron backscatter diffraction experiments were performed on all of the specimens and the GND maps, geometrically necessary dislocation maps, were plotted for different heat treatments. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the initial uh, partly recovered microstructure, it shows large deformed grains as well as small fragmented grains. And the completion of recovery is marked by formation of low angle boundaries around the subgrains, although no new grain formation has occurred as of yet. Uh, and recrystallization is found to start at around uh, 873 Kelvin. And as we can see, uh, here, um, new strain-free equiased grains form, and some of which also show occurrence of annealing twins. The completion of rec uh, recrystallization uh, is marked around 1073 Kelvin, which exhibits an overall decrease in the geometrically necessary dislocation density and the kernel average misorientation or CAM values. And also uh, extensive twinning is evident from the microstructure, which is, uh, which is indicative of low stacking fault energy of the material, uh, uh, which is being interrogated. And uh, now, uh, from the maps obtained for recovered as well as the recrystallized microstructures, the number average as well as area average grain size distributions were plotted, uh, which demonstrated a bimodal nature in most of the cases. So for all of these, the average grain size was calculated and the grain boundary strengthening ca uh, characteristics were estimated using the um, uh, Holpech equation. Nevertheless, uh, this, this must be remembered that uh, Unlike the case of unimodal distributions, which is the case with the uh, Gaussian or normal grain size distributions, the statistical mode value is not similar to the mean value. So uh, for bimodal or uh, multimodal distributions or even uh, gradient microstructures for that matter, the uh, average grain size which is used in the Holpech equation is not the precise fitting parameter for the prediction of strength. Uh, rather, this, uh, it, uh, it, it, it entails uh, devising a parameter which can capture the zonal average in each of the modes of the GSD curve. Uh, GSD uh, stands for grain size distribution. Uh, I might have shortened it occasionally through the course of this presentation. So just to clarify, GSD uh, stands for grain size distribution. Now, uh, in order to calculate the strength, it should be noted that crystal plasticity in a bulk material is the composite response of each individual grain which is uh, under the application of load. 
So basically, the fine grains in the microstructure mostly uh, are responsible to carry the stress, while the coarse grains accommodate the strain. So with this, we come to the calculation of microstructure entropy parameter, where we have devised a term dependent on the initial smallest grain size and the average grain size. And there is another distribution term, which is a functional of the number average and area fraction of the coarse and fine grains. And uh, as we can gather from this equation, the expression of S star gets more and more refined as the summation term expands to as many number of terms as there are the number of modes in the distribution curve. And this microstructure entropy parameter is fitted into an equation similar to the Holpech equation to calculate the grain boundary strengthening contribution in each of the cases. And as we can see from the plots, it is evident that microstructure entropy parameter is indeed able to capture the strengthening response with a greater accuracy and precision as compared to the Holpech parameter. I have also made an exhaustive literature survey and compared the properties of this alloy prepared via other, uh, other uh, synthesis and processing techniques. And apart from this, um, I have also made a comparison with respect to other high entropy alloys and medium entropy alloys and uh, also conventional alloys. And it can be understood that unlike conventional experimentation, microstructure entropy parameter provides a directionality for synchronous improvement in strength and plasticity, commonly called as CISP. So uh, finally, concluding the presentation, I would summon uh, these uh, salient points. Uh, using the grain size distribution instead of average grain size gives a more precise estimation of grain boundary strengthening. The microstructure entropy uh, model, uh, it, it validates the stress strain partitioning in multimodal distributions. And microstructure entropy parameter is a better characterizing parameter for capturing the overall grain size distribution rather than an average term, which is used in the empirical hall pitch equation. And as a future scope of the work, a similar constitutive modeling approach may be adopted for Taylor hardening characteristics to calculate the accurate uh, prediction of uh, overall strengthening contribution. Lastly, uh, I would like to acknowledge the funding obtained from PMRF, MHRD Government of India, SERB Department of Science and Technology, and ISRO for funding this study. And I would also like to extend my warmest thanks to ACMS and MSC Department IIT Kanpur for providing the experimental facilities. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Soumya. Very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting talk. So, um, so have you, uh, Miss? You have done uh, quite a lot of literature. So, uh, so do you find any deviation that uh, any specific uh, material microstructure or deviates from from your your uh, modeling predictions? Actually, ma'am, we have done this uh, for uh, medium entropy alloys mostly. What happens in complex concentrated alloys is that the lattice friction stress and the solid sol solution strengthening contribution in the overall strength equation is very high. So the constant term uh, sigma naught becomes very high here. So uh, okay. as of now, this we have not uh, validated this model for other conventional materials uh, such as copper alloys or uh, aluminum alloys or say steels, but uh, complex concentrated alloys, we have validated this model. And as of now, we are also working on improving this um, equation by um, uh, using the distribution term instead of the average term, even in the Taylor hardening equation and even in the uh, solid solution strengthening model, ma'am. Okay. So we are working on Great, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank now you. we move to the next speaker. So our next speaker is Mr. Muhammad Azjuddin Ganai from IIT Madras. So, hi, uh, Hello, man. Is my uh, slides are visible? Yes, your slides are visible. <laughs> yes. uh, am I audible clearly? Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you, start. everyone. So good afternoon. In this international conference on advanced materials and mechanical characterization, I'll be talking on electrospar nanofibers as smart surfaces for desorption, electrospray, ionization, mass spectrometry based analysis and imprint imaging. So in this work, we have used uh, nanofibers as smart surfaces in an ambient ionization mass spectrometry, also called well DCMS, and it has been used for molecule analysis and imprinting uh, imaging of various analytes. So, as a part of introduction, a typical mass spectrometer consists of five main parts, and uh, like you can see here, and on the basis of source, there can be different types of mass spectrometer. 
And one such mass spectrometer is uh, DCMS. It is actually a, a mass spectrometer, which is, I mean, done in ambient conditions. So here it is the schematic of uh, DCMS. You can see here, and it uh, consists of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this nebulizer capillary by which electrosolvent comes. And here we have a sample stage where we keep our sample of interest. And then the dissolved material is taken to the uh, mass spectrometric inlet are, uh, uh, and here we are able to get two things. One is the uh, mass spectrum, uh, and then we can also do imaging with this uh, instrument, I mean, with this DCMS imaging. So to get good uh, dissolved mass spectrum and also uh, better images, so many parameters have been changed. And one less uh, parameter which has not been, I mean, modified or uh, changed much is the sample stage. So usually, I mean, this DCMS requires a rigid and flat surface uh, so that we can imprint or drop cast our material of interest and then do the analysis. So you, uh, usually the used one are PLC plate or amorphous silica or uh, poly tetrafluoroethylene, but these have some uh, limitations, like sometimes they do the catalytic degradation of the material or we don't get a good resolved image and the mass spectrum. So we had looked into this aspect and we have used Electrospun nanofibers, because of the various qualities, we know electrospun nanofibers have large surface area and they have good desorption properties and also they are neutral in nature. I mean, many nanofibers are neutral in nature. So they give good exposure to the uh, metabolites and we can get good result mass spectrum and also uh, may, uh, mass imaging uh, when we use uh, this as page. So we have done studies and then compared with the conventional used uh, sample stages. So. How we got this uh, nanofiber smart? So we have used uh, needless electrospinning setup here. It is schematic of that electrospinning setup. It is not typical needle-based electrospinning setup. Actually, it's a needless. And here we are taking the solution of our interest here. And we don't have to worry about, I mean, blocking off the needle and everything. And one more thing with uh, good uh, thing with this setup is that like we can get uh, nanofiber smats like just in few minutes, what we can get within hours of work with a uh, needle-based electro spin setup. So there are many applications of uh, this electro spinning here I have shown. Uh, then this is the electro spin setup that uh, we have used. I know I can see it. So here actually uh, this is, I want to show you. Yeah, so here you can see like this setup we have used and here you can see uh, the jet of fibers are coming and they are getting collected here on actually uh, the uh, collector that we want. We have taken aluminum file for our this thing and there you can see in fiber formation of nanofibers. And then these are the uh, mats, electrospun nanofiber mats. These are the SEM images and these are various thicknesses of these electrospun nanofibers mats. And coming to the uh, results that we have done. The first thing that we have done is actually uh, analyzing the single drops of uh, methyl orange and periwinkle flower extract and then compare the study. So here we have taken periwinkle flower extract on uh, on our material on nanofabric mat. You can see uniform distribution and similarly when it was taken on PLC plate, you can see a hello formation and there the, uh, this is spread to the boundaries. And when we do the mass analysis with our uh, on nanofibrous mat, you can see a clear mass spectrum is obtained and we are able to detect the methyl orange. Also, DCMH image shows the uniform distribution uh, of methyl orange. And similarly, we have done with periwinkle flower extract and we got the characteristic mass feature for this extract. And also when we did same thing on a printing paper, you can see fading effect is happening. You can see now when basic MS imaging was done for this, I mean, PLC plate uh, uh, drop pass sample, you can see the non uniformity and also there's a lot of night in the mass spectrum. And one good thing with our uh, sample is that actually we can, it can ease the uh, synthesis process. What does it mean actually for mass spectrometer? I mean, the uh, preparation of sample is a uh, problem. So, I mean, is a, I mean, it's a time consuming process and a lot of things are. To be needed, but here actually it has make it easy. How we can simply, I mean, take our uh, material of interest, and uh, if it is soluble with, I mean, our polymeric solution, so we can make it here. We have tried actually. We have taken this periwinkle, uh, periwinkle flower extract, and we have mixed it with our polymeric solution. When we have drawn a 
mat out of it. And when this mat was characterized, we have obtained the molecular features corresponding to periwinkle flower extract. And also when the DCMS imaging was done, we have seen the uniform distribution of the various metabolites that were uh, present in this extract. And also with our material, actually, we can do uh, spraying studies or wetting effect studies. Uh, what does it mean, actually? When we make an imprint uh, of any um, uh, molecule, like uh, any sample here, we have actually taken this is turmeric paste that we have been imprinted on nanofibrous mat. So some of the metabolites or some of the analytes we know like they will be solvent in some solvents. Like if we take water-based solvents, so some of them may, may be soluble in them. So we have seen actually what are the metabolites which are soluble in them. And it, it is this uh, mass spectrum is before spring and this is after spring. So you can see uh, like uh, the, we can see like what are the various metabolites which are soluble and we can do this study. But when we try same thing on uh, uh, this is a printing paper when we have drawn actually this uh, drawn uh, the turmeric paste on you can see like deformation is happening so as such like you cannot do such type of studies on other materials other than nanofibrous mats and one good thing with our materials like we can do imaging and the imaging is uh, happening in such a way that there is no overlapping of the uh, images so here we have written nylon on this uh, nanofibrous mat and we have done the mass analysis. We have done, I mean, the feature correspond to rhodamine B or rhodamine 6G. And when they see MS imaging was done, you can see the letters do not uh, overlap with each other. And to uh, uh, like do it, uh, go for further studies, we have taken red and blue inks and we have uh, put them, uh, imprint them uh, very near to each other. Then we have been able to do two types of studies. Like what are the different uh, analytes present in them? Also, when we have done, I mean, uh, the DCMS imaging for the same analyte, we were able to see, I mean, there is not much inter, uh, I mean, uh, overlapping of the images. So when similar type of uh, images are is done on some other analyte, like you, on some other surface, like printing paper, you can see, I mean, how overlapping is happening. And not only that, actually, we can imprint various plant parts and also do the storage of uh, those imprints for a longer period of time. So here we have taken different, I mean, imprints here. This is an uh, imprint of a uh, turmeric rhizome uh, slice. And here it is beetle leaf. Here it is pinciona flower petal. And here this is uh, a perimenical uh, flower petal. So you can see here we have got, I mean, clear mass spectrum and also DCM image are very clear. And one more good thing, actually, this inlet here shows uh, the uh, imprint after 15 days, uh, I mean, after two weeks, and also the mass spectrum, you can see we are get even able to get the mass spectrum even after 15 days. Actually, this is one good feature without material, because if we uh, make the imprint and we have to do study in some other uh, part or other place, so storage is very much. But with other things like uh, other uh, materials, there, this is a problem. Like if we take an uh, imprint on, TLC plate and in this study is actually after just two days. You can see the imprint is almost completely invisible. And when we do the imaging, like we are not able to get the uh, molecular features. Also, the SMS imaging not uh, coming clear. And also, we have been able to do the study of uh, fungal infection on lemon. So here, actually, this is a lemon uh, image, and it is actually infected with fungus. So we have been able to imprint this part on our nanofibrous mat, and we have been able to see the damaged part. Also, we have been able to see what is the toxin present in this uh, fungus. So from our mass studies, we have been able to see that it is a ochrotaxin, which is the present in this uh, infection. So the various metabolites have been actually uh, detected by tender mass spectrometry from database and also from the literature. These are various metabolites which we have detected. And now coming to the conclusion, so the suitability of these nanofiber mats as smart surface for DC MS is illustrated using specific examples like by uh, uh, including like patterns formed by single drops with dyes, marker pen inks and printing inks. And there was no overlapping of the images and also imprint of plant parts like demonstrate the significance of using these fibrous mats as smart surface for identifying and preserving diverse class of compounds, including aroma and color. And we have been able to image this fungal and other infectional contaminational growth on uh, fruits. And the result of this study suggests that electrospin nanofibers can be made industrially and their use in DC MS can become a promising method of analysis in forensics, medical diagnostics, pharmaceuticals, and food control.
and these are various references and for acknowledging i am thankful to my uh, lab uh, uh, pradeep research group from iit madras and my institute my funding agency and also to ic mmc and sr ministry for giving me opportunity to present my work and thank you all for your attention and if there are any questions please let me know thank you again uh, very knowledgeable talk Thank so you, so what is the maximum area you could print i mean this it can go in centimeters actually i mean this this we can go uh, like we can take i mean even a big sample also it depends on uh, the sample of our interest we can do some uh, in some uh, four five centimeter sample also can be imaged very easily with this instrument okay okay great great so uh, if you don't have any questions from audience if not i'll give to dr kiran to take Hi. over thank you thank you professor abha uh, though the session started 15 minutes late so you could very well cover and you know only now we are at only 4 minutes delay still we have 45 minutes time uh, at least 40 minutes time to have your lunch and i request all people to join for professor p pradeep's talk you know uh so sir works on highly advanced stuff so i request all of you to please join again on the same link one if you want to attend to deep stuff otherwise uh, there is a session 2 session 3 also every, every session will start it again uh, uh, after the keynotes 250 so thank you so much we will see you back at 2 thank you professor abha uh, thank you so much
ओके हाँ या या थैंक यू थैंक यू Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I am seeing this, but uh, hello. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is no uh, like the webcam link. No, webcam is not active. Your webcam is not showing, but Professor uh, Professor Pradeep has joined. Can you please? Uh, 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 okay, okay, uh, okay. I'll go ahead. Okay, yeah. Your webcam yeah. is not working. I think. Uh, sir, okay. Namaste, sir. Yeah. Welcome, sir. Uh, yeah. Namaste. Hello. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, Professor Pradeep. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kiran. Professor Srinivasan. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm not able to see. Um, like Professor Srinivasan. Pradeep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can see you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I was not able to see the screen. So yeah, somehow my webcam is not active. So uh, I think we will possibly Hello, go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hmm? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Please carry on. Yeah. Uh, Kiran, I think uh, you are not able to hear. Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Now, fine. Please go ahead. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Let me start this uh, uh, session. Um, I welcome you all uh, uh, to this third keynote uh, keynote lecture, and uh, it's uh, uh, our uh, privilege that we have Professor uh, T. Pradeep uh, to deliver this uh, third keynote lecture uh, for mm -hmm. the conference. Uh, professor Pradeep is Institute Professor uh, at uh, uh, IIT Madras. He is a Deepak Parekh uh, Institute Chair Professor and uh, is a Professor of Chemistry. Uh, he studied at the University of Calicut, uh, Indian Institute of Science, UC Berkeley and uh, Purdue. His uh, research interests are in uh, molecular and nanoscale materials and uh, he developed uh, instrumentation uh, uh, for such studies. He is author of uh, more than 500 scientific papers in journals and uh, is an inventor of uh, uh, 125 patents or uh, patent applications. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to the work on advanced materials, he's involved in develop, uh, development of affordable technologies for drinking uh, water purification. And some of them have been commercialized. Uh, his uh, pesticide removal technology is estimated to have reached uh, about 10 million people. Uh, along with his associates, he has incubated six companies and uh, there are three of them are uh, have production units. And his arsenic removal technology approved uh, for national implementation is uh, delivering arsenic free water to about 1 million people every day. Uh, he is recipient of several awards, including Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, uh, BM Birla Science Prize, National Award for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, uh, India Nanotech Innovation Award, JC Bose National Fellowship, and the National Water Award. Um, he is also a winner of uh, Third World Academy of, uh, of the World Academy of Sciences Prize in Chemistry um, in 2018, and uh, recently in 2020 he was confirmed conferred uh, Padma Shri by Government of India, and uh, is also um, a recipient of Nikkei Asia Prize in 2020. Uh, he is a fellow of uh, Indian Academy National Academy Science Academy Indian Academy of Sciences. National Academy of Sciences, uh, India, Indian National Academy of Engineering, Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, the World Academy of Sciences, uh, and uh, American Association for Advancement of Science. And he has uh, written a uh, couple of books, and uh, 
uh, and he has uh, also authored uh, popular uh, science books in malayalam uh, uh, regional language uh, okay um, in malayalam language and is a recipient of kerala sahitya academy award um, he has uh, received the lifetime Re achievement research award of iit madras and distinguished alumnus award from iisc uh, uh, as part of his uh, philanthropic activities he supports a school in his village uh, where 500 students are uh, enrolled so with this uh, introduction uh, i would say we, it's a privilege to have professor pradeep to deliver the keynote lecture for our conference so i uh, uh, i go uh, give it to professor pradeep to present his talk thank you uh, professor srinivas rao bakshi for this uh, elaborate introduction. I know that uh, something was given and probably what has to condense a little bit uh, in the hat. Uh, well, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about one's own science. I'm not uh, joining from IIT Madras because of some activity I had to come uh, to another city, manage some time to give this lecture. I'm in a hotel room right now. Hopefully uh, the connectivity will be good, um, I, I hope. Uh, I will do this in about 40 minutes or 37 minutes or something, and then uh, take questions from you in case uh, there are any. This is a subject <clears throat> on which we have been working on in the past uh, about about 13, let's say about 14 years or so, quite intensely uh, in the past uh, over 10 years. Now, there have been several students associated uh, with this, and you will see their names at the end. It is about a subject which we call atomically precise clusters. Today, nanomaterials are changing so drastically. They are becoming atomically precise because we have new tools to study them. And these new tools essentially can pick one atom or differences between atoms or differences between isotopes of atoms. And that is that, that breadth of knowledge using a whole range of analytical uh, techniques tell us that these pieces of matter, clusters of matter, are actually molecules. And chemists, of course, have been fascinated by molecules, uh, physicists also, biologists, and many others. So this branch is getting into several areas of science uh, right now. And we have written about it, and there are this subject area is expanding, as I said, more and more of these um, uh, papers are coming out. <clears throat> now, well, um, let me just move the screen a little bit. <clears throat> uh, when you look at molecules, the first thing that comes to one's mind is molecular properties. Um, well, if you take a molecule as, uh, as well known as water, uh, you can see a number of its properties. Uh, it's a chemical formula or a molecular weight or a critical temperature or pressure or critical density or anything. In fact, on properties of water, one can write a book. <clears throat> So molecular properties are very big. I have to summarize some of them. Now, the moment you say that clusters or nanoparticles are molecules, I've not yet said nanoparticles are molecules. I just said clusters are molecules. And towards the end, you will see that clusters are, or nanoparticles are also molecules. You will see, you will ask this question, what do we know about the molecular properties? of these systems. Do we know as precisely as in the case of water? No, we don't. But we know a number of things. And I hope to present uh, to you that fascinating diversity uh, in this branch. <clears throat> now, I said molecules. 
So there is a molecular mass. There is a molecular formula. There is a composition. There is a structure. There is, our chemists would say, uh, there are many other molecular properties. So let me take a piece of such matter. Uh, this is a 25 atom particle of gold protected with ligands. They are molecules protecting this whole entity. And that is gold 25, ligand 18. These ligands are a little more complex molecular species and it has a precise charge one minus. And I can study this as a molecular entity. I can prepare it, of course. Uh, any undergraduate student can make this in the laboratory very easily these days. You can get several tens of milligrams of this material, or you can make a gram if you synthesize work for a day or something. This is one such molecule. There are a huge number of other molecules. And that is what I wrote about that the particular review, as I just mentioned. Now, these are molecules. They are synthesized with precise number of atoms. And you can, of course, uh, take a mass spectrum of it. So if you see, here is a mass 7390.5718. So this is the mass of this particular entity. Obviously, gold has only one isotope. And so if you take gold 25, there will only be one peak. But because this has ligands, the ligands contain sulfur, ligands contain um, hydrogen, ligand contains um, carbon. All of these have different isotopes. The mass spectrum is a little more complex. And I can expand that mass spectrum. It looks like this. And this is what I said, high resolution mass spectrometry at that mass range, 7390.5718. So this 7390.5718 is this particular peak. That is there and there are many other peaks because of this isotopic distribution, because there is this ligand, as I said, which has sulfur. Sulfur has four isotopes, 32, 33, 34, and 36. And hydrogen has two isotopes, uh, normal hydrogen and deuterium. And uh, carbon has two isotopes, carbon 12 and 13. So if you put a statistical distribution of all these, you get for this particular composition, a distribution which has a peak at this particular position. And that is what you see. Now, when you have precise masses of this kind and a huge good distribution, and you have a mass spectrometer which can analyze these, you have methodologies to take these species into the gas phase and do high resolution mass spectrometry, then many other things become possible. And you will soon see what those many other things are. Now, I said uh, this particular molecule, there can be this another molecule, which is gold 38. There's another molecule called gold 102, which is different types of ligands. There are many, many other things. There are today over 150 molecules of this kind are known today. And some of them are so well known that well-defined structures are available. I'll show you what that uh, structure means. So when you have such a molecule, you have well-defined mass spectrum. Essentially, it says that you have a pure material. And you can crystallize it. And you can solve the crystal structure of it. And when you have such coordinates, atomic coordinates of this, you can put these into the computer. And you can do today all electron calculations or some approximate methods, and with which you can build uh, essentially the complete electronic structure. And this complete electronic structure tells you uh, that there is something called electronic shells in the system. Therefore, many people think that these are molecules, which can also be called as artificial atoms. <clears throat> so they are called superatoms. And they also have well-defined structure. So there is something called a geometric stability for this. In this particular calculation or result of this calculation, the ligand has been sort of uh, reduced to SCH3. So the, all these ligands are SCH3, and these are gold atoms, 
uh, that you can see. There are many 25 gold atoms. These 25 at gold atoms are built around a one atom at the center and a 12 atom icosahedron. So it's a 13 atom filled icosahedron with uh, other atoms around making this particular structure. It looks like this if you were to take the uh, atomic uh, radii of gold atoms and sulfur and all that, it looks like this is a piece of metal. It's not metal. This is this particular one is an insulator. Correspondingly, you have silver 25, an equivalent structure. And you have, uh, well, you have silver 29, another cluster which I will be using in this lecture. Now, but this gives you a whole range of variety. Imagine one of these atoms at the center is not gold, it is platinum. So we have platinum AG, AU24, or we can have palladium AU24, which has a completely different structure. In, you can have not one atom, you can have two of these atoms. Now think about the diversity that is possible with which new properties can come about. For example, you can put a nickel in there and you can become, become a piece of a magnetic metal. So you can have many structures as I just mentioned. This is something called silver 44. This is the first structure that people have made wherein the metal core inside has uh, one atom missing. That is because the 12 atom icosahedral core is a 13 atom core that I said, one atom is missing. So it is a 12 atom core. So there is a central icosahedron is hollow around which there are 20 atoms, 12 and 20, that makes it to 32. And there are 12 atoms again, making it to 44, and there are 30 ligands, and that is what the structure that is shown there. And I'm going, not going to get into a whole lot of details on the structures in this thing. So the moment you have or synthesized these kinds of materials, you can keep it in the laboratory, you can make crystals. So our, um, um, one of our uh, students, who is also a joint student, student with metallurgy, so he makes these clusters, uh, 29, uh, with the uh, ligand, and this is you know, beautiful crystals of this kind. This is also luminescent. Now, one important thing about these cluster crystals is that these crystals, their lattice plane, this was very difficult to see uh, some years ago, well, till recently, because these clusters in a traditional uh, TEM, they of course will coil us. As you can see, the edges, these are all coalescing. But if you do a low dose, low energy imaging, uh, in, even in a standard transmission electron microscope today, you can see this lattice. I hope you are seeing the lattice. This lattice is in nanometers. This is the lattice of the cluster crystal. This is not gold atom. And uh, now you can see these lattices, not just one lattice, of course, there are different lattices in this particular thing, just got accepted in this uh, thing. So you can today see these crystals routinely in standard laboratory conditions. So you have a cluster, you have atomic precision, you have a composition. So I was asking this question for quite some time, can these be molecules? So one of the ways that you can say that these are molecules is by showing molecular reactivity. I'm showing you a picture of this gold, well, some ligand protected cluster, and I can irradiate with ultraviolet light and you can get a luminescence of this. Uh, just a minute. Me, I'm doing something work here. What nonsense is going on? So I was asking, can there be a chemical reaction like this? So here is a solution of these cluster. These clusters are soluble in organic or any kind of different solvents. And you ask this question, can there be reactions? So the question I wanted to ask was that, yes, there is one molecule, one cluster, which is, let us say something like this. There is another cluster, 
which is another molecule. Now, can there be a reaction between these two? Well, I decided to study this with a mass spectrometer. So this is one of those uh, instruments that we have in our laboratory. So the question was, here is a cluster and here is another cluster. Can there be a chemical reaction just as we do chemical reactions in molecules? Can we write a molecular reaction like this? So those of you who have studied chemical reactions would understand that chemical reactions have energetics. Chemical reactions obviously tell us that there are new chemical bonds forming and breaking. And that tells you that what you are involved with is a molecular system. Now you have reactions, you have energetics, you have associated thermodynamics uh, and associated kinetics, and you have free energies and enthalpies and all that. So can we understand this? So you, the question that we, uh, we asked was quite profound. So we decided to probe it with mass spectrometry, as I just mentioned. So here is that reaction that I thought I would do. AU25 FTP18, FTP is this molecule, which is a ligand instead of L that I just told you earlier, I have just expanded fluorothiophenol it is called. That's why this FTP. And another cluster, which is uh, AG44, again with the same ligand, FTP. And then can we have a chemical reaction is what does question right so i took this entity and put it in the mass spectrometer i'm supposed to see a peak here which is corresponding to au25 ftp18 assume this x to be zero au25 ftp18 and this has another a fragment au21 ftp14 so this is what uh, you have now added this particular molecule, AG44, you suddenly got this peak. And that peak is one atom getting into this AU25 and one AU going out. So it is AU25 minus X AGX FTP18. Well, there is uh, two more, three, four, five, all of these come out. And then corresponding is these are fragments, as I just told you, this is a piece of this particular thing. It's because during mass spectrometry, some species come out. And that also shows this particular uh, substitution. So you can do substitution chemistry of this kind, which changes this. So you wait a little while and then measure a mass spectrum, you will see that this peak goes down in intensity, these peaks come up and so you have a distribution and some time later, this peak is vanishing completely. So very interesting substitution chemistry, but that is not the only thing. This guy is also getting substituted. So correspondingly, you have AG44 minus XAUX is happening. So it is essentially one atom going here, another atom is coming here. So this is what happens. It's not the only thing. In fact, this molecule or this ligand goes in here and this ligand comes in there also. Currently, I don't see it because I have carefully chosen this system so that they are the same. And even if there is exchange happening, mass spectrometry is not in a position to see it. Now, I, we have done a number of other experiments to prove that such chemistry happens. Now, this is like changing one carbon and putting it into nitrogen or something. Now, if I were to take that cluster structure, this is the kind of structure that I showed you, just that on this sulfur, there, there was a on SCH3 there or ligand there. And this I have removed for simplicity. So this structure is AU25 structure, S, AU25, S12, S, uh, in this particular case, S18 structure. Now, corresponding structure of AG44 with ligand 30, that is here. This has um, three different types of metals. One is icosahedral central and this icosahedral 12 atoms and this staple atoms. These are the kind of uh, species that I have, have these three different types. So if I ask this question, when a silver comes out from here and goes in here, where will it go? It will go here or there or there. Sort of three equivalent positions, uh, three types of positions that I told you. Correspondingly, if I take a gold from here and put it in here, where will it go? 
There are four different types of sites here, an icosahedral site, an endodecahedral vertex position, an endodecahedral facial position, and a staple position. So this is how the structure is. is. You can obviously put this in a computer and you can ask this question. Here is that particular entity 44, AG44, and I put one silver atom here. Obviously, gold is more noble than silver. The moment one gold goes into a place of silver, the system likes it. So the energy is negative. So it's not only that energy is negative for the icosahedral position, energy is negative for the dodecahedral vertex position or dodecahedral facial position or a staple position. So it likes it. But there's an energy difference. If I take this particular thing, AU25 and put an AG, AG is less noble than AU. And obviously, this is not going to like it. All these energies, whether it is C position, I position, or S position, energies are positive. However, if I were to do this in such a way that one atom changes here, correspondingly one atom changes here, I have a chemical reaction. I can calculate the delta H of it or delta S of it or delta S of it, uh, delta G of it. Now, if I do that, the enthalpy tells me that if I substitute C in this position of the 25, correspondingly, I position is substituted in 44, I get this energy, which is negative. Whereas if I do this and this, energy is positive and positive and positive. I for I position, however, is more negative. Others are some different energies. So essentially it tells you that thermodynamics drives this chemistry wherein I for I substitution is what happens initially for one atom, for two, for three, four. So you can compute this and say that energetics drive this chemistry. But that doesn't stop there then. You can build a large number of you know, reactions and chemistry that way. So we do this and this reaction now. And when I do that, that's something very interesting. I see start here with this AU25 and I wrote it as 025 to indicate that there is no silver in it. And I have essentially disregarded all the ligands here. As far as the silver 25 is concerned, this is a mixture, EQ molar, meaning that the same number of atoms of, or molecules of AU25, same number of molecules of AG25. If I take that, the mass spectrum looks like this, and I label it as 25-0 to indicate that there is no gold in it. Now, although these are EQ molar, the intensities are different because the ionization cross-sections are different. So I have this entity now, and I mix it. Which it suddenly this peak comes up and I showed you or told you what the reason for this peak is this peak and correspondingly this peak comes up, but it is not that this region is silent, there are many other peaks there. And there are these are these and there is this isotope, some kind of a preference for this, this 13, 12 and 12, 13 peaks are more in intensity, and that is because we have something called an entropic contribution to energy. So there are more possibilities and therefore greater entropy, which makes it to minus T deltas, which makes it to better free energy for these systems. So you have these, well, this is what happens, but if this molecule was cluster and this cluster, they have to come together and do this chemical reaction, there has to be a species, which is a transition state. Uh, and two things have to come together. Can I detect that? In fact, I did this experiment and showed that this and this come together and form a two minus species. This was a one minus species, a one minus species. So you get a two minus species, which appears somewhere here. And I would I know that? Well, if I take a, an isotopic or mass separation between these, it shows that it is 0 0.5. That 0 0.5 is because the charge between this charge in this ion is minus two. And what you're plotting is m by z when two is uh, the charge of it, the separation between the peaks is 0.5. So now this peak is there, and a little later on what happens is that so many other peaks come up. So this is what happens in the initial stages, and there are many other peaks uh, that come up, and that is what the chemistry that I just told you about. So you can compute it. So here is a cluster, here is a cluster, you bring them together, and you see that this interaction is sufficiently uh, strong, and 
atoms can come together so close by at distances of about 2.9 angstroms or 3.3 angstroms or so, wherein there is significant interaction and exchange can happen. Now, there are many other things that you can do, and I'm not going to bother you with a whole lot of other details with this. So you start from here, AU, AG25, and add a little bit of AU25 to it. So you get a distribution of species and, and complete exchange happens. Some amount of uh, these silver is exchanged. You have this distribution and you have put a little more of AU25, the distribution shifts more towards gold, little more, further more to gold, further more, further more. You can shift this entire spectrum to the side of AU25. What it means is that you can change one atom chemistry substitution one at a time in this whole complex nanoparticle system and change every atom, atom by atom. So how do I understand this? When I say, how do I understand it? How do I understand it mechanistically? What atom changes first and how would these chemical reactions happen? And you know, organic chemists write these arrows and chemical reactions. And in order to structure all these things, you need a nomenclature. So I thought, can I have a nomenclature for nanoparticles? And to, to make, you know, sort of take this all this long story short, uh, I can build this nomenclature based on structure. So if I look at this structure in greater detail, I see that there is the 12 atom, this 13 atom icosahedron, there is a ring of atoms here, as you can see. This ring of atoms is on the plane of the paper. Of course, there is another ring of atoms towards you. It is difficult for you to see, but there is another ring like these. So this is another ring of atoms. Uh, now, this ring which is towards me is not clear to, to, you, to me or to you. And so I rotate it slightly and I can see that. Now, these three rings uh, essentially can be used to construct a nomenclature system. And that is this. Let us say this, this molecular system that I have, this 13 atom icosahedron at the center, the red ring that I see, that is that ring. There's a blue ring that is this flat piece. And there is also a green ring which is coming towards me. So there is this she ring and that ring and that ring. So there are three rings that are there. And these rings allow me to construct a structure. And this structure, is this what is shown here. And if I take one atom at the center at the icosahedron, and I have, I have the I at the center, there are one, two, three, four atoms. And then I have three, four, five, six, five, uh, six atoms. So I have that three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 atoms, seven, eight, nine, 10 atoms. And all these are different kinds of structures. I mean, the, the, this essentially talks about the icosahedron. So look at this one and two atoms. These one and two atoms are essentially labeled here, one and two. These one and two atoms around that, there is, there is this kind of a ring, one and two atoms, one and two atoms here, around that there is a red ring. Three and four, there is another red ring. Three and four, there is a red ring. And that three and four are here, and that is a ring. So what are these rings? These rings contain one sulfur, one gold, one sulfur, one gold, one sulfur. Sulfur is essentially to say that there is a ligand out there. This I call a staple ring. This I call another staple ring. And of course, there is another staple ring around this. There's another staple ring around this. There's another staple ring around this. There are so there are six staple rings, and each one of these staple rings contain three sulfurs. So this is the 18 ligands that is there. Now, this kind of a structure is something very interesting, and that structure is something that many of you have seen. This is called the Borromean rings. And this Borromean ring is this particular structure, if you, have, you can see it. So this is the structure. So this is a 3D printed Borromean structure. You can buy it, uh, you can make it, or you can, you, you might have seen all these things hanging as uh, uh, 
you know, many, many people buy this for, uh, for jewelries. Well, now this ring, what is so special about this kind of a Borromean ring? Well, Borromean rings are popular in, uh, in, 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 in any kind of topology. Now, in this structure, if you take one ring, let's say take this ring, if I, this ring is what? Ring is bound by, formed by chemical bonds. If I take one chemical bond out here, that it means is that this ring can be completely taken out. When this ring is taken out, this ring is essentially free. And this ring is also free. And this is true of this Borromean ring, a knee ring. Each ring, well, one chemical bond is broken, the entire structure can be disassembled. And that has a profound implication to nanomaterial science. I told you that very fast chemical reactions happen in this particular case. It is because it has a unique structure of this kind. But the moment you say some structure of this kind is there, there are many chemical bonds coming together. Certain chemical bonds will make this system stronger. So if I take this Borromean ring and uh, put one uh, ring around another ring, et cetera, certain chemicals bonds will be stronger than other chemical bonds. For example, this one four bond will be stronger than other bonds. That means this chemical distance, bond distance will be shorter than other bond distances. Can you see that? Yes, we can see that in X-ray diffraction. So I will not get this into, into further details into that structure, but this structure today, we call it aspicule structure. Aspis is shield, cules is come from molecules, so it's an aspicule structure essentially refers to structural uh, categorization of nanomaterials of this kind. So what does it allow you? It allows you to write a chemical name and from that name you can construct a structure. Uh, again, I will not bother you with further details because this audience is a different type of audience. But you can construct that on the board which means that which chemical bond really comes out and then how these chemical bonds come together to form a new nanoparticle can be seen in greater detail. So it doesn't stop there. You can build larger nanoparticle models like this. So this is a 102 atom gold cluster, which was the first crystallized nanoparticle, atomically precise crystallized nanoparticle structure with coordinates known. And this is a chiral particle which means there is an optical activity. Can we build optical, uh, with this kind of optical activity, can you really put into the structure? Can you write a nomenclature with that optical activity? So all of these uh, we have done. So what I just showed you is that things can interact, clusters can interact, form dimers. Can I see this dimers? Yes, mass spectrometrically, we can see a cluster be forming a dimer, AU25 forming a dimer. AG25 forming a dimer, etc. Now, such dimers, which simply means that a cluster a, and another cluster can come together and form something else, which may be an alloy. I showed you earlier, it's also alloys, but unique alloys can be made. This unique alloy in this particular case was made with iridium. Iridium cluster and gold cluster coming together and forming some alloy. It's also possible that this cluster and that cluster can come together in, in not only in the reactions of the kind, you can connect one cluster to the other cluster through ligands and make very stable dimer structures in solution. So we make these solutions uh, and I will not get you into this. So the subject that I just told you is that atomically precise chemical reactions suggest that the, these cluster systems are molecules. But in the very recent past, there's something very exciting that has happened. I told you that one cluster, another cluster coming together and one atom is exchanging. But then there's an exchange product, which is an alloy, and that has, there is another alloy or the parent cluster, they can also form a, a dimers. So there is a whole series of dimers and these dimers give you a number of products and there is a whole sequence of science that happens. So let me just, take you straight to this uh, core of this excitement. One AU, AG25, its concentration in the course of reaction decreases time. But what happens is that one atom of AU gets in, it makes AG24 AU. Its concentration also comes up and it decreases while the next fellow comes up. 
AG23, AU2. Well, this comes down again. The other guy goes up. Another guy goes up. Another guy goes up. So you see a whole series of chemical dynamics evolving in the system, finally leading to an equilibrium depending upon the concentration thermodynamics prevailing in the situation. So we can probe all these chemical science evolution. I told you that this chemical evolution suggests that here is one cluster, there is one cluster, these are atoms are exchanging. Let us say I, I told you that. But even if I take a pure cluster, in this pure cluster, there is another pure cluster molecule neighboring, and these atoms may be coming together and exchanging. This is called cluster dynamics, which essentially would suggest that clusters are similar to water. Water molecule, another water molecule come together and atoms exchange. Can I see this? Is it possible that in a nanoparticle of gold or silver or something, I take a pure nanoparticle and see that atoms are exchanging? Well, what I showed was that I took, well, if I were to do that, this will be, this will be truly an excitement of molecules. So I did this experiment some time ago, last two years ago or so with silver. In the case of silver, I can do something very interesting. Silver has two isotopes, stable, um, naturally occurring, silver 107. And silver 107 foil I can buy from Aldrich, and I can make this molecule silver 107 AG25. I can also make another silver, silver 109 AG25. So there are 25 atoms in this. So the atomic mass difference between this and this will be 50. So this peak is 5142, and this peak is 5192. The difference between is, as I said, 50 mass units. But these are pure clusters. Now, if I take pure cluster A, pure cluster B, these are very nice. But if I take these cluster A and B together, just like H2O and D2O together, and if I mix it, I will get HDO. Similar to that, I thought that silver will do so. In fact, it did happen that this and this mixed together, I get dot this. This is very similar to the natural isotopic distribution of a AG, which is 107 and 109, nearly 50-50. How fast does it happen? Well, I can measure the first spectrum after mixing in about five, 15 seconds. The second spectrum, the third spectrum, fourth spectrum by 30 seconds, this whole thing is gone. So it's such a rapid isomerization atom exchange happens uh, in, in, in the system. Oh, very interesting. Can I study the dynamics of this rate at which these things happen? The rate, as I just told you, is extremely fast, but I can do this with taking another cluster system where the reaction is slower, and I can study these kinetics of exchange, and this exchange allows me to compute all the rate constants. Again, I will not go further into this. I have already uh, almost come to 40, 39 minutes of my time. So I'll take one more minute essentially to stop this and give you some time for questions. So I can do a number of chemical reactions, uh, alloys, and ideally I would like to get something that uh, your colleagues do, uh, something called high entropy alloy clusters. So can we do all that? We, we do a number of such things. Now, one cluster, another cluster, let us say these two clusters are similar in outer appearance. I can crystallize them together. I can do something called co-crystals to so essentially combining properties of these systems. Uh, now, you might ask you, you might ask this question, can this happen with nanoparticles? Yes, a three, four, 10 nanometer particle can also react with one atom exchange. And we are studying that in greater detail today a highly polydispersed particle by chemical reactions, we can make it nano for monodispersed particles. I will not have time to discuss all of these in further detail. So I am going to leave you uh, and take you to the last bit of this particular uh, structure. So, well, you have a nano rod and I can put a nanoparticle cluster around it. I can create superstructures of this kind and I can image these superstructures. So we can today, by chemistry of this kind, diverse molecular synthesis of the kind, assembly of this kind, we can create materials, 
really macroscopic materials with atomic precision. And that subject is expanding. So I told you earlier that molecules and then properties is what I can do. I told you composition and structure, et cetera. I have a molecular formula, I have molecular weight, I have a structure, adsorption, reactions, assembly, co-crystal, number of things. But I still don't know many other things. For example, phases. These nanoparticle systems have clusters have phases. They're physical properties. Very rarely, you know, people investigate this. We have just started looking at mechanical properties, electrochemical properties. So this future is, is really bright and several of our students work in this uh, area and I have a large number of collaborators. This fund research was supported by Department of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. I, I uh -huh. saw that I did it in 41 minutes. I'm sorry that I took two minutes extra. Um, no, uh, Professor Pradeep, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very enlightening uh, talk about uh, this very new area for uh, me and I'm sure for many people about uh, uh, atomic uh, nanoclusters. Uh, uh, if there are any questions, uh, actually, I um, uh, okay. I see uh, there are some comments, but there are no questions as such. I I have just one question. Um, uh, actually, to uh, uh, what is the kind of bonding between these uh, metallic particles? Is metallic bonding? Uh, is it uh, are you able to determine that? Yes, when they become a little larger, they essentially become metallic. Somewhere in the range of 250 atoms, they become metallic. And the chemical bonds are very similar to those bonds. There are, of course, we study the silver ligand bonds or gold ligand bonds, gold gold bonds, gold another metal bond. So all of these. And the chemical dis bond distances in this particular case, that's an indication of the strength of the bond. Uh, those chemical, these distances are also closer uh, to the metallic distances when it comes to large. But in small cases, smaller clusters, the chemical bond length is a little bit shorter uh, than the traditional metal metal distance. And uh, it's very interesting uh, to see the silver, uh, the isotope, uh, the mixing that happens. You know, it is possibly a, a contribution due to the entropy. Uh, effect. Uh, uh, it's very uh, nice to yeah. see. Uh, the very interesting result you have. And yeah, we do. Uh, uh, do you have? Uh, yes, sir. We, we study the entropy of this. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so these are nanoparticles of gold and uh, uh, silver. Uh, uh, I mean, do they have like applications in uh, cancer? Uh, you know, uh, I think there are they are used. Uh, in Absolutely, there are plenty and, of uh, plenty of applications in the context of um, well labels, uh, specific labels to specific kind of cancer or diseases. There are also ways by which you can image them uh, using their luminescence. I did not talk about their uh, luminescence, or they are talking about another kind of scattering properties similar to nanoparticle systems. So you can combine nanoparticles that are plasmonic with these clusters which are, uh, which, which are uh, fluorescent. So you can combine imaging methodology with both uh, plasmonics and fluorescence. Uh, we, we do that. There are ways with, by which you can label, uh, attach them with antibodies. So you can use them for appropriate uh, medicine or targeted delivery, catalysis, uh, magnetism. Um, so there are several such areas. Uh, very exciting. Um... Uh, is there any, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, okay, I see there are uh, no more questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pradeep again for uh, sharing uh, his uh, uh, research with us uh, and exciting results. Uh, and um, now I hand over to uh, Dr. Kiran. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think our yeah. session will start now. Uh, yeah. Invited session. Uh, I request Dr. Abhay uh, Sagade to uh, take care of the session one, okay. that is advanced materials. And Professor Bakshi, you please join in session two, mechanical yeah. materials. Uh, let us uh, thank uh, Professor Pradeep uh, once again, if he's here. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Professor sir. Pradeep. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Kiran. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Hana.
Hello. Hi. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Nice to, nice to see you. Thank you very much for inviting me. No, but our pleasure. <laughs> Avai will take care of this session now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, nice I'll be, I'll be doing this session. Time. Yeah, so we'll start it in within a minute. Okay, great. Should I start sharing my screen now already? Yes, or? yes, please do that. Okay. Great, that seems to be showing up. Yes, yeah. yeah perfect. It's changing the slides. So odd. Hmm. Okay, I think it's stopped. Okay, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, so, uh, welcome to this uh, parallel session one. Uh, in this session, uh, uh, myself is uh, uh, Dr. Abhay Sagre. I work uh, in SRM, IST, uh, in physics department as uh, associate professor. Uh, so, today in this session, uh, we will have three uh, say, uh, pro uh, presentations. Uh, to start with, the first one uh, is uh, by uh, Dr. Hannah Joyce. She is currently a professor uh, in low dimensional electronics at University of Cambridge. She joined this uh, department of uh, engineering at Cambridge in 2013. Before that, she completed her PhD from Australian National University in 2010. And then subsequently, she did her uh, postdoc at the uh, University of Oxford. Uh, in Cambridge, she leads a group uh, on developing uh, fantastic uh, nanowires, particularly 3-5 uh, materials. And uh, she used a very uh, interesting technique called a terahertz spectroscopy. It is like a contact-free characterization technique, which do not damage the uh, nanowires. So these characterized materials are used for photovoltaics, photodetectors, and uh, terahertz uh, photonic modulators. So from her work, she has received numerous awards, uh, Philip uh, Leverholm uh, Prize in Engineering, uh, IEEE Photonic Society Young Investigator Award, ERC grant, and then Royal Society 1851 uh, Fellowship. So she is also a member of uh, various societies like IEEE. So welcome, Hannah, uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. So thank please. You. Thank you so much, Abhay, for the extremely kind introduction. And thank you to Abhay and Karen for inviting me here. It's, it's a great honor for me to talk here. Um, I feel very honored. Thank you. My talk will focus on the growth characterization and device integration of 3.5 nanowires. And I'm aiming to create de devices for novel quantum electronic and photonic applications. To give you a brief introduction into the material system, I'm speaking about 3.5 nanowires. These are things like gallium arsenide nanowires, indium arsenide, gallium nitride, and so on. And they're typically characterized by a narrow diameter of less than around 100 nanometers and lengths um, beyond one micrometer generally. And I'm trying to translate this from a materials perspective into an integrated device. The idea being that we harness the unique properties of these quasi one dimensional structures to achieve devices that either have performance that surpasses the state of the art electronics that we see today, or alternatively have entirely new functionality. There are a number of inherent advantages 
to these nanowires as building blocks of optoelectronic devices. One of those is that the narrow diameter that is the small footprint of the nanowire allows its lattice to radially expand or contract and thereby accommodate a certain degree of lattice mismatch. In conventional planar structures, this mechanism is not possible. And so in conventional planar structures, you are limited um, to a small set of materials um, because of lattice matching constraints, but nanowires lift this restriction considerably. This opens the door to two types of heterostructures. For instance, a nanowire grown on a lattice mismatch substrate or an axial heterostructure incorporating segments of lattice mismatch materials along its length. Another possibility is the radial heterostructure, also known as the core shell nanowire, which has particular advantages in that it has a very large interface between the two materials. And you can also interconnect nanowires, for instance, by having branched nanowires grown on a nanowire trunk. We also additionally have other materials, other low dimensional materials that we can integrate with these nanowires, things like graphene and transition metal dichalcogenides. The structure of my talk is divided into three sections, firstly dealing with the growth or fabrication of the nanowires, then moving on to the electrical characterization of nanowires and finally device integration. And each of these aspects operates in a kind of feedback loop with the other aspects. Let's first focus on nanowire fabrication. If we highlight one of the nanowires in the background, you'll see that it has a narrow diameter of around 100 nanometers or less. Um, this particular nanowire also has a gold nanoparticle at, at its tip, and that's because of the growth mechanism used to grow this nanowire. It was grown by a vapor liquid solid growth mechanism. Not all of the nanowires that I'll present were grown by this vapor liquid solid growth mechanism, so not all nanowires actually do have a gold nanoparticle at the tip. But all of the nanowires that I'll present have been grown by metal organic chemical vapor deposition or MOCVD, in which gas phase precursors um, decompose to release um, atoms like gallium or arsenic or nitrogen in order to grow our nanowire. They are three five materials which are commonly characterized um, by high, high charge carrier mobilities and many of these have a direct band gap, making them suitable for optoelectronics. And the nanowire geometry we can consider to be a quasi one dimensional geometry. If we make it thin enough, we do get quantum confinement effects showing up. So <clears throat> in metal organic chemical vapor deposition, we tend to rely on the decomposition of gas phase precursors. Um, trimethyl gallium will carry the gallium element. Um, ammonia will carry a nitrogen element for the growth of gallium arsenide nanowires. And we tailor these um, molecules to, to dictate what type of um, nanowire we get. Critical to the growth of our gallium nitride nanowires is the addition of silane dopants. And my excellent postdoc, Jenny Jang, has been working on the growth of these nanowires. This is termed a silane assisted nanowire growth mechanism, and the actual mechanism is subject to a fair bit of debate. Initially, it was postulated that a silicon nitride layer was deposited on the surface of the nanowire, and that silicon nitride layer on the side facets prevented further deposition of gallium nitride, ultimately giving rise to a one-dimensional, one that is, anisotropic growth. There are some advantages of this silane assisted growth mechanism in that you don't have to do anything special to the substrate. You don't need to add any foreign impurities as a catalyst and you achieve a very fast growth rate, which is actually tend to be considerably higher than that you'd expect for planar gallium nitride growth. Jenny's been studying this, um, <laughs> the, the, the different aspects of the growth mechanism and the different stages involved in the growth. She first has to do a decontamination step, that is an annealing step at high temperature, followed by a nitridation step at a relatively high temperature to create a nitrided um, surface on the sapphire substrate, and then a nucleation step where she introduces the trimethyl gallium. Now, 
at this point, this is the point where Jenny introduces the silane gas, which drives the anisotropic growth of these nanowires. But what Jenny's found is that the nitridation step and the nucleation step are actually crucial to the formation of nanowires. And if she misses either of these steps, she does not obtain nanowires. Furthermore, Jenny has been looking at the growth window of these nanowires. Um, and she's found that these nanowires really only form over a fairly narrow growth window. That is a narrow set of growth temperatures and a narrow set of five over three ratios. The five over three ratio is simply the ratio of the group five reactant, that is ammonia, to the group three reactant, that is trimethyl gallium. And this also sheds light on the growth process that's happening and the interaction of our um, silane with the surface of the nanowires. Now, the next step that I want to talk about is optical and electrical characterization. As Apai has already said, our group uses a novel technique called optical crump terahertz probe spectroscopy. And I'm going to give an introduction to that now. The problem that we're trying to address with this technique is that electrical measurements to nanowires do tend to be very challenging. It's technically demanding to make electrical contacts to such small structures. And once you've done that, the interpretation of your data is complicated by artifacts. For instance, if you wanted to make a hall bar device, such as the one we've made in our lab as shown here, this hall bar device um, consists of a source and a drain and some, um, some nanowire um, contacts to that nanowire. But it was difficult to make and we did have to deposit, um, we did have to embed the nanowire in things like SU8 um, as done by um, other people in the field as well. So that burying of the nanowire is actually quite difficult to do in order to obtain a whole bar device, which is then necessary to obtain electrical measurements of our devices. So what my group tends to do instead is employ a technique known as optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. This is a contact free technique that we perform in free space. And we do not need to deposit any electrical contacts. We don't have to worry about making ohmic contacts to our nanowires, which in itself is very challenging. Um, and with this technique, we're able to extract device relevant parameters such as charge carrier mobility, trapping and recombination rates and lifetimes, and doping levels as well. And so my group is um, as follows, the people in the terahertz spectroscopy lab, um, Strabuni Carr, who is my former postdoc, and she was responsible for a lot of the setting up of the terahertz spectroscopy lab. Um, along with two excellent PhD students, Stephanie Adeyemo and Jamie Lake. And so much of the data that I'll be presenting was obtained by those three. It's important to think about the energy range of this terahertz radiation. And the terahertz band <coughs> lies on the electromagnetic spectrum between the microwave and the infrared regions. And terahertz photons have fairly small energies of about 0.4 MeV up to about 40 MeV. Now these energies are not actually sufficient to photo excite the sample. In terahertz spectroscopy, what we tend to do is have a sample and we measure the transmission of a terahertz pulse through that sample. This terahertz pulse itself is not sufficient to actually photo excite the electrons and holes. Instead, what this terahertz, does, terahertz pulse does is apply a time varying electric field to the electrons and holes already present in the sample. The real relevance of this terahertz pulse is that the frequencies contained within the terahertz pulse are similar to the typical electronic or the frequencies of the typical electronic scattering rates within a semiconductor sample. So with this terahertz probe, we can probe the electronic phenomena taking place in our semiconductor sample simply by measuring the absorption of this terahertz probe. 
the absorption of the terahertz probe is um, linearly related, that is directly proportional to the conductivity of the sample. And so we then extend this technique from a purely sort of transmission-based technique to a technique known as optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. And here, it's exactly the same thing. We're measuring the transmission of a terahertz pulse through a sample, but we first photo excite the sample with an above band gap pulse. And we photo excited our sample, for instance, using a pulse at 800 nanometers, that is about 1.55 electron volts. Having photo excited that sample, we've generated mobile electrons and holes in the sample and then we can measure the transmission of our terahertz pulse. So now in optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy, the transmission of the terahertz pulse is related to the photoconductivity of the sample. The more charge carriers that you've induced by photo excitation, the more that terahertz pulse is going to get absorbed. In simple terms, we can say that the photo-induced change in terahertz transmission is directly proportional to the photoconductivity of the sample. Delta E being the photo-induced change in terahertz transmission, delta sigma being the photoconductivity. There's another parameter that I want to draw your attention to, and that is the difference in time between the arrival of the photo excitation pulse and the arrival of the terahertz pulse. The photo excitation pulse arises um, and then photo excites the electrons and holes. By the time the terahertz pulse arrives, there has been a little bit of time to allow those electrons and holes to, for instance, recombine or relax to the bottom of the bands, um, depending on the difference in time between photo excitation and the arrival of the terahertz pulse. So this difference in time is what we term the pump probe delay. Okay. And so let's have a look at the two different types of measurements we can make using this method. The first is known as the photoconductivity spectrum. In this case, it's fairly simple. We photo excite and at a certain time later, we um, have our terahertz pulse passing through the sample. And then we measure the entire electric field of the transmitted terahertz pulse. By taking that electric field and comparing it to the um, original electric field, we can then take a Fourier transform of the change in electric field induced by photo excitation, and then mathematically convert that to conductivity. And so in this plot here, we have what we term a terahertz photoconductivity spectrum. It shows photoconductivity as it varies with frequency, frequencies ranging from about 0.1 to 4 terahertz. And this photoconductivity spectrum consists of both a real and an imaginary part, the real part corresponding to a resistive sort of response to the um, photoconductivity and the imaginary part corresponding to a more capacitive or inductive type of response in the photoconductivity. And the other type of measurement is known as the photoconductivity decay. In this instance, we're not actually measuring the entire terahertz pulse. In this instance, we just measure the peak of the terahertz pulse and see how the transmission of that peak changes with time after photo excitation. So perhaps if the terahertz pulse arrives soon after photo excitation, we get a large change in conductivity. If we were to photo excite a little bit earlier in time, we've left the sample a bit longer for electrons and holes to recombine, and we can measure the change in photoconductivity. And if we photo excite a little bit earlier still, the photoconductivity has decayed a little bit more. And in this manner, we can build up what we call a photoconductivity decay curve. So we can plot how the photoconductivity decays with time after photo excitation using this terahertz spectroscopy technique. So to summarize, we have these two types of measurements. At the bottom, we have the photoconductivity spectrum. And at the top, we have the photoconductivity decay. The photoconductivity spectrum is very useful because it allows us to extract parameters such as the charge carry density and the charge carry mobility. 
The decay, on the other hand, allows us to look at the dynamics of charge carrier recombination and trapping. Okay, to give you some examples of the type of data we get, for instance, here we see how the photoconductivity varies for nanowires of different diameters. These are gallium arsenide nanowires, which are characterized by a very large surface recombination velocity. And so we see that in the narrowest diameter nanowires, we get a very rapid decrease in conductivity with time. It's worthwhile to note that this technique um, has sub picosecond temporal resolution. And so the time resolution that we see um, is very, very, very fast. We're able to measure phenomena that occur extremely fast um, within a picosecond, that is. The other type of measurement, the photoconductivity spectrum, we can take an example here, which is the case of gallium arsenide nanowires again. And we see that we've fitted to the data some curves. These curves are actually typical of a plasmon mediated response characterized by a Lorentzian function, as you can see here. And in this function, we have um, the term omega naught, which is the resonant frequency. And we also have the term gamma, which is the scattering rate, um, which is inversely proportional to the scattering time. And we have N, the photo excited carrier density. By fitting our experimental data, we're able to obtain estimates of the resonant frequency, scattering rate, and the photo excited carrier density. What's particularly interesting is that fitting gives us the scattering rate, which is the inverse of the time between scattering events, which we call the scattering time. We can convert that scattering rate directly to um, an electron mobility, provided we're making the assumption that most of the conductivity in these samples is mediated by electrons due to their significantly lower effective mass. Okay, if we were to fit these curves, which we have indeed done, we obtain an electron mobility of about a thousand centimeters squared per volt per second. You'll note that this is typically, this is lower than what you typically observe in a bulk material, which is presumably due to scattering of the electrons at the surface of this nanowire, which does indeed have a very high surface area to volume ratio. In support of this, we have actually extracted mobilities for a number of different nanowire diameters. And you can see that there's a very strong trend that the narrower diameter nanowires, that is the nanowires with 30 nanometer diameters, have the lowest mobilities due to the influence of surface scattering. You can also see that there's a strong influence of charge carrier density as expected. Um, at high charge carrier densities, there's more scattering or carrier carrier scattering, which gives rise to a decrease in mobility. And so we have not only applied this optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy technique to nanowires, we've also applied it to a number of other materials such as graphene, carbon nanotubes, transition metal dichalcogenides, and metal halide perovskites. And I won't have time to talk about many more of these data, um, but I would like to draw your attention to some more recent results um, generated by my excellent former postdoc, Srivuni Carr. Um, Srivuni has measured encapsulated and unencapsulated graphene. The graphene has been encapsulated by um, atomic layer deposition of alumina. And Srivuni, through her optical pump terahertz probe me measurements, has demonstrated that this encapsulation technique actually improves the um, charge carrier mobility significantly by virtue of reducing the scattering rate within these graphene layers. Okay, and finally, the final aspect of my talk is focusing on device physics and engineering and how we can integrate these nanowires into different devices to achieve novel functionality or devices that exceed the state of the art. I firstly want to introduce you to the idea of a quantum multiplexer. This is a quantum multiplexer developed by colleagues in the physics department, and it relies on a etched two-dimensional electron gas that can be selectively depleted by gates. So for instance, if you were to turn on a set of gates, it would deplete the two-dimensional electron gas and then direct 
the voltage from the source down path number one. The two-dimensional electron gas is depleted for every other part, so the voltage um, is not experienced along any of the other paths. No current can flow along any of the other paths. Okay, <clears throat> and so what we've done with this multiplexer, which is developed on a 3.5 platform, is we've integrated nanomaterials into the different channels that can be addressed using our quantum multiplexer. And this is work performed by Dr. Luke Smith, um, who's now a fellow um, in Taiwan. We've integrated a number of different types of materials onto this multiplexer array. And the one that I want to draw attention to is the nanowires. These nanowires were transferred by a transfer printing technique by colleagues at Strathclyde University. And via this technique, we've been able to see some really excellent behavior in these nanowires in terms of their conductance and in terms of the reproducibility of these results. The other device that I would like to draw your attention to is the terahertz communication system. So what we're trying to do here is achieve a terahertz communication system using nanowire-based terahertz modulator units. The modulation scheme that we're hoping to exploit is based on the fact that these nanowires are highly anisotropic and exhibit strong polarization and isotropy. We can demonstrate this here in this experimental data where we've done optical pump terahertz probe measurements of the photoconductivity of aligned nanowires. When these nanowires are photoexcited with a photoexcitation pulse polarized parallel to the nanowire axis, we see a very strong photoconductivity response. We see a large induced photoconductivity that's manifest as a large change in terahertz transmission. On the other hand, if the pump is polarized perpendicular to the nanowires, we see an almost negligible change in conductivity. That is, this pump, which is polarized perpendicular to the nanowires, is not effectively photoexciting the nanowires, and therefore is not generating mobile electrons and holes in the nanowires, which therefore means that there's very little modulation of the transmitted terahertz pulse. And we're exploiting this technique in our polarization sensitive terahertz modulator based on aligned nanowires. My student Chowett has been working on making these nanowires. He embeds them in a layer of perylene C, which is a vapor deposited um, polymer, and then peels that layer off the substrate to leave a layer of nanowires embedded in perylene that's free of the substrate. And indeed, we've seen some excellent results from these layers, multiple layers of nanowires in perylene. We see that this functions as a very reasonably good polarizer and we're getting better and better um, at improving the extinction ratio and the modulation depth of this polarizer. And you can see from this plot here um, that shows how the terahertz transmission varies as a function of pump polarization. And you can see that we see strong modulation where we get good transmission when the pump is polarized perpendicular to the nanowire axis. And we see extinction when the pump is polarized parallel to the nanowire axis. Not only do we see some fairly good modulation depth, but this happens on an ultra fast time scale. So this response completely decays within about five picoseconds of photo excitation, which allows us to rapidly switch our modulator on and off, off simply by photo excitation. We've experimented with um, the number of layers of this polarizer, which, which is really equivalent to the density of nanowires in the polarizer. And as expected, we see um, greater and greater modulation depth as we increase the number of nanowires or increase the number of layers. And so to summarize, um, hopefully I've conveyed how exciting this nanowire field is and will be um, in future and how useful it will be for a number of different types of devices. And I would like to finally thank my research group, um, particularly 
all of my students, um, past and present students, um, postdocs, past and present postdocs, external collaborators, and the funding agencies um, who I'm very, very grateful to for funding this work. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Hannah. Thank you for keeping the time. Very nice. Uh, yes, so there are a couple of questions here in the chat box. Uh, how this technique is different than time resolve photo luminescence? There are a few differences. Um, one of the strengths is that you do not need your sample to be um, luminescent at all. So this technique, optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy, is actually very useful for materials that aren't luminescent or things like graphene. And even for materials that are luminescent, um, things that have low quantum efficiencies, you wanna work out why the quantum efficiency is so low. Um, and you can, you can probe that with optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. It's a room temperature technique. You don't have to cool things down as you often do with photoluminescence. Um, and it also probes, it probes the presence of the electrons and holes, whereas photoluminescence does tend to be very sensitive to the wave function overlap. And so we have seen data where these two, you get different um, insights with the two techniques. So actually the most powerful thing is to use photoluminescence and optical pump terahertz probe measurements, because one gives you information, the, the optical pump terahertz probe measurements gives you information about mobility, um, gives you information about how many carriers you have, whereas the photoluminescence can tell you where the carriers actually are in the sample because of the fact that photoluminescence is sensitive to the wave function overlap. Photoluminescence is sensitive to the minority carriers. Fantastic. I like the answer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the next question is, can this uh, technique be used for uh, studying nonlinear properties of material? It can be, it can be. Um, it's not something that I know a great deal about, but I have colleagues who work on that. So yes, the short answer is yes. And to be honest, the, um, the terahertz pulse itself is generated by nonlinear phenomena. So yes. Nice. Uh, yeah, so right now there is no, no other question. So uh, yeah, okay, so there is one question. Uh, what is the depth of the probe? It really it depends on the conductivity of your sample. Um, and so generally, we try to choose our samples quite carefully so that we, um, we have sufficient transmission through the sample. Um, yes. You, it is possible to also do the sample in a reflection, do the experiment in a reflection geometry. Um, and that means that if you do only probe the surface of your sample, then you can still obtain meaningful data from the surface. Um, it really depends on the sample and the conductivity properties of the sample. Nice. Okay, yeah. Uh, so now to keep up the time, so we can stop here. And uh, let's thank uh, uh, Hannah for giving fantastic talk and interact with us. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much, Hannah. Nice to. Yes, so uh, move on to now our uh, second talk. Uh, so the, the second speaker uh, today is uh, Professor uh, Radha Boya. Uh, she is a FRSC uh, and uh, Kathleen Olenshaw uh, Fellow uh, in the Condensed Matter Physics Group at the uh, University of Manchester. She completed her PhD in 2012 from JNCSR Bangalore. Then she moved to Northwestern University, USA, and then to uh, University of Manchester. Her research interest is on uh, 2D materials, uh, nanocapillaries, and molecular transport in this. Over the years, she has uh, uh, actually uh, grown and developed a lot of things, 
and uh, because of her research activities she has succeeded in obtaining a lot of research uh, fellowships uh, and funds like erc and all that uh, so from her all these research activities she has published over 55 research publications including uh, leading journals like nature and science she has been awarded uh, philip uh, overhaul prize rsc marlow award uh, she has been named as uh, unesco uh, laurel paris uh, uh, women of uh, women in science uk fellow then she has been identified as uh, innovator under 35 years age by MIT Technology Review. She is also a member of a Material Research Society. So uh, welcome, Radha, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, please start your presentation. Thank you, Abhay. Thank you for a very kind introduction. Uh, thanks, for, thanks so much uh, to the, all the organizers and Kiran um, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful session. So today, uh, let me share the screen. Um, are you able to see my screen well and able yes. to hear me well? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so without any further ado, let me get to the topic. Um, so today I'm going to talk about two-dimensional voids and their unusual properties. So uh, as always, uh, you know, the talk ends abruptly, so I don't get enough time to thank everybody. Uh, so I, it's very important I thank everybody who has been, um, uh, has been like, uh, phenomenally mon uh, like, um, uh, contributed to all the parts of uh, various parts of the work that I'll present today. Uh, so uh, on the I, I thank all my collaborators and my group. Um, so let's start with uh, the topic. So uh, as uh, just the speaker before me, Hana, uh, introduced lots of 1D and 2D materials. Uh, I hope you all know what is a 2D material. Uh, so material which is uh, one atom to a few atoms thick and confined and has um, and is confined in one dimension. So we all know what 2D materials are. Yeah. So we take a layer crystal and uh, we can. Uh, separate layers uh, which are bound by weak Van der Waals forces using as a simple method as a scotch tape. So this is well known. And this uh, was even awarded Nobel Prize, right? So uh, Manchester is the birthplace of all these discoveries. Uh, that's where I'm talking to you uh, today from, yeah? So what I'm going to talk about is not uh, 2D materials, but using 2D materials, uh, 2D crystals to make 2D capillaries. So what if we could uh, remove these 2D layers uh, to create a void which runs through the center of the 2D crystal. And this void is equal to the height of the number of layers removed. Yeah, so uh, so let's say in this particular 2D crystal, uh, which is graphite, um, the removal of two layers of graphene uh, leads to a void which is uh, of the thickness of two graphene layers. So what I'm interested in is this 2D empty space uh, in which we can uh, study the molecular transport. And why am I interested in studying molecular transport in such confined spaces? So, well, there are, there are several examples uh, in nature, uh, which are uh, called, uh, which, are, which have such confined dimensions, uh, uh, where the confined space uh, can only fit uh, at max one molecule uh, at a time. Yeah, the most prominent example here, uh, uh, which was also again a Nobel Prize uh, worth the discovery, the structure of this uh, protein channel, uh, which is aquaporin protein channel, uh, is shown here. So it uh, regulates uh, the water flow uh, in and out of the cell um, uh, by uh, like in and out of the flow, uh, in and out of the cell uh, are one molecule at a time, yeah? So the construction here, uh, the narrowest construction here is, uh, is sufficient only to fit one mo water molecule, which is only few angstroms, yeah? And on the other hand, uh, technologically, there is a lot of interest in um, uh, using small pores um, or small capillaries for filtration, uh, be it industrial separations, uh, like pharmaceutical small molecule separations or uh, desalination. So there are um, lots of mechanisms, me uh, like fundamental mechanisms behind such uh, filtration, uh, which are not understood yet. So I'm interested uh, in these particular two dimensional channels. Are these the only ones uh, no, there are several systems and I have categorized them here based on the dimensionality. Uh, so of uh, over the last decade uh, two, there have been several systems emerging both with the advanced, uh, um, advanced uh, both in terms of materials as well as characterization techniques and uh, fabrication methods improved, uh, uh, which led to lots of new systems. So we, we, one can make a zero dimensional pores, uh, which is uh, only a few atoms thick. 
or can grow them uh, from bottom up methods or uh, one can uh, use nanotubes as uh, conduits uh, for flow or two dimensional laminates um, wherein the stack the, the sheets are stacked on top of each other to um, lead to the cavities which can um, which can lead to the which can which can confine the molecules just uh, give me one second please yeah. sorry about the sorry about the disturbance so today what we are going to discuss it is two uh, is about two systems uh, i'll talk about zero dimensional pores and two dimensional um, capillaries so and how are these capillaries made there are principal there are two principal approaches, just like in nature. So one can use top-down methods, wherein uh, one can take an existing material and carve out, um, carve out unnecessary bits to create the uh, create the desired uh, capillary, or uh, one can also build it piece by piece. Yeah, so assembling uh, piece by piece to create to uh, result in the end uh, capillary. So uh, an example for both methods, uh, for instance, uh, by lithography, we can carve out micro nano um, angstrom channels. Are by in bottom of methods you can grow the material and use it as a conduit. Uh, for example, here a nanotube is shown. Both methods have their own limitations. Uh, so, by for instance, by carving out, it's very difficult to reach, reach um, atomic level or angstrom level precision. Mm. On the say on the uh, on, on the other hand, with the bottom of methods, the the diameter control or the integration capabilities are more difficult. Suppose you grow a lots of like uh, materials, uh, all each and in each material may not be uh, each nanotube, let's say, uh, may not be of the same diameter, and there may be leaks when we integrate it into a full circuit. So what um, what I chose is uh, something uh, uh, which is a best of both. So um, it's a it's a combination of both top down and bottom up methods. So how do we make two D capillaries? Is um, by assembling uh, like layer by layer, it's almost like atomic Lego, uh, wherein you put layers on top of each other. So it, it ha it's like a three layer sandwich. Yeah, so you, you have a bottom layer, which is a bottom 2D crystal and a spacer layer, uh, which is the most important bit. Yeah, so this, this is the meat of the uh, capillary. So basically you have this uh, spacer, which has already pre-structured cavities made by lithography, which is top down method. And then you close this um, capillary or cavity. Uh, you close this uh, structured cavity by uh, using another top crystal. So I've deliberately put these three layers in three different colors because you have a choice to uh, choose them. Like you can, they need not be all of same material. So this is an example image of one such uh, 2D capillary, where in the middle space, uh, the empty space here is only two atoms uh, thick. Which is the which is the bright white space which runs across this, and you can see uh, that it's a very wide uh, capillary for its small height. Yeah, so its aspect ratio is quite uh, huge. So for this capillary to stay open and to stay uh, straight, uh, the top to stay straight, we need to uh, take make sure that the top crystal is of sufficient mechanical rigidity. So we can take a very thick two D crystal so that it doesn't flop and uh, you know it doesn't. Uh, uh, run uh, run through the it doesn't collapse and block the channel. Also, we can tune the height of this top to intentionally, deliberately, you know, sag into the channel, and we can use it for uh, specific applications as well. So, <clears throat> and we can uh, tune this height of the capillary ranging from few atoms to few nanometers or few tens of nanometers, and we can make multiple of them parallelly. So it's it's, it's a truly a combination of both lithographic methods and assembling a one layer on top of the other. And these layers are held by uh, no glue. They just have Van der Waals forces in between them. So that's the weakest force which is uh, holding them. And just like how the 2D crystals, uh, how, how the pristine 2D crystals uh, have. So this is uh, another, uh, this is uh, just to show that we can actually make um, graphite. We can use two different 2D crystals, which are all stable in air. So far we have been restricted to we have restricted ourselves to use the materials which are stable in air. Uh, we can use uh, we can use like graphite, molysulfide, he uh, hexagonal boronitride, mica, for instance, or tungsten sulfide. So we can use all these materials to construct uh, either super hydro like either hydrophobic, hydrophilic, or con conducting insulating walls. So we can program uh, the capillaries. So I've sh I've shown you that we can make this capillary, and I've shown you examples of these images of this capillary. Um, it's um, it's also important that we we make them in a device architecture where we can measure 
uh, flows or properties of materials through when they are going passing through these capillaries. So for this, we need a device architecture, uh, which is uh, robust and at the same time uh, easy to manipulate. So what we do here is a silicon nitride membrane, which is on a freestanding silicon, which is on a silicon, which is freestanding on a silicon substrate. So on this silicon nitride membrane, we assemble these three layer sandwich. This is the bottom spacer layer, which can be designated to have how many ever channels we want. And then the the pre uh, the edge there is a hole micro hole on the silicon nitride which is etched through these two layers the bottom and the spacer and the this hole is now covered by the top uh, crystal so now what we have is a three layer uh, sandwich which is on top of this wafer and the entry and the exit of the uh, exit of this capillary are on both sides of the uh, wafer yeah the capillaries are on the sides uh, if you may see and the length uh, of the capillary is starting from here to the end of this uh, end of this crystal. So this is how a real optical image looks like. The silicon nitride membrane is the one which is seen in green color, and the three layers are, are shown here. Only obviously you can see the top crystal because that's the only thing which is thick. Other ones are quite thin, so I've just contoured them for uh, visibility. So we can now we have a device which we can simply mount um, uh, between two chambers and measured flows. Yeah, so we can simply and all this uh, this big silicon this silicon piece has uh, all these uh, channels right in the center. Yeah. So now, uh, so let's go to the properties that we have measured. So for the sake of time, I wouldn't be covering all the things that we have measured. So we will be focusing on specific uh, topics. But I'd like to just showcase uh, what all possibilities exist. So we can we have uh, studied gas, uh, water, and ion flows uh, primarily through these uh, capillaries. And um, uh, and varying the lengths and uh, heights of capillaries uh, that is confinement. And uh, let's stick to gas flows and a bit of ion flows. Um, so gas flows. So this is um, uh, this is a chip which can be mounted uh, in a, in like in variety of measurements. This is the main key reason why we were able to do so many different types of measurements. The device architecture is the key. So for gas measurements, um, I should uh, say this came about like we didn't in, intend to study the gas flows in the beginning. So it was mainly a check uh, because we make these capillaries. How do we know that these capillaries do uh, exist? And uh, you know how do we know that these are open? So this was uh, intended originally when I started this work, it was intended as a check, uh, as a checkpoint to know whether the capillaries are good and uh, not clogged with you know, all the contamination. So what, uh, what we do is uh, simply take this uh, wafer and uh, mount it in a vacuum chamber uh, wherein, uh, wherein we can release the gas, uh, let's say an inert, inert gas like helium on one side of the chip. And then uh, if the gas flows through the capillaries because everywhere else it is sealed, there is no other way for the gas to escape except uh, through, the, through the capillary. If it reaches the other end, we can detect it with the mass spectrometer. So that is a proof that there is capillary and that it is open, yeah? So initially, uh, as, as you can see here, the leak rate, that is the detection, uh, whatever is done in the mass spectrometer is on the y-axis. If there is no uh, capillary, if there's just a three layer sandwich, but without any structured cavities, you just simply get no leak. And when there are capillaries, you get tend to see the certain flow, yeah? So, so this is a, uh, th this is the base, base method, what we will use in all through the uh, measurements. And um, so, um, so basically, from this, uh, from these curves, we can take the slope and we can quantify the flow. What is the flow through a particular device? So over the lockdown, we had uh, nothing to do, no experiments to do because uh, we we were all locked down, locked out of the labs. So this is a compilation of um, the such uh, take a particular device uh, when a device is made, we measure it, right? And let's say we didn't use it, we store it, and we take out after let's say 100 days. Again, we measure it before we take it to measurements. Um, so that li like that we had a series of measurements over about three, three to four years <clears throat> because there were some devices which were made like long time ago, but they were still working. So we thought, why not we compile and uh, see how is the stability, long-term stability. To our surprise, we can see uh, devices can be stable up to about three years as uh, logged here. Uh, so these are very tiny capillaries, but they can stay open uh, under right conditions uh, when they are stored in water or charcoal. They can stay open up to three years. 
and uh, surprisingly we saw that the thin layer capillaries which are only like uh, one nanometers or less they were more stable than the thick capillaries like 10 nanometer capillary for instance it, it, the the amount of the leak through the 10 layer uh, 10 nanometers that above capillary they were uh, quite uh, reduced after a few days of storage so so uh, that was a short uh, detour so let me get to the main gist of what actually uh, we measured through the gas flows so let's take one capillary which is uh, let's say of the thickness of five layers they have they have been like five layers removed uh, through this uh, capillary and now these walls of the capillary can be graphite so the graphite uh, uh, walls are uh, molysulfide walls so these three curves show graphite walled capillary hexagonal boronitrate walled capillary mos2 walled capillary while hbn and graphite have similar flows uh, mos2 is quite reduced flow and this uh, solid line is the theoretically estimated. There is a, a gas flow equation, uh, which is uh, designed by Nudsen um, over a hundred years ago. So this uh, explains for different geometries, uh, for a circular aperture or for a tube, you know, idealistic systems, how, um, how the gas flow should be based on like uh, uh, the transmission coefficient, which depends on the height of the pipe, length of the pipe, width of the pipe. So there is a defined equation. So we just simply try to match so molysulfide comes a bit closer to the theoretical estimation, whereas uh, HBN and graphite are much higher flows, about two orders. So and we further try to understand this. So for uh, graphite and molysulfide, we varied the length of the capillary. We keep the height and the width the same, but we just varied the length of the capillary. Uh, and we see that uh, for molysulfide, it is inversely proportional to the length, which is according to the Nelson equation. Whereas for graphite, is it, it was independent of the length within the lengths we, we have tested. So we have to go back to Nudsen assumptions. Basically, Nudsen assumption is uh, all the surfaces are rough. So the assumption, basic assumption is diffuse scattering. As the molecule enters the pipe, it will undergo multiple scattering events before it exits. So there is a loss of momentum uh, as the molecule flows. So this is the basic assumption. Perhaps uh, for graphene and boronitrate, they are too smooth uh, compared to even the de Broglie wavelength. Uh, if you take even the quantum uh, quantum uh, phenomena, so they are perhaps too smooth for the multiple scattering events. So there is a, a one way we can explain the high flows and the independence of length. That is by specular scattering. As a molecule enters and exits, it just there is no loss of momentum. So this this is one way we can explain our um, observations here. And uh, uh, so to support our um, theory, so support our model. So we have also shown here um, electron uh, contours, density contours. So basically we can see that this red line is a thermal exclusion where basically you, what you are seeing here is um, uh, carbon atoms, uh, how the electron density is around them. Yeah, and in this case, molysulfide atoms, how the electron density is around. Them. So you can see automatically the electron density is not as smooth for molysulfide. Yeah, there is a about one angstrom protrusion because the sulfur is standing up. So this protrusion is enough uh, to make it rough enough to have the diffuse scattering. Whereas for the graphene and hexagonal boronitrate, it's completely flat um, uh, considering the, the helium molecule that we have taken. Uh, even uh, the de Broglie wavelength of it is about 0.5 angstroms. So there are the smoothness of these uh, uh, materials is enabling uh, ballistic, ballistic transport. And we have even tried to test uh, with being like um, uh, isotopes like hydrogen and deuterium, uh, which have same, um, uh, <clears throat> which have a different de Broglie wavelength, right? But they, they're both hydrogen, and we can see the difference between hydrogen and deuterium uh, based on their, uh, uh, based on the scattering. Yeah. So, so just to be short, um, let me move on. So basically, a conclusion from this study is, uh, automatically flat surfaces enable specular reflection. And not all atomically surface, uh, flat surfaces are equally flat. Some are more flatter than the others. And we are able to probe this phenomena at very fine uh, level. So um, now we have based all of this based on its an equation. But there can be a question whether this 100-year-old equation, is it even valid for such systems? So with this quest, uh, we started uh, this uh, study using the zero-dimensional apertures, which are the most simple than the tubes. So let's take a pore, uh, which is which is made by create by removing the atoms. So these samples were made um, by Professor Maria Dundich Group, so who is an expert in uh, creating such uh, you know uh, atomic scale apertures. 
uh, from Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. So Priyanka and Paul, they grow these samples of tungsten sulfide and knock out uh, tungsten atoms uh, by using focused ion beam. And uh, what we did was to take such sample, which is again on our same type of architecture, device architecture, silicon nitride membrane, and use our setup to measure the helium gas flows. So pristine tungsten sulfide, which has no atomic, upper, uh, no atomic apertures, has no flow, which is our good control. And the hole, which uh, is a simple hole, a bare hole, uh, the flux is very, very high. So when you covered with the tungsten sulfide, the complete uh, loss of the flux. And now when we take the samples, which have the atomic apertures, we can see definite flows. So this is the equation, uh, the same Nutzen equation for the um, aperture, which is a simple pore. And the one previously was for a tube, yeah? So uh, it should be simply scaling with the area of the aperture. And uh, so uh, the area of the aperture can be controlled. Like um, we know like um, uh, from, the, from the dosage uh, that you can create, uh, you can actually knock out uh, one tungsten atom or two tungsten atoms or three tungsten atoms. So these are the TM, transmission electron microscopy images of such uh, of such pores and these are the distribution of uh, uh, like for instance um, if if we create on a on a sample plaster scan and what are the kind of distributions so how many one tungsten pores are there two tungsten pores are there three tungsten pores so this, this just means one tungsten is removed two are removed three are removed that's how the terminology is so predominantly they are one tungsten pores are two tungsten pores and there are very few three tungsten pores so now we have to account for this, right? Because this is not one type of force. There are three types of force. So we can incorporate this into our theoretical estimate because our idea is to compare the experimental flux with the Knudsen equation to see actually if the Knudsen equation is still valid for these systems. So we did incorporate the distribution of the force. That is the, so from these uh, previous curves, so basically the slope was taken, which is an indicative of the quantitative indicative of quantitative value of the flux. And these are three different samples as a repeat, which have different densities of the pores. Yeah, some one of them has 400 defects, another one has 2000, 1000 defects. So, so now we try to compare these samples, experimental flux with the uh, theoretically estimated flux. So as you can see within the experimental error, there is a very close match between these two bars, the experimental and the theoretical uh, bars. So <clears throat> what we can conclude from here is an aperture, which is just about the size of the helium molecule. Helium molecule is 2.6. And here we have a pore of three angstroms or three, three to four angstroms, depending on whether it is one tungsten or three tungsten, or one tungsten or two tungsten. So about the size of the pore, the molecule, uh, the, uh, the molecule size of the uh, pore still obeys Nersen equation, yeah, for the simplest case of the aperture. So that's our conclusion. Uh, when there are no energy barriers, that means the molecule can favorably fit in. If, if the pore becomes even smaller than the molecule, then there may be higher energy barrier, and that would be an exponential term. But as long as the molecule fits in the pore, there is no energy barrier, it, the equation is still valid. So this was a first experimental proof, I would say, to validate the equation uh, quantitatively. And not only that, uh, because these pores are quite small, it is very difficult to know when uh, we do the when one does an experiment of creating these pores. When when you fabricate, it's difficult to know whether these pores exist on all through the sample or not. So we can see this as an easy check because uh, you can do an easy experiment of instead of going with the TM and observing everywhere because you can't actually see scan the whole sample, right? But here we can simply use a gas flow to check uh, whether the estimated number of pores are created or not. Yeah, so it's a simple quantitative check. So um, I hope I have uh, <laughs> enough time to cover this second topic, which is liquid flows. Um, in the Here only I will focus on two-dimensional slits. So uh, uh, we, we have studied water flows and uh, uh, salt water ionic flows through the uh, slits through these uh, capillaries, uh, 2D capillaries. So using a capillary which has only one graphene layer removed, which is uh, of the height of now 3.4 angstroms, or four angstroms to be uh, precise, because there is, there is always a possibility that it's not exactly 3.4. So we have tried to measure the water flow. Uh, we, we used a simple microgravimetry wherein we monitor, we seal a water chamber with our, uh, with our device and monitor the weight loss. 
So we can see there is a definite weight loss as the water evaporates. The water has to go through the capillary and there is a definite weight loss. And this gives us a quantitative measure of what is the water flux through these uh, capillaries. <clears throat> and uh, so now we want to study the ion flows through these. So we know that water definitely flows. What if we put the ions along with the water? So let's take salt water like sodium chloride, potassium chloride. So let's measure the ion flows through these capillaries to see if we can uh, exclude, um, you know, the, to see the concept of exclusion. Uh, so as the ion size increases relative to the pipe, can we, can we see a abrupt exclusion or is there a relation between the size of the ion and the size of the pipe? So we started with the slightly larger pipes, 6.7. Rather than one layer, we use two layers because that's the size of the uh, ions. So now we are matching the size of the ion and the pipe. And this is how uh, this is the hydrated diameter on this axis is the size of this ion. So as we move from potassium to aluminum, we are increasing the size of this uh, ion. And there is a definitely mobility decrease. So in the on the left side, you can see the mobility is almost uh, equal to the bulk as if it was free, not confined. And on the, on the aluminum side, we can see the bulk mobility is higher than the confined. So, um, so basically, we don't see any exclusion yet. We can see that there is a mobility decrease, but uh, it doesn't exclude completely. That means the ion is able to squeeze through, like uh, you are actually squeezing through. It's, it's not, it can reconfigure its water shells, uh, which are surrounding this hard ion core, and it can still squeeze through. And interestingly, we can also see that uh, depending on the sign of the ion, whether it is a positive ion or a negative ion, they don't behave the same. So if it is a positive ion, let's take this particular example, even though positive ion is not, a, uh, there is no reduction in mobility, negative ion has a reduction in mobility. That's uh, again, certainly due to the uh, water molecular arrangements around a negative charge and positive charge are not the same. So, so since we don't have exclusion, now let's get back to the, uh, point of exclusion, at what point can we achieve exclusion? Yeah. So basically, uh, when we reduce um, the height even further, yeah. So this is, again, I should point out uh, that uh, these are the sizes of the heights of the capillaries, which are very close to aquaporins constrictions, wherein there is only possibility to fit one water molecule. So water does flow through, and there is no way ions can fit in, in this very uh, small dimension of the pipe. Not, at, uh, not without significant energy barriers. So uh, there is a significant energy barrier. So we can see the exclusion of most of the ions except uh, proton, yeah? So, uh, so now what, uh, what my colleague Gopi did here is uh, basically why, to study why, why, why we have proton uh, conduction, whether, uh, whereas all other ions are excluded. So the main mechanism here is the protons do not move as hydrated ions. They instead jump from one molecule to the other, um, like uh, breaking and making the hydrogen bonds. So, and evidence of this is uh, when we compare the bulk conductivity of HCl through our monolayer channels, it is not equal. So it is actually lower. It's about a about few times to one order lower in the uh, monolayer. Although it is conducting, it is not necessarily cond as conducting as bulk. So what we see here is, a is a two-dimensional capillary, and there is only possibility to, to fit one layer of water with no neighbors above or below. So they have to um, bond between themselves in the same layer rather than three-dimensional hydrogen bond. And we can calculate the diffusion coefficient uh, of the proton from the two-dimensional water that we have. And the three-dimensional water is well known, uh, the diffusion coefficient. So if we compare the diffusion coefficients of uh, one day water, which again is reported with nanotubes, uh, proton uh, diffusion coefficients, we can see that the two-dimensional form has the lowest, that is our measured diffusion coefficient is the lowest. 1D has the highest uh, and the 3D has the in, in between. So probably because the proton hops from one molecule to the other, uh, it has always a free site in the case of 1D, or there are enough free sites in 3D, whereas in 2D, there are not enough free sites for to hop, so which may explain the slower diffusion coefficient. So, to conclude, uh, we have uh, made, uh, we have uh, successfully demonstrated angstrofluidic channels, uh, which can be a very nice platform for uh, studying fundamental science of both water and ions, ionic transport. And uh, I did not cover, but uh, I'd like to just point out these studies 
um, wherein we could uh, mimic um, mimic uh, voltage gating, which is known, uh, which is well known in uh, uh, biological ion channels. So, <clears throat> recent even uh, Nobel Prize this year was awarded to mechanosensitive ion channels, wherein uh, if we have sensing touch, that's because uh, there is a trigger in the ion channel which releases um, pulses. Yeah. So these ion channels are sensitive to the touch. So we mimic these uh, in our uh, angstrom 2D channels using pressure. So instead of driving, like we simply do electrochemical measurement wherein we, we don't apply voltage, but we apply pressure to uh, drive the ions. So we can, uh, we can do the pressure sensitive uh, currents. We can measure the pressure sensitive currents and we can also tune them by applying additional voltage. It's like a fluidic transistor uh, wherein your gate is voltage, but source strain is by pressure. So we could demonstrate this fluidic transistor and we could also put uh, molecules beyond like uh, polymers, like uh, biopolymers like DNA uh, through these uh, uh, through these fluid slits to have interesting physics, which uh, uh, which I just point out. If you're interested, you can read further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Radha. Fantastic talk. And again, thanks me thank for keeping the time. So we have, uh, one question here uh, is that uh, uh, what is actually the sensitivity of the measurement of the gas flow? Yes, um, the sensitivity of the measurement is um, so we uh, when we have to again this is a commercially available leak detector. So when we have to measure, let me go to the point where yeah yes. So um, maybe I can, uh, there is a bar here, which uh, is indicative of the leakage limit, yeah? So when we have a pristine silicon nitride membrane or like pristine WS2 without any pores, we are not seeing any flow, that is the detection limit, yeah? So this limit is about, um, I would say what we are measuring is um, 10 raised to minus 13. This is about few orders lower. So if you have like probably one or two pores, maybe we can't measure. There are hundreds of pores in this particular system. Um, so this is a commercial available leak detector. All these leak de these kind of leak detectors are used everywhere to check the leaks. If you have a vacuum system, ever you have used a deposition system or a large XPS system, you know, there uh, if there is any leak, uh, they want to check with this leak detector. So same leak, leak detector we are using to measure. So these are the sensitive, most sensitive leak detectors. So, but this must be vacuum based, right? Yes, it is all vacuum based. So you have you have to mount your sample in a vacuum chamber. So uh, the inlet where you introduce your gas, let's say you have two chambers, top and below. Below is at very high vacuum, like uh, minus six uh, millibar. At the top, it can be ambient, like, okay, slightly lower than ambient, like uh, 0.1 to one millibar. Right. Right. Yeah, and, but when we release the gas, it goes to 200, 300 millibar. You can go up to one bar. So you can actually go on the top of the sample uh, two up to one bar, which is atmosphere. Right. Um, there are no other questions. Attendees, you can post the uh, questions here. So the, let me ask one question from my side, actually, as there are a lot of uh, young researchers are there. So can you please share with us uh, that how much time it is required to make one sample of this kind and what is the time for the total measurement? Yes, of course. So obviously, um, these are very difficult samples to make. Uh, these um, the apertures are um, again uh, something which I am not making. But the two D slits um, are you, you have to find the crystals first of all. All these are made by a mechanical exfoliation, right? So you simply take a scotch tape and peel off the crystals and then find them. And um, I have a picture where I can show the exfoliation and the thing. Yes. So what what we basically do is uh, we make crystals and then lift them with a polymer layer. And then uh, uh, this polymer layer with the crystal is carefully seen under a microscope and aligned it. Uh, so basically you are dealing with this process three times. You are putting three layers, right? So basically two transfers and three different crystals and EVM lithography to create these patterns, to create the channels. So all of this would take, if one is trained well enough to do all the techniques, um, so they may do it into uh, one to one and a half week. Uh, for a batch of devices and each batch can be made like six to seven devices depending on the person's uh, patience and you know endurance so 
uh, one can also make 10 devices we had ali you know ali was very very good he was making like almost uh, 10 devices per batch so depending on the endurance of the person so <laughs> so i used to make personally i used to make 8, eight to 9 6 to 8 i would say 6 to 8 was my target in a batch and uh, in each batch there may be 50% to 60% yield in the sense um, because we we do this checks of uh, heat gas leak to make sure that the samples are working there can be there can be some problems of clogging you know if the if we didn't take care about this polymer cleaning well enough when we transfer it can clog so there is 50 to 60% yield in each batch so but if you are not trained it may take a long time but otherwise it would be one to one and half week you can get five to the measurements the assay for the measure- measurements measurements i would say gas flows are pretty quick you mount the sample you will know right away um, whether it leaks or not but uh, for the ion measurements we need to wet the channels first because it's difficult to enter you know the liquids to enter uh, the thing so it takes few hours of cycling voltage um, so we first do uh, voltage cycling to make sure we wet the channels because these are these are almost very very tiny right so for the ions are solutions of water to enter we wet it for overnight uh, or so uh, with the lower surface tension liquids like uh, instead of putting directly water we put mixtures of ipa and water so that uh, the alcohol will reduce the surface tension and it can make the water enter but once it wets then we can do our measurements so that's that's like a day of cycling and then we can do all the measurements nice yeah yeah and there was okay. also some uh, chat questions i think uh hana hana says uh, gold catalyst we can easily control the diameter uh, yeah i, no, I agree no that was for her oh, somebody asked question okay, her. okay 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 and okay okay yeah okay okay that's right. fine yeah so yes yeah okay thank you then uh, thank you for joining yeah. today thank you so much thank you yes Yes, so uh, we have our third speaker here, and uh, uh, hello, Aditya. Yeah, hi, Abhay. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so uh, Aditya uh, is currently an uh, assistant professor and uh, holds Pratiksha Young Investigator Chair at uh, Sense IIC Bangalore. since 2019 he obtained his uh, masters from university of manchester uh, in 2011 and phd from university of cambridge in 2015 then he was postdoc at uh, university of cambridge then uh, university of california at berkeley and uh, at the end that university of oxford his research interests are perovskites uh, thin films uh polymers leds and solar cells uh out of all this uh, his research experience he has published numerous like about uh, 80 research publications many of them are in nature science nature materials advanced materials etc he has received uh, uh, several awards in recent time uh, one of the recent one is uh, early career scientist award for asia specific region by international science council uh, also recently he has been uh, uh, identified as one of the highly citing researcher by clara white analytic to web of science he is a member of uh, uh, many societies like iop uk and inias in india the what i find uh interesting is that apart from his busy research activities he is uh, very active in many outreach programs he visit uh, several small villages in india and uh, interact with a lot of kids recently he has been working on one interesting concept called the take lab science to streets and a lot of uh, global media attention it is received to this concept so uh, let's invite uh, aditya uh, uh, to share your uh, experience on this passive and uh, dynamic defects uh, in perovskite yeah hello everyone uh, if my connection breaks please apologize because uh, there is some issues with the internet right now 
So, okay, thanks Abhay for the kind introduction and I'm glad for the organizers to having me here on board to give this talk. Uh, today I'll be talking a bit about perovskites and some interesting things about perovskite uh, in terms of defects. Like there are passive and dynamic defects and how do they appear and what are the things that you can work around with those defects. Uh, so I have recently joined ISC Bangalore like last year before pandemic. So it's just a early beginning, you can say. And uh, my group is still expanding. So just to give everyone a brief perspective about uh, what this place is about, I'll show you a few slides on that. Okay. Yeah, this moves. So this is the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering. It's a national uh, hub for all nanoscience and nanoengineering related activities. And uh, any user from India or outside can actually have access to this facility. Uh, that's how the building is set up to work as. Uh, this facility actually contains two parts. One is a nano fabrication facility, which is a 14,000 square feet clean room, which contains both class 100 and class 1000 areas. And it also contains a 7,000 square feet semi clean room, which is for nano characterization. So it's basically an all-in-one hub to do both fabrication and characterization. And uh, below are the different areas which people work on. And we actually engage quite a lot with industries. So these are all the uh, national and international companies which partner with us in uh, taking forward uh, a lot of industry-oriented research. The recent one being applied materials, which I've just added here. Going further, like these are the different areas of research which we work on. Uh, it ranges from bio to agriculture to photonics to power. And my research area is optoelectronics. So that sort of fits in between different areas here. So going to the topic for today, uh, well, Perovskite semiconductors, I think quite a few of you might have heard of it or people who have not heard of it. I would actually say that it's just a class of semiconductor like you know of. So let's say silicon or gallium arsenide, it's similar to those. The only exception being that it is a solution process semiconductor. It's not made using molecular beam epitax. Why it is so attractive is because it has a lot of crazy properties which people find very interesting and they enable very efficient optoelectronic applications. So one sort of wonders whether it's an ideal semiconductor, which one always keeps finding as such. So I'll run you through what it looks like and all. So it's basically a crystal structure. The one of the prime members of this family of perovskites is having a crystal structure which is of ABX3 form. So it's like a, a crystal structure which I'm showing you here. One example is methyl ammonium lead iodide. So where your A is a monovalent cation, methyl ammonium, B is a divalent metal atom lead, and X is a halogen, which is either iodine in this case, but they can be other halogens as well. Metals can be other divalent metals and cations can be other monovalent cations, which fit in this tetragonal structure over here. Now, uh, there are two major kinds of perovskite, which optoelectronics people work on. There are other kinds as well, but these are the two major ones. Just pictorially, you can see the basic difference that if you see the 3D structure, you have the cation fit inside the lead iodide octahedral sheets, and uh, that forms the 3D structure of the lead iodide octahedra in all three directions. But if you talk about having a longer cation, then that ends up separating these lead iodide sheets into individual layers. And this forms the 2D perovskite. And uh, so forming such a structure is actually a natural phenomena. So you, if you remember, recollect the last question that Abhay asked, how long it takes for uh, Radha to make her samples. So she said quite long and it takes quite a lot of efforts. But if you ask me the same question, how long it takes to make a 2D perovskite, it probably takes minutes. So that's how easy it is because it naturally forms into this structure, okay? The only difference between these two structures is the size of this red cation. 
If it's smaller, it forms a 3D structure. If it is larger, then you basically form a natural 2D structure, multiple quantum well structure. Uh, then <coughs> there are certain aspects which sort of attract you towards this field. And I have sort of enlisted in this one slide uh, as many as I can. So one particular aspect which is quite attractive is the high absorption coefficient. And uh, that is similar to what you find in uh, single crystal gallium arsenides or all the direct band gap semiconductors, which you can imagine, which have very good applications. And uh, the main point uh, behind the crazy uh, scientist's attention for this field is because of its uh, performance in solar cells. So in solar cells, the first sort of solar cell, which was reported with decent efficiency was in 2012. So it was around nine years ago and uh, they reported 10% power conversion efficiency. And within nine year time span, which is a quite a short time span in scientific arena, this efficiencies have reached beyond 24%. And to give you a context, this 24% is something which you get out of a single crystal silicon solar panel, okay? And the this is not the only thing that is attractive about perovskites. The other thing that is attractive is the light emission part. So it's not just a current producing aspect, it's light emission. So in light emission, you can actually achieve photoluminescence quantum yields of greater than 70% in nominal solid thin films. And in uh, quantum dots kind of architectures, you can actually achieve almost close to 100% quantum yield. Okay. And that is something which is used to make optical applications like uh, lasers and LEDs. So one such laser is laser application is shown here and LEDs you can see here as well, just depicting the devices. And uh, the disorder aspect for this material is quite uh, interesting because this material is actually made at very low temperatures of 100 degrees and it's made using a very primitive process like solution processing. So you just simply make a solution and spin coat and you anneal it at 100 degrees, you get your, your perovskite semiconductor. And such a simple process actually gives you very good efficiency numbers for solar cells, for LEDs. So what is the main uh, point which enables this. So one such aspect is disorder. And what people find is despite being polycrystalline, the disorder in this material is extremely low. So that is one aspect which people are still trying to figure out why. Because once you understand that, you can actually design new kind of semiconductors. The other aspect is the ease with which you can tune the band gap. Uh, I'll explain this point to you in a bit. Uh, but the one more aspect which comes along is the photon recycling bit, which actually is a concept where you recycle the unused photons in your solar cell, which then pushes up your efficiency. Okay. Uh, probably this is a certain other aspect you can read about it, come to know. The references are given below. So going further, I'll talk about uh, passive disorder and uh, what's the role of it and all. So uh, recently one such work we have done and what we find is that if you take a thin film perovskite semiconductor and then you basically look at the surface defects, there are certain surface defects on the surface and you basically try and passivate those defects uh, by growing another epi layer on the top. So this is a large band gap perovskite layer. So you just grow a mono layer of a perovskite on top of this small band gap perovskite, that basically, basically enables you to get lower disorder. So if you look at the bottom right graph here, this is what is showing you that disorder. So you see that the control sample, which doesn't have any defect passivation on the surface, you can see the disorder measured in terms of Urbach energy is around 16 milli electron volts. And the way you measure this disorder is you measure the absorption in a sensitive way. And then you calculate the inverse slope of this absorption edge, which is called an Urbach tail. And that inverse slope actually gives you the Urbach energy, or I call it as a disorder value. Okay. So the sample which is not passivated gives you 16 MeV disorder. And the sample which is passivated with this large band gap monolayer on the top gives you a disorder of around 14 MeV. Okay. To give you a context, lower the disorder in the Urbach energy terms, lower the uh, 
uh, what do you say, energy loss in your solar cells. Okay, and I'll show you how that works in the next slide. But uh, this is what is the passive disorder like. Okay, so if you see here, what you observe is that if you make such a solar cell where you have on one hand you see a control device, on the other hand you passivate the surface with this large band gap epilayer grown on the top. What you see is that the device voltages, you look at this bottom right graph, actually increase. So this is one of the consequences of uh, sort of uh, getting rid of the passive disorder. So you see that the voltages go up, you see the same in the IV curves here. Not only that, you basically see that the voltages are stable. So if you see that if I operate the solar cell constantly for a longer time, you see that the passivated device has a steady voltage, which is at around 1.2 volts, whereas the control device maintains the same at 1.1 volts. And we also see that the efficiencies over time actually remain the same. So this is a 21% device uh, approximately. Uh, for a passivated device and it remains the same, whereas the unpassivated device actually sees an efficiency drop over time. Uh, so this is how it works. Now, this is about pa a passive disorder. There's not a lot of, uh, to talk about on the passive disorder front. The more interesting front that I would talk about today is on the dynamic disorder front. So that is what I'll go into the next topic. But before going into that, I'll talk a bit about the band gap tunability in the perovskites. Uh, so in perovskites, the, the cool thing is that you basically have a very good handle on tuning the band gap by simply changing one of the elements. Okay. Uh, so one such element that you can change while tuning the band gap is the halogen. Okay. So here you can see this is a methyl ammonium lead iodine bromine based perovskite. So your halogen X is comprised of both iodine and bromine mixture. Okay, so you can go all the way from a pure iodine based perovskite to a mixture of iodine bromine to a pure bromine based perovskite. Okay, simply by changing the uh, precursor composition that you add into your solution. Okay, so this is what your absorption curves would look like. So if you take the iodine content, reciprocally you can see, you can calculate the bromine content according to this. So what you see is that if you have 100% iodine based perovskite, the band gaps are around 1.5 EV. And as you increase bromine and reduce iodine, the band gap slowly blue shift and then you achieve a largest possible band gap for the bromine based perovskite. But one interesting thing that you observe while you do this and make solar cells out of these materials is that what you should expect from these materials is that as you increase the band gap, your voltage that you get out of your solar cell should also increase. And similarly, what would happen is your current would decrease. Okay. So what we see is the current does decrease monotonically with change in the composition or the band gap, but the voltage doesn't really increase monotonically. It's almost stuck at this point. Okay. Now that is something which is sort of an intriguing thing. Like why does the voltage not increase with increase in the band gap? Okay, uh, so there is a similar sort of uh, observation in the photoluminescence. So you increase the band gap and what you see is that uh, your photoluminescence doesn't really change monotonically. If you compare this with the absorption, you can see that the PL is stuck at one point here. So going further, like this is the topic I'll talk about, dynamic defects in perovskite. And uh, this is a very busy slide, but I would like you to focus on this area here. <clears throat> which I have circled over here. So what I'm showing you here is a very sensitive absorption measurement plotted on a log scale. And what you see is for a pure iodine based perovskite, this is the absorption curve. For a pure bromine based perovskite, this pink one is the absorption curve. And the mixed halides where you have the uh, sort of uh, compositional match, mix and match of iodine bromine, this is the absorption curves. What you see is that when you Put, when you put this particular sample under uh, sunlight illumination, you see that the absorption curve remains the same. So the dotted lines or the encircled lines are the lines which you get when you put them under the sunlight. Okay. The same is true for the bromine based sample. So there's not any change in the absorption when you expose it to sunlight. But what happens when you expose the mixed halide compositions to the sunlight where you have 
iodine and bromine both present in almost equal equal sort of composition you see that when you don't expose it to sunlight let's say you focus on this green absorption curve here the dotted line the solid line sorry is the absorption curve without any light so you see that this is the absorption curve that it follows and then when you expose it to some light it becomes the solid dotted line so you see the absorption curve shifts to the lower energy spectrum and then when you remove this sunlight it the absorption curve again shifts back to this hollow dotted line see okay so what you see is that the band gap is actually red shifting when you illuminate the semiconductor with sunlight okay so this is a unique feature which you observe in these semiconductors now the same is actually reflected even in the photoluminescence so we see that the pl which should supposed to be here and here so if you focus on the green pl this is the pl which was supposed to come from this green absorbing perovskite which has 60% bromine and 40% iodine but when you put it under sunlight you see that the pl starts coming from a lower energy which again matches this absorption edge that appears under sun, sunlight illumination okay so going further we investigated this sort of aspect what we observe is very interesting feature first thing that the pl from where the original bandage photoluminescence should have come actually starts dying over time so if you keep measuring the pl over time what you see is that the original pl starts sorts of dies and the new pl is what emerges at a lower energy or at a higher wavelength okay and this pl is sort of when you possibly plot the time kinetics of this rise of this pl versus the x ray diffraction peak data measured at 29.6 degrees which corresponds to one of the diffraction peaks shown by this perovskite what you observe is that the change in the structure by observing the shift in the x ray peak is actually matching with the shift in the photoluminescence peak okay or the rise in the photoluminescence peak rather so this actually shows that there is a structural change happening under solar illumination and that is actually driving the change in the photoluminescence as well okay which is not a very difficult thing to imagine because if you change the structure you expect a change in the semiconductor and that actually ends up changing the photoluminescence behavior as well okay <clears throat> but the interesting aspect is more on the physics front where you basically let's say you do an experiment with a semiconductor which is this where you have 40% bromine and 60% iodine and what you do here is that it has a band gap of around 1.95 eV okay so the band gap for this semiconductor is 1.95 eV so what i try to do is let's say i excite the sample with three different wavelengths so the all these wavelengths are above band gap or resonant with the band gap and i ensure that the fluence is such that i excite and create the same number of electron hole pairs while i excite with all these uh, all these lasers individually okay so if i excite the sample with 2.67 ev i if i track the rise in the pl from that lower energy what i find is the time it takes to rise to the peak is 4.6 seconds okay so this time which i'm talking about is the time in this rise okay the drop and the rise of this to the peak right so that time is around 4.6 seconds when i excite the same with another laser which is slightly lower in terms of energy the time it takes is 25 seconds okay this green peak it rises and saturates when i now excite the same sample with a laser which is resonant with the band gap of the semiconductor you see that the time it takes is quite long what this signifies is that i am creating the same number of electrons and holes but the time it takes for that pl to rise is different that is because it's showing you that the phonon based relaxations that happen when you excite above the band gap actually are playing a major role in how long it takes for this pl to rise okay so there is a phonon lattice interaction that is what is suggested by this data over here and one other experiment we tried doing on this front was like okay we excite the sample from the front and you know that all these samples uh, have an absorption gradient which is exponentially decaying when the light penetrates the sample 
So what that does is the number of electrons and holes you generate on the front surface of the sample is always higher than what you generate at the back surface of the sample. So when you try to excite the sample from both sides and sort of equalize this generation of uh, charges on both sides, what we see is that the PL from this low energy, which rises when you excite from only one side, actually drops. So this basically shows you that there is also a charge generation aspect linked to this rise in the PL. Okay. So if you were to equalize the charge generation all throughout the sample, this dynamic defect or this dynamic absorption will actually disappear, right? And one other thing we see is that for thinner films, we don't see any rise time because it's so thin that the PL just rises instantly. For thicker film, it takes some time. And when we do uh, thickness dependence, what we find is the critical thickness is around 150 nanometers, beyond which we see a difference between the PL in the front and PL at the back, which indicates that this is the pro possible propagation length at which this process is happening to enable this change in PL. Okay. And uh, one other interesting experiment we have done is to do time resolved uh, kinetics, where what you do is you see you track the excited species over time. Uh, I mean, for those who don't understand this, no need to worry. You are simply looking at how the electrons and holes decay with time. Okay. Without any background illumination, when you excite any electron and hole in this sample, they decay very linearly and which, which is a normal behavior. But when you excite your sample with a one sun illumination, you know that we form this low energy state, absorption state. And what happens is <clears throat> instead of the excited charge species decaying linearly, what we see is that as they decay, you start seeing a rise of another feature at lower energy, which basically takes around nine picoseconds. So it's a very fast process. And within this time, you have this energy transfer process. Okay. So when you put this particular material under sunlight illumination, what happens is you form this low band gap phase and all the charge carriers which were generated at this bandage actually start funneling into this low energy state within nine picoseconds. So it's a very fast process. And that is what is leading to the low voltage that you were observing. Okay. So the reason we sort of investigated actually shows up in this final data here. So it's, it's also elucidated here. What you see is uh, as you excite the banded states and they decay, as these states decay, you also see a rise in the excited state species at the lower energy phase. But as I said, achieving a lower VOC would, act, would actually kill the performance of a solar cell. But actually, it's beneficial in some other sense. What is that? What we observe is the PL from this low energy state actually goes beyond 60%. So original PLQV is around 1%, but the PL from the defect goes to above 60%. So it's very good for use in LEDs. Okay. So now the question is, can we have any such solutions to stop this dynamic defect? And we investigated few. One such thing was to do some cation doping. And uh, what this does is basically you add some potassium based salts and they end up actually forming around the uh, grain boundaries. So this image that you see here, figure C that I'm highlighting here is showing you the potassium concentration in the film. And it's basically C concentrated around the grain boundaries. So when you add potassium to the salt, potassium halide, it actually goes up and takes up these, fills up these vacancy slots and that passivates the uh, perovskite and prevents the dynamic defect. By doing so, you stop this PL movement and stabilize the band gap. So this is what you see as a stabilized band gap without which the PL would move around like this. And with that, you basically then, if you look at your solar cell, you achieve higher VOCs. This is what you were missing earlier. So if you stabilize the dynamic defect, you achieve higher voltages and that naturally ends up giving you higher performance. So a solar cell that was giving you 17% ends up giving you 21%, which is good. Now, some other aspect which you can do is on nanocrystals front, where you have such halogen mixtures and you still do see halide segregation. You can see this rise in the PL here at a lower energy or higher wavelength. But by doing some surface passivation, you basically end up killing this 
dynamic defect formation and the PL stabilizes. And with such stabilization, we ended up making the brightest red LEDs which you can ever make out of perovskite. So this was recently published earlier this year. And the efficiencies for these red LEDs made out of such passivated nanocrystals is around 21%, which is state of the art. Okay. And they are also highly stable. So we have managed to get a T50 of 4.5 hours, which earlier was merely a few minutes. So that is quite an increase. Now, the interesting question to ask is, what do you do when you have such question of photo instability and photo stability? So when you do certain process, where are you in this journey between photo stability and photo instability? So one experiment which we are doing here at the moment is to observe such kinetics. So if you resonantly, if you are sort of exciting in resonance with the process times, then you see certain cool things. So originally, if you observe here, originally the PL is supposed to be here for this mixed halide perovskite. But over time, you see that the PL shifts, red shifts, then again blue shifts, then again red shifts, and eventually it ends up going here at the red most part. So what you see is that if you are in resonance with the process which is causing this PL shift, you will basically observe and track all that and see that and see that where you are in this whole process of photostability and instability, what you finally want to achieve is a process which is completely photostable. So you will basically track this process and you change your particular uh, way of stabilizing your sample and then you see that how you bend this curve towards this part. Okay. That, is, that is one of the way we are exploring at the moment. And one other cool thing which I would like to mention at the end of my talk is that the there are uh, LEDs which are fabricated which use this concept of energy funneling. Okay, And what they do is they basically mix different band gaps of perovskite. And what that does is that you basically have your charge carriers funneled down to the lowest band gap and that enables a very high PL quantum yield. Okay. As in what you saw when the defect used to emit, the PL quantum yield went up from 1% to 60%. So such concepts are also used to make very efficient LEDs. Okay. So in summary, the take home messages that I have for you are like perovskites, they have active, I mean, passive and dynamic defects. And they open up interesting science questions and applications. If you solve those problems, you can make efficient solar cells. Even if you don't solve those problems, you can make efficient LEDs or maybe even photo detectors. And nanostructuring, as I showed you with nanocrystals, they can lead to very efficient uh, solar cells and they show different properties as well. And surface passivation actually helps in uh, sort of tackling both these kinds of defects. So thanks for your time and I acknowledge many people, funding bodies and my group members here for doing the latest work and previous advisors and uh, partners for doing the other work that I showed you here. Thank you. Excellent talk, Aditya. Uh, so we have one question here from uh, Radha. So it's on the, about uh, slide number 26. Slide number 26. I actually can't see the number, but maybe you can so, see. Right. Whatever. So the, it is that uh, about cation doping, what happens to the excess ions which come out uh, along the potassium salt? Means that it will change the ratio and it will be the change in the absorption will be the problem. So you mean this particular work, right? Where you add the excess potassium salt inside, potassium halide salt. Yeah, if I may ask, uh, thanks, thanks. So basically, yeah, if yeah. I may ask, uh, along with the potassium, you're also putting anion, isn't it? Yes. So you're putting a potassium salt. So there is an anion which is coming. Um, hmm. Are you matching the anion to be same as bromide or iodide, or is it something else? So and if, if at all you're matching, what happens to the ratio of the anions, you know, like bromide and iodide? So essentially, the halide vacancies are not with very high density. So okay. what you're doing is you're adding like 0.05% mole percent into the solution. So what you're trying to do is the anion is what is actually filling up the halide vacancy. 
the cation the potassium cation is the potassium in this case and that actually still stays bound to this halogen because it's like a solid solution end of the day it's a ionic solid solution that's what you are working with here so the halide vacancy is essentially filled with the halogen itself and the cation part is basically sticking around with this particular halogen that is how we envision in this particular work okay it could be the other way around, but uh, that is how we uh, thinking of the mechanism is okay okay Okay, thank you so much, Aditya. Excellent talk. Uh, any other excess material which stays behind, which is not part of this structure, is actually there lying in this material itself. But that actually doesn't participate in any electronic uh, process because the band gap is way too high and it is insulating in nature. So the semiconducting part is the only thing that participates, and where, what we see is th those properties are actually what is improving and enabling higher performances. Yes. So uh, let me clarify my, one more, uh, one of my doubts. So in this uh, color mapping images, what we are looking at uh, is the, that what you already said that uh, segregation of the ions. So does it also mean that the uh, the width of the grain boundary is actually so large? Yeah, so you can see the color, right? Mm -hmm. so. so this particular image actually is exaggerating the typical grain boundaries that are present. So, I, I mean, I highlighted one thing over here, which actually shows up very clearly. It's a big grain boundary. But essentially, yeah. the grain boundaries are these small, slight uh, patterns that you're seeing. I don't know how visible they are on the computers, but you can see these small green lines that are running along. It's like the nervous system or the leaf veins that you see. It's It looks very similar to that. We were to amplify the brightness and those are the essential grain boundaries what you're seeing here is a lump which is of course a defect <laughs> for sure and there is the concentration of the potassium is very high and that shows very bright over there but the concentration of potassium is spread all across the grain boundaries and those are highlighted very nicely if you were to brighten your computer screen if my image is showing up right over there <laughs> But also, it also means that uh, if we consider those small, small lines, uh, then actually the grain size of the perovskite itself is uh, quite small, right? Yeah, so the grain sizes actually depend on the way you process them. So some people can make it in micron scale, some people can make it in nanometer. That's the aim actually. Yeah. In, in this particular process, the average grain size was, I think, around 150 to 200 nanometers. Okay. Okay. So I I want to ask one more quick question. So you talked about this uh, PL variation. So is there any concept called a blinking, which is generally observed it in uh, photoluminescent materials? Hmm. So blinking is a typical process which is observed in nanocrystals. Uh, so if I, if I talk about the nanocrystal work that I just showed you, where we made these LEDs. So for steady state sort of application, if, if you just observe the process of this red shifting of PL, here we don't see any blinking sort of behavior. But if you if you observe the nanocrystal emission per se, then yes, occasionally you do see blinking. But that sort of depends on the particular batch of nanocrystals which you make. So we exactly don't know what's the kind of processing you should do to get those blinking sort of phenomena very regularly uh, but they are not observed in all the nanocrystals that's what i would say because one aspect to keep in mind is these nanocrystals they are not quantum confined mm. they are not quantum confined the size of these nanocrystals is much bigger than the bohr radius so it's around 15 nanometers so it's like nanoparticle if you say uh, sort of uh, uh, coated nanoparticle Correct. Nice. Okay, so there are no further comments or questions from the audience. Uh, so thank you for joining here today and giving this fantastic talk. Thanks, Abhi. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so we have left with now one last 
कंट्रीब्यूटरी टॉक फ्रॉम शाह मिथुन शाह आर यू यूर हियर यस सर यस सर यस होप आई एम ऑडिबल यस यू आर ऑडिबल ओके लेट मी शेयर माय स्क्रीन नाउ सर होप आई एम विजिबल टू यस ओके ओके Hey, good evening, one and all. I'm Mithun Shah from Faru College. I am doing my research in the Department of Physics, Calcutta University. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for giving me an opportunity to present my work entitled "An Experimental Setup to Study Thermoelectric Magnetothermoelectric and Spin Seabed Effect of Thin Films and Nanostructures." So this is an overview of my presentation. I would like to start with the conventional thermoelectricity, that basic thermoelectric effect, Seebeck effect, and Peltier effect. And then I will go to magnetic thermoelectric effect, how the magnetic field, application of external magnetic field, how it influences the thermoelectricity. And then I will go to the spin calorectronics. That is one of the emerging area in the field of thermoelectricity. The two basic effects are named as uh, spin Seebeck effect and spin Peltier effect. and then i will go to my actual work of designing and development of an apparatus to measure the normal thermoelectricity magnetic field dependent thermoelectricity and spin thermoelectric effects and for characterization of the for the uh, prototype uh, we have designed we developed the preparation of thin films uh, nickel tin nitrate and for the normal seebeck effect measurement and the preparation of nickel tin film for the magnetic field dependent thermoelectric studies and finally i will conclude so these are the basic uh, effect in thermoelectricity first one is the seebeck effect and the second one is the peltier effect so seebeck effect is basically the generation of a charged gradient when we apply a temperature gradient and peltier effect is basically the reverse effect of the seebeck effect so when you apply a current uh, that is passing through a junction for uh, a hover junction will become hot and another junction will be become cold so the temperature gradient will be generated by a charged gradient so this two are reciprocal effects in thermoelectricity these are the basic effects in thermoelectricity so if you are uh, uh, concentrating of the uh, concentrating on a good thermoelectric material what are the char characteristics that govern a good thermoelectric material so it should have a high dimensional uh, uh, value of a figure of merit so it is given by z is equal to s square sigma by kappa into t so s is a seebeck coefficient sigma is the electrical conductivity and kappa is the thermal conductivity t is the absolute temperature so in order to have a good thermoelectric material it should have high figure of merit that means you should have a material with a high seebeck coefficient high electrical conductivity at the same time that material should be having a low thermal conductivity so compromising all this uh, and or uh, fine tuning all this uh, kind of interlinked parameters is one of the major challenges in the field of thermoelectricity and the next one is the field dependent uh, seebeck effect so creating temperature gradient in magnetic nanostructures also creates some interesting results so the thermal voltage varies under the influence of an applied external magnetic field in most of the cases it is found to increase so the application of an external magnetic field can be controlled and uh, the magnitude and the direction of the external magnetic field positively or negatively can affect the thermoelectric phenomena uh, but we can uh, in the case of some uh, magnetic crystals with a specific orientation isotropy uh, that uh, that can be controlled and that, that can be studied with the uh, designed apparatus so the application of external field how it interact with the thermoelectric phenomena that is one of the major concerns of the study and the magnetic field dramatically reduces the electronic thermal conductivity and enhances thermoelectric powers and that effectively leading to a high figure of merit well and one of the unconventional way of creating uh, uh, thermoelectric effect is the spin based thermoelectric effect and one of the ma major thermoelectric spin the spin based thermoelectric effect is a spin seebeck effect so it is a refers to generation of a spin current a flow of spin as a result of the temperature gradient in a magnetic material so what we basically do is that we have a magnetic material it can be ferromagnetic antiferromagnetic or ferri magnetic material and the generation of a, a spin current uh, that is uh, we can generate the spin current from the uh, by applying a temperature gradient this is one of the major uh, Um, effect in the case of spin seep and this the spin seep signal can be extracted uh, by a phenomenon called ishg inverse spin hole effect we cannot directly extract spin seep signal but at the same we can use the phenomenon of we can seek the help of uh, inverse spin hole effect for extracting the spin seep signals 
So this spin saver signal is basically uh, can be extracted from a bilayer system, basic bilayer thin films, where the base material is a magnetic, it can be ferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic, or antiferromagnetic material, and the upper layer, the detecting layer, uh, should be a paramagnetic heavy metal film like uh, tantalum, or tungsten, or platinum. So uh, the uh, latest development in the field of this spin saver effect uh, has led to the production of. Uh, thermoelectricity from insulators. A classic example is a uh, yttrium ion current. Yttrium ion current is a very magnetic material, which is basically an insulator. But from that insulator also, we can create uh, thermoelectricity. This is one of the major breakthrough in the field of uh, spin-based thermoelectric effects. So these are the two basic configurations that we seek to measure the, the spin seabeck effect. One of them, the first one is a transverse spin seabeck effect, TSSE. And the second one is a longitudinal spin seabeck effect. In the transverse spin seabeck effect, the application of the temperature gradient and the magnetization both are in the same direction, they are two in parallel. But in the case of longitudinal spin seabeck effect, the application of magnetic field, the direction of magnetic field is in perpendicular to the generated temperature gradient. So this is actually designed a uh, setup for measuring the normal thermoelectricity and the field dependent thermoelectricity and the transverse spin seabeck effect. So the leftmost figure, this uh, using this setup, you can measure all these things, the normal thermoelectricity, magnetic field dependent thermoelectricity and transverse spin seabeck effect. And the right two figures, these are the two basic configuration for measuring the longitudinal spin seabeck effect. And the left side, uh, you can see the uh, temperature gradient is created by uh, two Peltier elements. And the right hand side, uh, this is created by one Peltier element and external ceramic heater. So this two configuration, the right hand side, two configuration can be used to measure longitudinal spin seabeck effect. And the left hand side configuration can be used to measure normal thermoelectricity, field dependent thermoelectricity and transverse spin seabeck effect. And this is the actual uh, implemented uh, diagram of this or this setup which consisting of the uh, all the parts that we have shown here. So this is the actual implemented uh, diagram of this setup. And these are the main components that I have used for this building the setup. First one is a Peltier element. So Peltier element is when the current flows through the junctions of two conductors, it is removed from one junction and the cooling is, of, cooling is occurring in the other junction. So we have used that standard three centimeter by three centimeter Peltier elements for creating heat. The, the, creating the temperature gradient and the second one is the second main component is a copper blocks two copper blocks attached on the lower side of the Peltier element are used to as heat sinks so basically the excess amount of heat should be absorbed by these materials so we used copper blocks for that purpose and the uh, size of these blocks were three centimeter into three centimeter into five centimeter and pt 100 temperature sensor so eventually we are made basically measuring the temperature and uh, temperature gradient should be measured and the electric current should also be measured so for measuring the temperature uh, we use the pt100 sensors and two pt100 sen sensors are used to measure the temperatures of the two copper blocks and we use the four channel pt100 sensors and the gold screws uh, two gold screws were used as the output leads for extracting the uh, electric signals and they were connected to k 2450 source meter in its voltage measurement mode to read the output voltage and the thermostats, these are uh, thermostats that are used to precisely control the temperature that we apply, uh, apply to these uh, materials. And that can be controlled up to 0.1 degree Celsius. Temperature gradient uh, with a difference of 0.1 degree Celsius can be created using this thermostats that can be precisely controlled. And the last one is a sample and sample holder. The thin film samples is used to measure, measure and fix one of the copper blocks using the heat sink compound, which is having high thermal conductivity. So this part consisting of two copper blocks that is a sample holder. And in the case of a TSSE, this is a sample TSSE and LSSE, this sample holder can be rotated also. So the standard measurement size is, even though the standard measurement size is one centimeter by one centimeter film, as you can see in this case, uh, that film uh, can be the middle figure. Uh, that uh, the sample can be adjusted using the two copper blocks. So we can also measure uh, samples of different sizes also. Even though with, the, with this fixed that one centimeter, the length can be even up to six centimeter or five centimeter. So longer samples can also be characterized by this apparatus. So for the measurement of this uh, thermoelectricity, normal thermoelectricity, we prepared tin nitrate thin films uh, for using the RF magnetron sputtering technique. So tin nitrate with thin films with the preferred orientation 311 and 222 oriented crystallized were deposited by reacted RF, reactive RF magnetron sputtering techniques. And these were the sputtering parameters. The target substrate distance was set to 7.8 centimeters and the nitrogen pressure, uh, there, there is a reactive gas. 
uh, the nitrogen pressure was set to 2 into 10 raised to minus 2 millibar and the sputtering power was 150 watt and the sputtering time is 40 minutes and the sputtering substrate temperature is 200 degrees Celsius. And this is the AFM image of the sputtered tin nitrate thin films. And this tin nitrate thin films were used to study the normal thermometric effect using the designed apparatus. So these are the results we got. Uh, first one, uh, we applied the temperature gradient, uh, setting the one of the Peltier to a lower temperature of 20.4 degrees Celsius. And the temperature on the higher side is varied from 33.5 degrees Celsius to 47.3 degrees Celsius. So in effect, we can create a temperature gradient from 13.1 degrees Celsius to 26.9 degrees Celsius. And the generated thermal voltage is also measured. And from that value, we can calculate the Siebel coefficient. So it also shows that as the temperature gradient increases, the thermal voltage also increases. Uh, but the Siebel coefficient remains almost the same in the range of 75 microvolt per Kelvin. So our uh, results, these results were compared with the ul like sentry results, and it shows only 3 to 4 percentage radiation. This is because of the uh, change in the environment. Uh, in the case of ul like sentry, that is a uh, standard thermometric measurement system. The measuring uh, environment is basically helium. Here we have uh, applied it in non open environment. And so there is a difference of 3 to 4 percentage between the results we have got and the standard values. And this for this for studying the uh, field, the variation of the thermal electricity in the presence of an external magnetic field, we uh, prepared nickel thin films by again using the same RF microphone sputtering technique uh, using nickel targets. And these were the sputtering parameters. Again, the target sublate distance was 7.8 centimeter and the arc temperature was 2 into 10 raised to minus 2 millibar. And the sputtering power was 150 watt. Sputtering time was 8 minutes and it is all the uh, measurements are done in room temperature. The deposition was done in room temperature and these are the MFM images of the uh, deposited nickel thin films. Uh, we have de deposited the films in uh, sapphire, uh, alumina and glass substrates. And uh, all of them shows uh, formation of a magnetic domains. And these are the, the this sputtered nickel thin films were characterized used in, using the designer setup. And again, uh, effective temperature difference was uh, starting from 7 degrees Celsius up to 23 degrees Celsius were applied in the, in the, between the ends of these uh, sputtered films. And the thermal voltage is measured. You can see there is a, a difference between the uh, value that we got in the presence of magnetic field. When the magnetic field was zero, Tesla, that is, before the application of magnetic field, uh, the thermal, electric, uh, thermal electricity value, that is, a value of the Siebel coefficient was a little less. And when we apply the external magnetic field, the magnetic, uh, the value of the Siebel coefficient is going to increase uh, with the applied external field up to 0.2 Tesla. And uh, this is actually uh, where we have uh, varied the temperature gradient by fixed where with a fixed magnetic field. So the magnetic field was a set, uh, set to B is equal to 0.2 Tesla, and only the temperature gradient was varied. So as the temperature gradient increases, even though within the constant magnetic field, the presence of constant magnetic field, the thermal voltage is found to increase. And we have uh, done another study using the same thing. Uh, we have applied a constant temperature gradient of uh, 23 Kelvin, uh, 23 degrees Celsius. And the magnetic plus density, the field was varied from 0 0.02 Tesla to 0 0.2 Tesla. And the interesting behavior result that we got is that it is uh, showing some saturation behavior uh, depending upon the character, uh, nickel thin film, magnetic, uh, magnetic saturation point of nickel thin films. So these are my conclusions. So a compact setup is developed to study three diverse kind of thermoelectric effects. Uh, three diverse kind is the normal thermoelectric effect and the magnetic field, thermo magnetic field dependent thermoelectric effect and the spin seabed effect. Since most of the thermoelectric applications are targeted for room temperature energy solutions and the design setup may be used to characterize the performance of material, thermoelectric materials in the range 300 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. And the thermoelectricity and field dependent variation of thermoelectricity was systematically investigated for tin nitrate and the nickel thin films respectively. And the observed thermal voltage saturates as the applied magnetic field crosses the saturation magnetic station for nickel thin films. And the thermoelectric materials with the magnetic nano inclusions can also be studied using the same setup because when, when we have in the normal, even in the case of a normal thermoelectric material, application of or insertion of the X insertion of the uh, external uh, magnetic nano inclusions can drastically change the thermal electricity. So that can also be studied using the same setup. The experimental setup is compact and cheap compared to the bulk setup containing coil type heating elements because we are using the two basic type kind of heating elements here we use is the Peltier elements and the ceramic heater. So these are uh, very small when compared to the bulk 
coil type heating elements. The main components to make this setup are available in any physics material science lab. And the heating in conventional setup need precise constant current sources, which occupy a lot of space and are expensive. So here, one of the uh, uh, things we have made is we have used only very cheap thermo, uh, thermostats and the thermo controllers uh, that is available in the market. And uh, we can control the temperature up to 0.1 degree Celsius. So position up to 0.1 degree Celsius in temperature can be attained using this setup. And the sample stage of SSC measurement can also be rotated. So the variation of spin CP effective with the direction of applied magnetic field can also be studied. So these are uh, conclusions of my work. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Midun, for uh, sharing your results. Participants, if you have any questions, uh, please post it here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, let me ask one question. Yes, so sir. what is the maximum temperature gradient you can generate in this setup? Oh, actually, yes, sir, that, that depends upon the uh, heat kind of heater we use. In the case of Peltier elements, uh, the maximum temperature uh, for the Peltier we use is uh, it can reach up to 80, 85 degrees Celsius only. And in the case of if you are using the ceramic heaters, it can uh, reach up to 100 degrees or 500 degrees Celsius like that. We use the ceramic heaters up to 100 degrees Celsius. So with that uh, help of this, uh, we can achieve the maximum temperature gradient of 40 degrees Celsius maximum. Okay. okay. So is there any reason uh, why this uh, saturation comes up in this uh, measurements with the nickel film? Uh, actually, the low temperature. Yeah, the external magnetic field plays a vital role in the mobility of the charge carriers. Uh, so, uh, I would, okay, actually the SIBA coefficient is pairs some negatives and because the carriers, charge carriers in this uh, nickel thin film are basically electrons. So, this all this SIBA coefficient uh, values bear a negative sign. So, the mobility of electrons is affected by the external magnetic field. And uh, when the external magnetic field crosses the, uh, the saturation magnetization of the nickel film, uh, it actually uh, all the magnetic moments will be in the, aligned in the direction of nickel. So, there is no further additional influence uh, that the external field, even though when we increase the external magnetic field, it do not have an additional influence because the field saturates itself in the sample. Uh, so, these nickel films were grown at uh, room temperature? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They were created in RF Mayatrod's buttering system at room temperature. Mm -hmm. So, does it, uh, uh, what is the crystalline, uh, crystallographic orientation of it? Uh, actually, uh, it is in 111 oriented. Uh, I have tried for sapphire also, but uh, sapphire didn't give me much better results. The, the results in glass are, uh, seems to be much better. Yes, uh, thank you, Mithun, for joining today. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, we have completed this session. Uh, so, thank you, everybody, for joining it. So, please uh, stay here uh, on the link one only uh, for the next session at uh, 5 p.m. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Hi, uh, good morning, Professor Marcus. Good morning, yes. Professor Sagadi. Um, do you want me to try to share my screen? Uh, uh, yes. Professor Marcus, good morning. Uh, good yes, hello. For you, yeah. For us, it is good evening. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, good yes, yes, good, good evening, I should say, for you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, your session, your talk will start at five o'clock. Professor P. Jush Ghosh is the chair of the session. Uh, Great. I will introduce you, then you can share the screen. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start in like three minutes, right? Sure, sure. Yes. Yes. Yes, good. Okay. Professor P. Jush Ghosh. Yeah, he's already here. So maybe we'll start in one or two minutes. Yes. Now it is 4.57, just three more minutes, you can start the session. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Marcus. Hi, good morning. Good, oh, good, yeah. e good evening. Good evening, good morning. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, um, start in two minutes, maybe? That sounds great, yeah. I just need to um, actually, you know, yes. can I start sharing this? I need to... Um, um, I have a little different, I, I don't have a second monitor here today, so I'm gonna sure, need to. Sure, sure, you can just. Do you see my screen? I see that, but uh, they looks like it, uh, now it's fine, but I'm not sure uh, if the other screens are fitting to this. Can you just go to uh, one or two more slides? Mm -hmm. That looks, this looks fine. How does that look like? Uh, this, uh, I mean, this, this, there is a little cut on the right side of the screen. Okay, what about this? This is fine. This is fine. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it should be fine. I mean, it just takes a moment to um, yeah. show everybody here. Okay. Now, in case there is something, I will, I will interrupt you and then maybe you can... Readjust yes, sure. Need, so no issues. No, that and sounds that sounds great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, any other slide that you want to quickly check, or any movie that you would like to check? Since we have two more minutes. Um, no, it should be fine. I mean, okay. Yeah, it should be fine. And as you uh, suggested, we're not going to record this. So. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Sure. Oh, yeah. I'm actually I'm attending a, a conference, the MRS meeting in Boston right now. So that's why I'm, oh. I'm not in my usual setup. I'm, I'm, I'm chairing the meeting here. So I've, I'm right, staying right, right. here and I, um, but I, you know, I'm in my hotel. So, so no, no issue, but I, I just don't have the regular okay. second screen that I usually use for my, um, my presentations, but I think it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it looks like a really interesting conference you have. Congratulations. Um, lots of really great speakers you have. Yeah, so Thank far you. so good. Yeah. And how, yeah, how has it been going? Do you have a virtual, is it only virtual or do you have any in-person component as well? No, this is totally online. Uh, so right. in a year or two, we are planning for the, uh, the in-person mm. or offline version of this. Mm. So you have to get ready for that. As well. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'm over here. That's a good way to practice, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean there's some advantages um with the virtual meeting, you know, like like having a lot more access to speakers from around the world. I mean it's yeah, very difficult otherwise true. to travel. Uh, especially this time of the year. I think it's a challenging time right after Thanksgiving, so and yeah, before the holidays, yeah. but do you have any any holidays in India coming up, or is that? Uh, it's almost our semesters yeah. are going to uh, get over in another week or so, and okay. after that, uh, kind of we have uh, some holiday until January first week again. Uh, okay. Typically. And then depending on the university, that uh, duration could be slightly different here and there, but mm. uh, that's yeah. typically the time when we take break. Nice, good. Uh, okay. And sure. how's the COVID? Yes, yeah. COVID situation in India? Uh, it's way much better than what it was uh, two, uh, like I would say four months back. So mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it, is, it is not uh, that bad. It was in like two, three months back. So that's, that's good news for us. Right. Uh, sorry, Professor Mark. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. The session is not now getting recorded, but it is live on YouTube. Is that okay for you or you want yeah, us to uh, stop? Fine. No, no, that's fine. No, no, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. No, no. Yeah, I just, I, okay. yeah, I just have some unpublished results, and I want to, sure. okay. you know, okay. make sure it's not okay. protect my student most likely. Yeah. Okay. So Great. Uh, no, YouTube is still fine. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Kiran, we'll start. Yes, yes, five, please start. One. Yes. Five. So, all right. So, I'm really excited, and I welcome Professor Marcus Buller. Uh, so, he's a McAfee Professor of Engineering at MIT and uh, primarily affiliated to uh, Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, he is a primary uh, area of research. I, I, he works in a wide uh, range of uh, research areas, but mechanics of biological materials, uh, more specifically biological protein materials, bio-inspired materials, hierarchical structures are some of his, uh, I would say, expertise, area of expertise. And one of the uniqueness of his research group, the way I see it is, is bridging the chemistry and the mechanics of biological materials across multiple length scales and applying multiple computational techniques. So uh, that's, that's the uniqueness of his, his group. He, he can actually talk uh, more about his group. And uh, there are a lot of uh, publications uh, you can see in some very reputed uh, journals. If you go through his webpage, you'll find including nature, nature and nanotechnology, science, etc. And he is a, uh, is, a, is a member, editor, associate editor of a long list of journals, which I will not uh, uh, mention here because it will then take the uh, next 15 minutes. But that the, some of the journals which would be of interest uh, for this particular audience include like Journal of Nanomechanics and Micromechanics. Uh, he's an editorial member of the Journal of Mechanical uh, Behavior of Biomedical Materials uh, and several other journals. Now, this, uh, these are about uh, his research and uh, his professional uh, things. But as a person, I know Marcus for a quite a long time, and I see Marcus as a, a, a very friendly, approachable person. So that's, uh, that's, that's the uh, one good thing about uh, Marcus. Uh, and uh, we, I know him since his postdoctoral days. And I, uh, the type of work he does and the, and the group he has is really fascinating. So I'm sure uh, his talk will be exciting, exciting as well. So with this uh, brief introduction, uh, one more time, I welcome Professor Marcus Buller uh, for uh, this uh, keynote uh, address. And this is the last talk of our the day. And also I request the participants to, uh, to put the questions in the, in the chat box so that uh, we can discuss at the end. Uh, Marcus, uh, uh, welcome one more time and uh, over to you. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pijuj. And it's, it's um, really a pleasure to see you again. And I, I do hope we're going to meet each other again in person soon. But um, yeah, we've known each other for a long time and it's, I really cherish our friendship and thank you for, uh, for the invitation today. Um, I will um, I'll go through a couple of different examples of work we've been doing recently on um, especially applying deep learning to designing composites and proteins and also making materials. And that's something that my lab has started getting into is um, some experimental work as well, um, including 3D printing and analysis and testing. And uh, it's been really fun the last couple of years to going to push the boundaries a little bit. Um, so what, what I do is I work on materials with multiple scales. I am very interested in hierarchical structures, and I um, have a, you know, an interest sort of in, in bridging the nano to the macro. I have a background in chemistry. I have a background in mechanics. I, As Peter said, I, I, I try to marry the two ideas and concepts in, in systems like the one shown here, where you can clearly see that materials, really any kind of material, human-made or natural ones, have these multi-level features that we're trying to model, understand and design and ultimately manufacture with very high precision. And we use a um, combination of multiple tools and techniques. And I was starting from molecular modeling, that's sort of the bread and butter of my lab, um, reactive simulations, chemistry, um, coarse graining, all the way to the finite element continuum model. Um, but we also are using the last, I would say five years or so, very heavily deep learning, machine learning techniques um, that you know has open up a whole new field of investigation or method of investigation, which I think is very exciting. And um, I'll, I'll show you some of those results. Um, typically, we you were interested in mechanical materials. I'm very interested in failure. I'm, that's been the passion of my past you know, 20 years or so is to understand how materials break, right? And, and uh, materials break by fracturing, they break through corrosion, by uh, wear and tear. I know they can break in all sorts of different ways. And I'm, I'm trying to understand how to predict that. And of course, prevent that if we're, you know, putting our engineering hat on. And there's sort of a myriad of ways to do that. Um, one of them is to use bioinspiration. You see in the bottom is a you know, bioinspired uh, composite design, architected materials. But we can also really literally look to nature and assess how 
biological living organisms create materials, design materials. Here's a, a picture of a spider from a lab, and, and you can see how these spiders have of, you know, in, in incredible um, sensors, which are these little hairy structures here, which actually allow them to sense the environment and make decisions on where they put their material that we're, they're kind of spinning out of their bodies and to construct spider webs, for example, as shown here. And, you know, these spider webs are um, you know, fascinating architectural structures. They're fascinating at the macro level. You can kind of see this here, you know, there's a lot of detail. But they really also go all the way down to the nano level. And, you know, at the molecular scale, they're made from proteins, which are ultimately the, the I would say, the material for life. And um, these, in turn, are made from amino acid building blocks. And so that's the, 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 the paradigm we're assessing is how we can understand the chemical level of amino acids, which are encoded by DNA, of course, um, how they come together to form materials as complex as silk, spider webs, collagen, bone, uh, tendon, skin, organs, um, viruses, and all sorts of different things. So the, the challenge, of course, that nature has sort of addressed, which is why we were so interested in this, <clears throat> in this topic as a material scientist, I'm interested in this from that perspective. And you, you look at, um, you know, Lego building blocks. Uh, and what nature has accomplished really is to sort these Lego building blocks and build something out of them that's organized in structure. And that feat is accomplished by the spider eating the fly, breaking down the proteins, and then reassembling them into this, you know, incredible material stronger than steel. Okay. And I, um, I think that is something that we still have a lot to learn from. Now, the, um, there's sort of many different ways by which we get excited about bio-inspiration, um, one of them, as I mentioned, is sort of incredible material performance, you know, silk being stronger than steel, yet being made out of very weak building blocks is interesting. But there's also a you know, really timely call for sustainability in the world right now. And of course, looking to nature to see how biological systems work and how they can uh, form materials very efficiently through this biomaterialomics bio approach is a very powerful concept. And so I have a, a little plug here for a TED talk I gave recently um, actually at uh, TEDx Ravatpur, which you might be familiar with, as so you can check it out on YouTube, um, where I talk about how um, bioinspiration can be a powerful paradigm actually for uh, sustainability as well. Now, what a spider does when the spider eats the fly, it creates these, it takes the Lego building blocks, the broken down amino acids and puts it together into a, a spider web, which is a beautiful structure. And here actually in a recent paper in PNAS that came out just a few uh, one months ago, um, we've studied this process and we actually followed the spider a period of seven days to understand how the construction of this web actually occurs and then build computer models. So this is some of the experimental work we've been doing, computer models now of these web structures, which we can analyze and we can mine that data that we've obtained from the spider spinning the web and extract information. You know, for example, we can uh, 3D print these web structures or segments thereof. And so on the left-hand side, you see a uh, printed segment of this web structure. It's incredibly complex, obviously, um, but with 3D printing, we can actually make these materials um, in the lab. Um, we can also um, extract certain patterns from these biological systems and make you know, synthetic designer materials, like architecture materials with certain patterns. So there's a really rich set of, sort of directions you can pursue. And um, again, reminding you that all of these you know, incredible pro properties really in, in protein materials come from the assembly of just 20 universal amino acid building blocks. So those are the kind of elementary chemical constituents that make up all these living materials, all these materials that make life possible. Um, and that is the, the, I think the challenge or call for challenge for material scientists all over the world to, to understand how that works. Uh, not just predicting the structure of a protein, but actually predicting how this protein assembles into a larger system and how we can predict functions from that. Now, when we just look to nature and observe, I alluded a couple of times already to some incredible materials. Uh, Nacre is one of them, conch shells are some of the other ones. We can mimic that. For many years now, using multi-material 3D printing, we can actually resemble a lot of these really complex designs created by nature. Um, we can scan them, image them, digitize them, or synthetically create architectures through algorithms, and we can manufacture them and test them. And this is some work that We've done recently on the conch shell, for example. Um, so why do we care about internal structures? Well, if you think about a material, and uh, I know all of you are familiar, of course, with mechanics, um, but um, maybe if you're not, um, 
if you if you take a material and you, you have a notch in there, like I kind of shown here, um, and that notch could be a defect or an initial crack, um, and you pull it, you want to design the material to resist fracturing. And so the way this is accomplished in this particular example here is by having a fiber structure, an internal microstructure that's engineered and 3D printed to make this material very tough, right? And so this is how this material becomes resistant to fracturing. Now, if you don't have the internal structure, you have something that looks a little bit more like this on the top here. You have a stress concentration, a singularity, and now the crack, instead of being uh, difficult to propagate, might very easily propagate, right? And so you have a, a, fra a very fragile material. So when you think about having um, internal microstructures patterning, you get these very tough materials like in Nacre, um, like in spider silk, and the it's achieved by by the a, a redistribution of damage and a very high energy dissipation rate. Now, that's been known for a while. And, and so what we've been trying to think about in the last several years, uh, and I think it's the job of scientists, of course, is to, to question what we do and to question what we hear and what we, what we have been doing for many years. Um, and so we've been thinking about sort of asking questions, can we model materials differently you know, than we've been doing for couple hundred years, right? I mean, for hundreds of years, we've basically followed um, partial differential equations that we've obtained by some human observation, um, writing it down in math, and then solving them the last hundred years or so, or 50 years or so using computers. And that was been basically the paradigm. But uh, now we can begin to think differently. And how um, do materials emerge? Well, they emerge in actually in very different ways in nature, right? So for example, the spider has a time scale of a few days by which the spider will build a web and it's sort of obtained by sensing, uh, making decisions in a neural network, the brain of the spider, right? Uh, and then depositing materials. And the spider web is a living material that can change all the time. And the same thing is when we humans do things manual uh, work, you know, we, we let's say we create a painting or we create woodwork or we uh, you know, in the early days, of course, humans did, you know, cave paintings and things like this. And so what we do is we, we create something, we look at it, we touch it, feel it, and we have our brain deciding on the next step. And this sort of has us to think a little differently in how we optimize materials, not as, not just looking at an algorithm that is a pre-programmed mathematical equation to minimize and maximize, but actually uh, instead, uh, programming a neural network that can mimic some of the intelligence um, that is at the core of really human creativity and the creativity or the, the, the substance by which spiders act in creating uh, structures and many other animals, of course. And so this happens at the scale of a few you know, days. Um, you can also think about evolutionary timescales. And so these artificial intelligence mechanisms can be, of course, expanded to also simulate evolution. And I'll show some of that later on as well. So you can really see that um, we can model materials differently and actually um, avoid altogether using um, PDs or differential equations altogether and just work with data. And that's been something I've been really fascinated by. And, and I, I, I work tirelessly in both my lab to, um, to explore that and, and, and actually to see how predictive such um, observational driven models can become um, as a or how they can complement conventional modeling techniques. So, so we use, um, I would emphasize, you know, a variety of techniques. We're not you know, giving up the more traditional chemistry and physics modeling. We need those, and, and, and I'll show you how we use them. But there's really a, sort of a whole new world opening up by using AI and machine learning to complement and sometimes replace some of those uh, traditional models. Um, so a few things I want to talk about. I, I have a couple of sort of case studies uh, I, want to, I want to go through. Um, one of them, one of the themes I'll, I'll try to cover is, is fracture. I already mentioned that I, I do, I'm very interested in predicting how things break. And the prototypical problem is a single crack in a material loaded by, say, mode one loading or shear loading. And you, you want to see when the crack initiates and how it propagates. And in more complex real materials, like from the bottom, you might have, of course, multiple cracks, but you can always bring them down to a single crack. And um, then the question is, can we predict that using deep learning, you know, instead of using molecular dynamics or using fine element models, can we use a deep learning algorithm to develop an artificial intelligence approach to uh, actually predict these processes uh, directly from, you know, an image or a boundary condition that's exposed to this, to this model. And this um, is important for many reasons. Um, some of them that you can speed up the design process, right? You can now explore if you have a deep learning model, you can 
um, hopefully speed up the design process. You can explore millions of configurations within a few hours, potentially. Um, you can um, you know, simulate evolution, I already mentioned. You can simulate billions of years passing in maybe a couple of weeks on your computer, right? And so there's just enormous opportunities waiting for, uh, for all of us. And of course, grand challenges as well. So how did we get into this? Well, we actually have been working on, um, and, and maybe, and, and Pijush and I met first back in 2002, three, four at that time. Um, we've probably been thinking about that at the time. We've published many papers on what we call uh, materiomics. And the, the concept of really understanding materials as a system of particles interacting, we have later on moved on to using category theory to do that. And that's sort of the equivalent of having a mathematical approach to describing hierarchical systems, not using PDEs, but using a more abstract representation of building blocks that interact. And this concept is um, analytical. It's pure, it's beautiful mathematics, but it's very difficult to do for really complex real world problems. You can have design problems or toy problems uh, for which you can find these analytical solutions, but most real engineering problems or materials problems, of course, are much more complex. And this is sort of where deep learning comes in. Um, and we can actually now, and this was sort of the big breakthrough, I would say, in my lab, um, that we, we were able to actually address these questions that we've been um, you know, hammering away on for decades um, now with deep learning. And we've actually been able to reach some of the goals, um, many more to come, but, but that's really exciting. And we use um, many different techniques. If you're interested, take a look at this uh, review article that came out in Materials Horizons just a few months ago. Um, we review a lot of these, a lot of these techniques, but uh, you know, I'll show you an overview of some of the things we've been doing recently. Now, how do you apply um, deep learning to materials problems? So the the, the basic idea um, we came to that, and I think it was 2016 or 17 when we began to look into this, where we, of course, we had a lot of data on on relating microstructures um, to uh, properties like toughness. And so you can see in this paper here in 2011, we actually studied how organizing uh, two different materials, um, same volume fraction, we just organize them differently, we can achieve significantly different mechanical performance and and uh, hierarchies or geometry is a trigger for creating unique mechanical signatures, including the YZR curve. Um, this um, lends itself beautifully to a deep learning problem because we're dealing with patterns, right? And so you think about having a geometry and a resulting stress field. Um, this is a problem that we can actually really easily give to a computer algorithm. And I'll, I'll show you how that can be done. But the reason why we need to do that in the first place, of course, is that it's very slow. So if you want to use finite element models or MD or any other really computational method that's based on a more traditional way of solving PDEs, you know, you're going to spend easily billions of years if you wanted to in brute force calculate all possible combinations. That's, you cannot do that. And so that's where um, pattern-based, I would say, algorithms come in. And then we were sort of really excited by this um, emergence of some really interesting things happening in the field of deep learning, especially coming out of uh, DeepMind, um, where they had developed algorithms to play games, essentially. And so these game theoretic methods um, are, are very similar in, 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 you know, in, the, in the context. And you, if you play game or game like chess or Go, you're moving things around, you know, players move things around and you're trying to find a, a winner of the game or, or a Pareto um, result or maybe a, a Nash equilibrium. And if you do this for composites, it's the equivalent of, of optimizing a composite, either for finding the uh, stress distribution, the uh, stress field in equilibrium, which is um, an equilibrium in a game, right? You balance forces and, and moments and, and masses and other things, depending on the, the physics you're looking at. Um, and um, these problems actually are similar in complexity in terms of the, the number of combinations you have in Go versus a, a composite design problem. And so we sort of gave that a shot and we developed an algorithm to do that um, and um, then you know, re achieved remarkable results with this. And so we could actually replace the phenomenon model with the machine learning model by training it against data. So this data relates patterns to features. Right? And so that's an observation that could either come from a, from a conventional simulation or it could come um, uh, potentially from an experiment as well, right? And so, so you can give all that data to the model and we need actually very little data compared to the entire set of possible combinations. Yet the model can learn these patterns and be predictive. And this is the exciting outcome is you can very accurately predict now toughness or strength uh, from the microstructure directly. And this prediction 
is very rapid. And so you can now almost in real time um, get solutions, right? And so for example, you can use this deep learning model to do it, to run a genetic algorithm to simulate, yes, evolutionary ideas. That's how we call it, bio-inspired AI. We, we really are simulating how nature evolves materials to adapt them to meet certain demands. And we can find optimal designs, then make the product. We can simulate that design then back using molecular modeling. And so typically that's what we do. If we make it in the lab, um, you know, you, you can then get your final optimal distribution, in this case of porosity near graphene, near crack. Um, and, uh, or you can make this using 3D printing. This is a different system, obviously, but this is a hierarchical um, composite design using this algorithm. And we can um, manufacture this using multi-material printing and then test it in the lab and actually showed that the optimization objectives could be realized, uh, confirmed as well using this method. So this sort of gives you a glimpse. Um, and, and I think the, 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 you know, the big, of course, advantage of this, I, I can't um, overstate this, is, is that it's much faster than running an FEM simulation or MD simulation, right? Um, you can run it on your laptop. Once the model is trained, you can really run it very quickly. So um, my lab also is, uh, you know, quite interested in, you know, other other areas. Actually, we have a, a large effort in um, in in creative um, aspects in the arts, especially music music theory, um, and uh, and sort of relating science to the arts is something I'm very passionate about. And one of the um, sort of philosophical questions that sometimes comes up, of course, is um, where and how. Um, consciousness exists and whether a thought in your in your mind, you know, you might be thinking about something right now, um, is an actual material subject or whether it is uh, not. And um, and that's the discussion around panpsychism and materialism. Uh, I won't go into more detail on this, but the way I'm, the reason I'm showing this is that you know, there's really interesting opportunities with machine learning to really push the boundaries of how we understand how engineers work. And scientists imagine things and create ideas and create material form. And um, sort of in the traditional way, I showed the cave painter in the beginning, you know, humans have uh, use a human imagination and we use our hands and minds to, you know, kind of hands to create what our mind's imagining and you can create um, wood-based art pieces from that, for example, you know, sculptures and so on. But um, so there's an opportunity now to have computers do the same thing um, because of course, computers have become very good at processing human language and, I, I gave this um, a talk like this a few days ago, and somebody asked me, "Well, why do you why do you use human language as an input for designing materials?" And I said, "Well, this is a very human experience. We are all humans, and we communicate by words and written words and spoken words, and um, and we want to have our computers interact with us, sort of like if you imagine um, Alexa or Siri or Google Assistant. You know, we talk to these uh, machines, and they can respond to us and give us." answers and and that's something we can begin to do for materials design as well so this is a recent paper we published uh, that really just came out a few days ago in frontiers in materials um, where we have developed an algorithm to um, actually design materials directly from spoken words and so what the input is is a description of the material and the output once it's manufactured using 3d printing is an actual manufactured materials that resembles the spoken word you've given as a cue um, to design this material and i think that's fascinating um uh, you know you can apply this to a lot of different sort of aspects you can you can design mechanisms as shown here um and uh, you can make them using 3d printing and this is sort of my one of my dreams has always been to being able to um not only have a model in a computer but actually being able to print and realize a model and watch the model in real life and touch it and feel it and this is becoming possible now and so these algorithms that you know, understand human language can intersect with the design process and the 3D printers in that way. And, and I think it was the first time that anyone has designed a material, at least through a computer, um, through spoken words or written words. And it was very exciting. So this opens a whole new possibility for creating designs and coming up with new ideas. You know, humans are very good at imagining stuff and computers are not necessarily very good at that, right? You know, traditionally, at least, you know, so, so using human cues um, as a way of interacting with a computer algorithm, I think is a very interesting idea to come up with some out of the box design solutions. Now, once you have them, you want to figure out how they perform. And this is what the next you know, part of this talk will, will cover is um, you come up with the design and now you want to know how it performs. I already talked a little bit about composite design and we're going to go much deeper now into this, but you know, we're interested in mechanisms, mechanics, and, and of course, looping it into a design algorithm, incorporating the design algorithm. But 
Um, the first example I want to show is one of Fracture, and 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 actually, Petrus probably will know we recognize some of those uh, movies and pictures because I remember I was working on these at the time when we when we've been discussing a lot. Um, but so so Fracture is a, a multi scale problem. It's fascinating. It goes from the nano all the way to the macro level, and. Typically in Fracture, we uh, we use molecular modeling, for example, as a very powerful way um, of simulating some of Fracture in silicon on the left hand side, or maybe Fracture in a, in a, in a polymer system, in a protein system, like shown on the right hand side. And so the question we we asked is, can we, um, you know, challenge the existing paradigm in modeling Fracture and using a deep learning algorithm to to solve the same problem? And I I actually post this as the overarching problem. At the beginning of the lecture, and, and this is sort of, a, I think, a core effort in my lab right now is to do, be able to do that. And, and so the, the question becomes, can we learn all the physics necessary by observing just data, right? And can we then make a predictive model that can um, elucidate fracture behaviors um, you know, from the bottom up? In other words, we can give a geometry, a boundary condition, and the algorithm will predict how and whether or whether a crack will, will propagate and, and how it performs in a, in a polycrystalline system like this. And this paper came out uh, yeah, last year in, in Matter. Um, you, can, you can check it out there. And, and so the, the way we do this is we, we basically have a, um, a training set. In this case, it's developed based on molecular simulations. We, we run thousands and thousands of MD simulations to train the model. Um, that can also be done by experimentation, of course. You know, you can run, you can get data from experiment or, or post-mortem data from industry, and you can kind of plug them in there. Um, and the model will then learn uh, about relationships and features, and then we can make predictions. And so, so you can imagine the model basically sees thousands and thousands of MD simulation trajectories. So we're actually interested here not only in predicting how tough the material is, but we predict actually how the crack will propagate temporally, you know, in, a, in, an, in an evolution in time. And, and for that, we need to give basically movie frames. And so we basically give movies to the model, right? And, and the model will observe these dynamical trajectories of fracturing. And it will then learn relationships between the microstructure and the time scale and the ultimate prediction. And we do this by um, using a combination of what, what is called convolutional layers. So convolutional layers are basically layers that can understand hierarchical patternings and structures in a material combined with a, a, a model that can learn temporal sequences. And in this case, we've used an, it's called an LSTM layer, which can learn long and short-term relationships between the input and the output. And, and so you can imagine sort of conceptually in a way that a, a crack propagates um, in a certain way because of things that have happened in the past, right? Um, there's certain um, earlier crack motions, dynamical features, uh, and their microstructures, patterns of microstructures. And all of this can be learned in how these affect um, the ultimate prediction, the evolution of the crack in the future. And this is what's captured in this, in this deep model. And um, it works extremely well, actually. We could be able to predict a very difficult, actually, uh, relationships between crack propagation and microstructure, in other words, orientation of the crystal. And so those of you who work on material science problems, of course, know that if you if you rearrange the crystal orientation, the crack will propagate differently, different instabilities, different uh, toughnesses, depending on the crystal, uh, crystal orientation and so on. And the model can actually capture this. And the model can also be predictive and, and look at gradient materials. And so this is something that uh, in, fa in fact, actually, I was first exposed to gradient materials in my uh, through my collaboration with Supra Suresh, who I'm sure you all know. Uh, and Supra and I, when he was at MIT, you know, he had sort of this very interesting study at the time on on, on gradient materials, and um, and and of course, gradient materials are found very widely in nature, right? In bone, in in teeth, and in all sorts of materials. And so, this is something that that model can now explore. And, and you can do that very quickly. So unlike running an MD simulation, it might take um, days, weeks maybe to do, um, the machine learning model gives essentially an instantaneous answer to how the crack will propagate. It can also predict um, the you know, spreading of cracks at complex interfaces, like twin boundaries, right? And so you can see that the simulation with MD, um, as opposed to the machine learning model, agree. And that's a very powerful validation step, you know, that we can actually see that this model is able to capture some of the physics. Um, we have generalized this model for actually to a variety of other materials, including graphene. We can capture very well in a, in a very complex materials like graphene, uh, the branching dynamics of fracturing. Um, and again, this paper is published in MPJ 2D materials just again a few months ago. 
Um, we have another paper that just was accepted in um, Applied Physics Reviews where we have applied this to um, MOS2 as well. And one of the other things we've done is we have used this algorithm, actually using a genetic, algo genetic approach, genetic algorithm approach to design uh, microstructures to direct crack paths in a certain way. And so essentially forcing the crack to become, to go in a, in a, in a, in a torturous path. And so in the beginning, there's no design constraint, right? So the crack can propagate anywhere in this domain. Here we add a forbidden region. This is where the crack cannot propagate. And here we have two of those. And so by doing this, you sort of hope the crack will propagate in a zigzag motion in the last example. And in fact, that's what it does. You kind of see this here, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down again. It actually avoids the uh, reaching those forbidden regions. And this has been very exciting. This is a problem that um, you, you simply wouldn't be able to do um, at all um, using, using conventional methods. It would take way too long. Like you couldn't, you would have to run thousands and thousands of millions of MD simulations of the entire factor path to optimize the distribution of, of grain boundaries in the material, which, which is impossible. So um, other things we've done, um, we have pushed this also in the direction of um, sort of exploring, uh, predicting not only uh, fractures directly, but also predicting the, the cause of fractures, which are uh, stress and strain fields. Um, in this work, we have developed a, a game theoretic approach to predict the equilibrium, essentially, in materials, solving Newton's laws, continuum equations, but learning this just based on observation, no, no equations in this model at all. Um, and, um, and so you can see the comparison between the, the ground truth and the prediction, they're almost indistinguishable. So they are very, very close. We can, by knowing the stress fields based on the microstructure very quickly, we can also predict crack propagation, of course, and we can compare this to uh, existing continuum theory. And so this is something that um, we published in a JMPS and along with JMPS paper <clears throat> recently, where we have compared uh, these predictions against a, a very large uh, set, of, you know, set of theories of continuum mechanics, which the model has never seen, of course, um, but the model has learned to make these predictions and you can kind of see the agreement between um, the ground truth and the, the prediction. So this has been very exciting because it, it opens a possibility to, to really use this different modeling paradigm to be predictive, okay, and, and predicting. And again, this is a little more complicated case for fractal propagation. So um, what else can you do with this? Well, you can uh, actually extend this, and this is some work that we, are, we just have submitted um, where we have used, um, applied this to um, actually at the atomic resolution. So the previous examples were at a coarse grain resolution in terms of stress fields. Now we're going all the way down to the atomic bonding level. Um, and we've been able to actually predict very accurately stresses um, at the level of individual atomic bonds. So this is sort of something that today you would be able to do that using force fields um, or quantum mechanics and it's slow. As we all know, um, this model for the first time can actually predict com very complex stress and strain fields um, instantaneously and predict them with very high fidelity. So this is, a, I think, an incredible breakthrough that my student, Jen Zay Yang, has made um, in, in pushing this forward. Um, other things are sort of, I, I do a lot of work in, in also uh, imagining different ways of designing materials. You've seen a little bit already on using words to design materials, but um, they do, we do a lot of work with deep learning to kind of push the boundary of what we understand as bio-inspiration or nature inspiration. So we have made materials from fire, uh, music and sound. Um, we have sort of converged different concepts in nature of living organisms and done what we call cross-species communication. Um, and, uh, and this can be done um, again, using using deep learning. So this is a study where we have used um, a spider web data, um, and you can see the sort of on the left hand side how the spider web looks like at different segments of the structure, and that can be uh, reconstructed into a three dimensional geometry and architecture that forms a new type of architected material that is inspired by the spider web but has different features. The other thing we can do we can use um, data from different sources like. Um, um, patterns from animal movements and design materials from that. So this is some materials designs we've created from wildebeest patterns um, that have been measured in, in Africa. Um, take that data, mine the data, and extract patterns from that data and transform them into a material which we can um, make using 3D printing. Um, we've also done work on uh, a lot of work on fire actually recently um, and, and using fire as a way of designing materials. And so what you see in this one, this movie here, and I, I won't be able to discuss the details yet. It's a paper that is also in submission, but 
Um, in this work, we, we have developed an algorithm to self-assemble elementary particles, in this case, flames, into complex architectures. And you can kind of see what they are. It's a house, house on fire, and on the right-hand side is a fairy tale uh, garden. And so, so this is sort of opens a whole new way of designing materials using deep learning. Um, materials based on flame shapes. This is a fire-based design. Um, and, and actually, this was sort of inspired by some of the artwork that you see here based on wood. And actually, we printed this out of wood-based inks. Uh, and so you can see how deep learning can now begin to make materials that um, previously have only been able to be made by human imagination. Okay, And so algorithms becoming uh, very good for doing this. Another direction you can take this into is you can explore deep learning and these game theoretic approaches to um, design um, materials um, for certain purposes that are not the ones seen in nature. For example, um, flame shapes actually have a, a great potential, I think, for designing airfoils. Um, and you can see the airfoil designs, sort of typical examples here. And flame shapes as extracted and, and recreated using deep learning have a very similar architecture. So we've been able to uh, design some air, airplane wings um, from this algorithm. And and use this sort of as a nature-inspired way of doing things. So this sort of pushes the idea, as you see, of what it means to be bio-inspired into a whole new realm of, of imagination. And so other things that are, are kind of critical in this field are to think about how we make materials. I already alluded to um, my interest in sustainability. That's a big field, of course. And um, <clears throat> we have an effort in my lab to create um, biomass-based inks that are um, utilized to create 3D printing uh, filaments, inks of filaments, um, and then made into architectural materials. And again, using deep learning as a way of designing these materials. Um, we've made bioadhesives for wood panels, which today are made using formaldehyde and toxic chemicals or um, petroleum sources. And so in the future, we're hoping to uh, replace these with some of those bio-based um, adhesives. So this is also work that's um, actually in, in, uh, in press right now, we just got that paper accepted. And in fact, we just got the proofs for advanced functional materials. So you'll see that coming out uh, very soon. So this paper, we, we have combined molecular modeling, experimental work in creating new types of um, adhesives for wood panels and other applications, which is something very exciting. Um, we can also go down and really you know, engineer the nanostructure of materials by, uh, by creating, um, of course, design solutions for a model, but then also realizing them in the lab by creating inks. So these are liquid inks for resin printing, where we have used a biomass um, as a, a particle reinforcement, which can be put together in a, in a, in a liquid resin that can be uh, cross-linked using UV light. Um, you kind of see this here in this um, movie, you know, we created the ink, um, and you know, it forms a liquid, um, and we can then uh, solidify this liquid using um, UV light, laser light, or other, other sources, um, and make, for example, test specimen of the raw material. So this material now has built-in uh, biomass and microstructures um, based on chemical information, but can be you know, put into shapes like, like the stockbone specimen, but it can also be made into um, architectural materials. And this is sort of where, of course, we're heading with this, is to design materials that are architectural materials that can overcome some of the intrinsic weaknesses and limitations of the building blocks. So we're mimicking here um, gradients actually of gyroid materials. And as you can see with 3D printing, we can uh, create some very high uh, fidelity, very accurate, precise material manufacturers. And they have, you know, if you look inside the material, these micro and nanoscale features built in. And so what you begin to see, you know, with this idea of um, you know engineering the, the the inks themselves and engineering the, the printing technique and you know creating different architectures, we can actually begin to um, to engineer sort of all these different levels from the chemistry all the way up to the macro level and and this is something that I um, uh, again Pijush and I have probably talked about these sort of things many years ago. Um, at that time when I was still at Caltech, you know we we couldn't do this. You know we couldn't actually make materials. Um, from a model directly into a printed material that we can see and touch, but but now we can, and 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 this is the I think an enormous opportunity for for all of us to um, to connect a model and optimization process with an actual physical object, and and again some some pictures of the microstructure of these hexagonal based material structures we've made. Um, there's sort of other, many other things we could try. Um, you know, there's an endless source, of course, for inspiration in nature. Um, there's a picture um, from recent foliage in New England. Those of you who 
have been here or lived here. Uh, and I'm sure in India you have foliage too, perhaps in some of the areas, but um, we usually in the fall have beautiful foliage in New England. So if you have a chance to visit MIT, um, come in November, October, right? Uh, September, October is a great time to come. And you see these beautiful you know, trees sort of in, uh, on fire, basically. And, um, and, and so these leaf structures um, can also be used as an inspiration for materials design. So using uh, microscopy and creating data sets, we've been able to create um, uh, new types of biomaterials inspired by, by, um, by leaf structures, cell leaf structures, which of course are optimized by nature to create a very um, lightweight material um, that can resist um, deformation and mechanical degradation very effectively, but it's very high up in the sky. It's very lightweight, and you know, does the job of photosynthesis for for, for the trees. And so, this concept of design uh, in these cell-like structures is, is of course, a, a very powerful paradigm for um, inspiration and manufacturing. This is a, an example of how we can um, create models of these and then three D print them. And it actually create uh, materials with continuously varying microstructures. Uh, and this is something that in this design paradigm, uh, deep learning can do. You know, we can interrogate the model <clears throat> and let it design um, very complex flows of patterns, which would be very difficult to describe using conventional parameterization or models, which um, are would look much more regular. Right? And so these materials have a very innate um, biological variability built in. You can kind of see the structures here, the patterns are very, um, have a lot of variation and diversity built in. This is what makes these materials so interesting. Uh, we can print them. Uh, we can actually kind of create regularity again in the structure by adding an algorithm. And so now we're beginning to uh, play with nature's variability, um, intersecting that with the engineering desire to create something with a particular pattern or, or, or distribution of density. Um, and, and this is, a, um, I, I think, a very rich field, again, where we can use deep learning, artificial intelligence, um, very effectively to create material designs that are um, you know, um, impossible to achieve using conventional methods, but they can have significant advantages mechanically for compression loading, for example, or even for uh, impact loading um, or fracture loading. And so these architective materials designed through this approach obviously have some superior performance at very lightweight, uh, properties and so they are very efficient very effective in the way they endow materials properties the last um, few examples and i know i'm, I'm probably getting cl close to the end um, is a little bit on proteins so we do a lot of work on proteins i started the talk by talking about proteins of course that's a big field um, what we have been doing here to sort of challenge the way we've been doing things is to to imagine whether we can model proteins using what we call a vibrational approach, right? And so we imagine materials usually described by positions of atoms, right? Or, or boundary conditions. But what if we could use materials um, and, and model them using a spectrum of vibrations that's maybe changing over time? And this is, of course, you know, inspired by quantum mechanics, also by sound. And of course, the, by the way, um, animals like, like, like insects um, communicate. They have very finely tuned sensors, spiders, does, and this is a stink bug. Um, and you can see these, uh, you know, these, uh, these sensors here are exquisite in the way they collect information. Of course, we do that in, you know, in our own world at a macro level by thinking about musical composition and sound, which are also sound waves changing over time. And at the chemical level, we have vibrations of molecules and we have, of course, the spider, our, our favorite animal. Um, that, that, you know, is a very vibrationally driven system in which it locates prey. Um, viruses are vibrating. And so in a recent paper in Cell Matter, we have shown that uh, different variants, different families of coronaviruses and even and variants, as, as we're just talking about right now, yet another variant, um, their properties can actually be predicted by the way they move. And so this is um, you know, a, a really mechanics driven way of understanding the material the virus as a material, as a vibrating object, and the, the nature of the vibrations determine how lethal and how infectious these, these viruses are. So there's this first paper that came out last year, and we have another paper with uh, actually focusing on many different variants um, of the virus um, of COVID um, that is that is going to come out um, very soon, I hope. Um, Music is another way to think about patterning. Those of you who are familiar with, with playing music or writing music, um, it, it's all about patterns and variations of patterns, of course. Um, you look at a score, you can see the patterns in there. 
Um, and you can think about music really as a hierarchical system um, that's built up. And so when you when you listen to music, um, I think I'm going to um, play that in the background. Classical music is is really a, a structure of different sound waves that are modulated in time. Um, and um, and when you when when you when when you play these um, um, when you play these uh, modulations of sine waves and you overlay them, you get different instrument sounds, and you can ultimately create different melodies, and you can stagger the melodies, and you can create an orchestra sound. Right? So what you hear in the background is when classical music is composed out of many different instruments playing together uh, in a particular pattern or way, and that's of course very similar to the kinds of things you see in materials. Right? So building it up from the nano level all the way to the macro. Um, and so we've used this paradigm to um, actually transform materials in a sound um, by analyzing the vibrational properties um, and then using the, the space of vibrations as a way of designing materials, modeling materials and designing materials. And then because we have achieved a, com a complex, unique mapping between material and sound, we can also transfer sound back into material and this allows us to design materials, not based on atoms and molecules, but basically designing a, a sound that the material makes um, or a new material makes that has an unheard sound. And so this can be applied to uh, proteins as well. This is some work we've done on, on visualizing um, amino acids in proteins using a new musical scale we've identified um, called the amino acid scale, which reflects the innate vibrations in these protein molecules. Um, and we can use this, of course, to describe you know, complex musical patterns and actually create music from a protein in its full geometry. So this encodes a lot of details into uh, musical scores, essentially, that ranges from the sequence to the folding, the secondary structure, to the way the entire protein vibrates and behaves as a structural object. And this um, sort of work is published um, last year and the year before, so there's a series of papers on that. But the most recent study, which was just accepted actually, and it's just actually appeared just in a, in a paper, um, is what we have to done the inverse. So we've used existing music. In this case, we focused on Bach, um, who has you know, create, created very structured, uh, organized music, almost mathematical. Um, and we've been able to translate Bach's music into protein sequences and, and analyze them and, and fold them. And, and this is sort of fascinating, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's mining data from a very long time ago. Um, in fact, hundreds of years ago, um, before we knew about proteins to see what kind of proteins Bach might have imagined or designed inadvertently, right? So he didn't actually design the proteins on purpose, but uh, he has by, by imagining sequences that resemble not only um, notes and tones that follow certain musical laws and rules and sound interesting, um, but they also are interesting for proteins and they actually form real proteins that can be folded and, and, and ultimately uh, made, made in the laboratory as well. And so this is something that we've been doing a lot of work on. And there's, of course, much more to say about that, but I'm almost out of time. Um, protein folding is a big part of my lab. So I might you take a look at some of the recent papers. We've developed a protein folding technique to, to actually predict the, me the mechanics of folding of proteins. Um, direct from the sequence, we've developed a lot of algorithms to create um, predictions of proteins um, in terms of their properties directly from the sequence. And so this is something that um, I think is incredibly important. Um, there's a lot of work on protein folding proper, but um, knowing a protein structure isn't really enough, you know, especially, yeah, we all know working in materials or in mechanics or in, or in chemistry, it's, it's not just about the structure, it's about the properties the structure has. And especially from a materials perspective, it's not a single protein. A lot of times it's many proteins emerging, coming together, assembling like the flames, assembling into a larger structure. Here we have a uh, opportunity to kind of predict this um, um, directly from, from the sequence. And this is a study that's actually in submission right now. We have predicted the mechanical strength of various protein structures uh, directly from the sequence. And this model is so efficient that we can predict hundreds and thousands of proteins that do not exist in nature and explore them and mine them. And uh, you can discover a, a wide set of very interesting protein designs using this model. Essentially, as I mentioned in the very beginning, simulating evolution, essentially, and using genetic algorithms, for example, to come up with protein designs that are unheard of, unseen, but that you can make and actually improve life by ultimately creating medicines or tissues or, or simply understanding how nature works. And so this is a really big passion of mine as well to understand how proteins get their functions and, and how they break down. And uh, of course, 
this idea can also be used to engineer natural systems. And so you want to, let's say you want to start with an existing protein like lysozyme. Um, these algorithms allow you to evolve these proteins further. Now you want to imagine what might evolution have done um, to this protein if the protein would have been adapted to yet another set of functions or maybe have different evolutionary pressures. And so in this case, we've evolved lysozyme uh, into uh, slightly variegated versions of itself. Um, and, and, and that protein has the same features of lysozyme in its original white type, but it's evolved, it's changed to have certain types of assets that we as engineers might want to have in that protein, like a higher alpha helix content or lower alpha helix content or better sheet content and so on. And so this uh, you know, can be done using these models. So um, that was um, it pretty much. I, I you know, try to convey sort of a spectrum of things we're doing in the lab um, from composites to proteins to the work we're doing at the interface of art and science and music theory um, on the scholarship of music is now i think fascinating for material scientists to explore um, we use machine learning in all of this work um, combined with traditional conventional modeling and um, the, 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 the framing a lot of times, as you've seen for us, is really these hierarchical systems where we have multiple dimensionalities in, in, in engineering things, understanding variations, and ultimately um, understanding how nature works and designing something interesting. So with that, I want to thank you very much for uh, the attention and for yeah, giving me a little bit more time to finish up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. Uh, so energetic, exciting, and most importantly, it has really educated us on the different areas, which I was personally not aware of that can be applied to uh, going all the way from, uh, you know, uh, from playing to the music. So uh, that's really uh, very, very interesting. So uh, for the audience, uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A uh, box. And why do you type? I have a very general, uh, a very general question, Marcus, like, I, coming back to your hierarchical structure, like when uh, when you look at a different hierarchy, different de depending on what length scale you are, does your deep learning approach that the learning approach changes, or mm. how do you? Is there a difference depending on the length scale you are at? If you can give a little bit of insight on that, please. Yeah. So, I uh, mean, you know, great question. So, I mean, I, I actually didn't have enough time to really go into some of the details on how the 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 methods work, but. Um, I can give you one example, and that is um, our, in the beginning, I talked about convolution-based approaches to describe um, toughness in, in a composite. And, and actually, the way a convolutional um, deep model works is it, it actually captures, this is how convolutions um, do their job, essentially, is they capture patterns at multiple resolutions. Okay, that's, that's sort of how they they recognize and in image recognition, you can imagine if you, if computers in computer vision that learn to distinguish a car from a, a bike, from a plant, um, the way these algorithms do that is through convolutions and the convolutions will learn features, right? So, so bikes have wheels, um, but the wheels look different than wheels in a car and the differences are in the patterns by which they're made out of and so on. And so this, innately captures the hierarchical structures. So these models actually are innately capable of capturing all the information level. Um, of course, there's a bit of a decision you make when you provide the data set in how small do you go in resolution, right? So if you want to capture individual atoms, you would have to have a, a gigantic photo, right, of a, of, of a picture that has atomic positions, but also has, you know, the structural level. And, and so there are practical limitations there. Um, in terms of what you can reach just because of the way the neural networks need memory and for training and so on, how long they need to train. But um, in principle, it's possible. But there's sort of a, uh, another way to do that instead of using images or literal data that basically gives you information on how stuff is distributed in space um, or in, in 3D as well. You, know, you can give stacks of images, voxels, basically, same, same idea. But um, there are also methods um, that are called geometric based learning and, and they essentially use graphs as an input and and you know once you begin to use graphs you um, and of course we all familiar with graphs in mathematics and in all sorts of sciences but graphs are an elegant way of actually capturing hierarchical structuring uh, much more efficiently if you wish because you don't need um, to necessarily describe um, every single length scale or time scale explicitly, you can actually um, focus on, on the interesting levels of description. 
So some of the work I've shown um, on protein folding, for example, um, um, some of the work on, on language to material transformations, some of the work on predicting stress fields, um, actually uses graph neural networks to do that. Um, and so that's a much more efficient way of doing it. The drawback, and I wanna highlight this, is that you, you need to know the graph. And of course, a lot of times we do. In protein, that's easy because proteins are molecules and they have a backbone and they have a very clearly defined chemical organization where all proteins follow that same feature. Okay, that's, that's a very, I think I'm very comfortable with that. But if you think about something like a composite, right? Or you think about a, a synthetic polymer that self assembles into a really complex structure or the flame materials I've shown, we actually don't know what the, the, the length scales are and how the graphs would look like, right? And so when you don't know that, um, the you know this decision on what kind of graph representation you use obviously has an effect on the results. So it's yeah, like the same problem as if you think about a finite element model and you have a certain resolution, a certain element size, right? Um, and I so in that sense, I'm I'm a huge um, fan of sort of or I'm a fan. I would say I'm I'm I'm, I'm fascinated by that question: is how far can we push very general neural networks? You know, things that are just observing the world. You know, through um, images or, or sound waves um, and, and how predictive can we be in terms of the physics we can actually um, discover there. Um, but, but yeah, so, so that's sort of where that is. I mean, I think there, there are still practical limitations, even though we have very, very efficient GPUs and, and big computers. But yeah, you, if you push the resolution of your image to you know, millions, millions and millions and millions of pixels um, and high color depth, you know, 10 bit, Oh, yeah, you know, that's still out of the reach today. Yeah. Great. Any other questions from the audience? All right. Good. One, uh, one, one participant raised a hand. Uh, yeah, somebody raised a hand. And yeah. I think this is Amrita. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't see her typing question here. Uh, okay, maybe we'll just wait. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Marcus, one small question I have. You have worked with MD, you are also working with the deep learning. And as I understand, as far as protein folding and denature is concerned, uh, uh, maybe deep learning is uh, much more useful and efficient. But when it comes to a specific local uh, interactions, like Ligand interactions or specific docking, do you mm -hmm. see MD or is it still more mm, uh, useful or uh, not, not necessary? Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely useful for sure. And I, uh, and I, I would never propose to you know, kind of say we don't need that anymore. But, um, you know, there are, if you have a well-trained model, actually, um, like one of the things I've, I've shown was predicting atomically precise stress and strain fields, you know, mm -hmm. based on graph neural networks, actually. And um, we have shown that you can actually predict really complex molecular configurations with this model. Um, and so it is beginning to challenge what you can do with MD, right? So you were asking, you know, what is a very particular type of grain boundary or maybe, you know, and, and we actually, we can now, with some confidence say that uh, at least we're moving in the right direction with deep learning. Um, but yeah, you know, using a conventional physics-based model is, is going to be key for validation for sure. And it's also going to be key for creating a training set. Um, if we want to use this kind of data as a training set um, and, and I think, you know, can inform experimental questions as well. I mean, you could also validate experimentally, but um, it, you know, where I think we're at the, the point right now where we're beginning to see that we can we can actually make discoveries first for the first time with deep learning, um, and and you know see things we haven't seen in MD um, that we can validate using MD, and so we're beginning to get there. Um, but that is precisely where I think I, I, in my in my personal humble opinion, that's where the field is right now. You know, we we're, we're people pushing that forward, and then there. Uh, questions we need to answer, um, and 
Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I, as you know, I mean, we, you know me for a long time. Uh, I, I'm not really, I'm, I'm a very, I'm very pragmatic in what I use as technique. I'm, I'm interested in discovery um, and I'm interested in understanding mechanisms. That's my real, that's my drive. And if I, um, in order for me to do this job as a scientist, I, I'm going to do, use the best tools I can find or develop. And, and I, um, and so in that sense, I wouldn't propose to get rid of one or the other or to say, you know, we don't need them anymore. Um, in fact, we want to use as much input as we can, uh, you know, for the science we can do. So I would say, you know, deep learning will allow you to explore a huge space, right? And yeah. you can very quickly, let's say you can explore a million different polycrystalline orientations, like I've shown in some of the studies we've done. Mm -hmm. And then you pick the top 10 performing ones or the top 10 interesting ones, right? That have the most interesting fracture behavior. Um, and then I would, the way we do that, I mean, we then go in and say, okay, now let's simulate these using MD or let's make them in a the lab, right? And, and that's sort of where you want to, that's how I see this, you know? And then I would I absolutely would trust, hopefully the MD prediction agrees with the deep learning. That's hopefully in a sense that providing support for the hypothesis that these predictive methods, but, but they might not, and that's fine. But, but that's sort of why I would say, here's something you can root it in that you can use the strengths of deep learning to do right. one thing and then use MD to do that detailed study and then the experiment ultimately prove it, right? So, so that's how you, you see this coming together. And I think you, your question is really important and I, and I want to really stress this. I, you know, in science, you have a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding sometimes, you know, people write a paper and then you, the, people think, well, we don't need these things anymore, these other methods or, uh, and that's not true. I, I think we all, we have to emphasize that. Um, the, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in conventional multi-scale modeling for sure. Okay. And it's very important to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, We'll stop here. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Marcus. Thank you so, so much for your time. And on the behalf of the organizers uh, of this kind of conference, we thank you once again. And it's really wonderful to have you here. And we look forward to have you in person sometime very soon. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, it's an honor to be here. Um, and I, yeah, I really, uh, I'm, I'm deeply humbled, especially your lineup of speakers is very impressive. So I'm, I'm glad to be one of them. And I wish you the best for the rest of the conference and uh, hope to meet you all soon. And any one of you listening in, if you're in the area in Boston, uh, drop me an email and I'll be welcome to, you know, welcome you back to campus here. We're back now on campus and i um, be excited to meet any one of you. So thank you. Okay, thanks Marcus. Yeah, take care. Thank you very much Marcus. Yeah, bye. Yeah. <clears throat> So thank you very much, Professor Pijush Ghosh, for uh, chairing this uh, session. Uh, now this brings us to the end of this uh, uh, day one uh, technical sessions. So tomorrow, uh, day two uh, technical sessions, uh, the first uh, session starts at, on, on link one. The first keynote talks at uh, nine o'clock by Professor Julie. But there is another inaugural function, I mean, not to up to this level, actually. So Professor Gautam Desaraju will give an inaugural address uh, for the crystal engineering and mechanical uh, behavior of organics. A special session is arranged tomorrow on link three. So link two, uh, as usual, mechanical behavior of materials will go on. So I request participants to uh, stay tuned. Uh, tomorrow we will meet again at uh, uh, 9 o'clock or 8, 8.45 in different uh, links. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye. Uh, 
yeah poster poster sessions uh, uh will go on now um, 1 to 400 as our uh, team has mailed you 1 to 400 posters uh, today our reviewers will interact actually the main idea uh, uh, of this virtual poster session why i give seven days time is to is that uh, i want you people to interact among yourself first you know you see others posters interact with them and uh, you explain your research to others uh, that is the main idea actually so reviewers will come and interact with you for a few minutes but your your colleagues your friends you know whoever is interested in the field will interact with you seven days is a big good time actually so you might many of you might have received so many calls so many comments so many you know pe people might have visited your posters so one to 400 today you people can be online like whatever gmate link you have given be available our reviewers um, if they find interesting and if they want to interact with you they will ask you the few questions and then they will judge your poster similarly tomorrow rest of the from 400 to uh, 900 all posters will be evaluated tomorrow this one hour you please be available on gmate link if required if they call if they want to contact you otherwise they may call you on phone also and may ask you some questions please cooperate thank you so much for your patience we'll see you tomorrow no.